Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 12.30 p.m. session starting late at 1.29 p.m. of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. I guess we'll see if we have a quorum. Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Golder. Here. Here. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruno. Present. Thank you. Are there any, I'd like to ask the city clerk for any additions or deletions on the agenda. We do have some. Um, we are removing item six, which is the Unified Animal Ordinance update presentation. Okay. They, they have, they are unable to attend today. And then we are removing item 25. Staff is removing it, the award contract for an environmental impact report for Ocean Place 908 Ocean Street. Thank you for those updates. With that, then we move right into our first presentation, which would be Parks and Recreation Month. And I'd like to invite Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation, to join us. Right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, this is one of our favorite presentations of the year, so happy to introduce uh, our uh, Acting Recreation Superintendent, Isith Ray, to deliver the uh, Parks and Recreation Month presentation today. Welcome, Isith. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, highlight and brag a little on the Parks and Rec Department. Um, we're in the middle of our sort of time to shine, which is summertime. We've currently got um, a bunch of wonderful programs and uh, activities, events such as camps in Harvey West, Junior Guards, and on the uh, Cal's Beach. We've had some wonderful events in the past, Juneteenth, and Woody's on the Wharf, and look forward to some more events uh, coming up at the end of the summer. But uh, one more reason to really celebrate this time of year for Parks and Rec is in just a few days coming up here is July. And July is um, Parks and Recreation Month. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Let's see. Is that coming up OK for you guys? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, as I stated, uh, July is Parks and Recreation Month. And uh, Parks and Recreation Month, the concept for it kind of was born nearly 40 years ago in 1985, uh, where Americans uh, began celebrating Parks and Recreation Month to recognize the importance of parks and recreation in establishing and maintaining the quality of life for and contributing to the physical, economic, and environmental well-being of the communities. And we certainly hold those values uh, true today and do everything we can to provide that for the community. Um, through an effort led uh, by the National Recreation and Park Association, the U.S. House of Representatives passed an official resolution for Park and Recreation Month back in uh, 2009. Um, I just wanted to quickly share with you and with the community a list of our upcoming July is events that are specifically designed um, to welcome in the community, to try some new activities for us, to hopefully plant the seeds for a love of recreation and the programming that we offer. So we, um, as you can see on this list, we have a variety of activities, um, starting with the beach cleanup day, which I'll touch on a little bit more um, or we have several of those beach cleanup days. I'll, I'll highlight those in just a moment. We have activities like an archery demo, which is a great activity. A lot of people don't necessarily consider, along with the, the um, American standards of baseball and soccer and basketball, this gives the opportunity to go out and try something new and unique. Um, we also have a teen glow in the dark 
beach party, which I think is the ultimate Santa Cruz event. I kind of wish there was an adult one. I don't know if I'd be brave enough to attend it, but <laughs> ought to be a teenager again. Um, and then also the tree walk with Leslie, which I'm going to go a little bit more into a little bit later here. Um, some of the real special events that I did want to highlight, as I mentioned, are the beach cleanup days where community members can uh, support their council member of choice or all of the council members and sign up uh, for a day uh, where you guys will be hosting cleanups throughout the month of July and August. There's a couple pictures here. You can see uh, Mayor Bruner with her team uh, getting lots of treasures on the beach. Um, I partnered last year with Donna Myers. It was great to see people coming out. People were really excited um, there's a little bit of competition in this event as well. If you can remember from last year, um, the winner received a original handmade state of the art uh, trophy that was made by our work supervisor, Brett, Britt Hoberg. I have wonderful news on that. He has recreated another trophy similar. So for those of you that have been coveting that award, this year is your opportunity. Um, and if you're not that competitive, this is still just a wonderful event for the community to come out and contribute in a really impactful and immediate manner where you can see the effect of your contribution. So I encourage everyone to sign up for that. Uh, we also have on July 16th, we have Day in Laurel Park, which is just kind of a simple get the family out, get the kids out, come to Laurel Park. We're going to have a host of activities and games for kids to play and engage in our beautiful park. Um, so again, I extend the, the invitation to council members, your families, your friends, your neighbors, everybody in the community to come and join us. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite events, uh, if you haven't yet joined a tree walk with our city forester, Leslie Keedy, I encourage you to. Um, she is tremendously knowledgeable. She has a love for the, um, the trees and the vegetation in the city. She works tremendously hard. As you can see from the photo there, she draws a big crowd for this, and there's a reason for that. She is really good at this. You learn a lot of information about the trees here in the city, and I encourage, again, please join us for those tree walks. Um, council members, it's become a tradition now that we celebrate July's Parks and Recreation Month with you by um, giving you swag bags from our different areas through uh, the Rec Division, Rec, rec and Parks Division. And just as a thank you to you for supporting us and coming out to our events and, and encouraging uh, your constituents to join us too. And finally, if anybody would like more information on these upcoming um, July is events or any of our classes at Parks and Rec, please go to cityofsantacruz.com for Parks and Rec events. You can also use this QR code, which will link you to the website. Um, for any of you that have the current summer guide, our list of activities is right here on the front page. Um, so you can get there online or you can get there the old fashioned way through our activity guide. Um, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you so much for that presentation. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, there's also bags here that I uh, see, so thank you. I haven't looked inside yet, uh, but <laughs> thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, are there any other, is, does anybody else want to speak? I just have a question, Mayor. Yes. Do you get to jump off the wharf again? <laughs> July 8th. Mark your calendars for July 8th. Yeah. July 8th, okay. Yeah. Is, that, is that confirmed? That, that's correct. Yeah, July 8th will be our, our wharf jump as part of the big swim through Junior Guards this summer. Thank you. Thank you. What time on July 8th? It, you know? Uh, I don't want to misquote. Um, I believe it's at 1 p.m., but let me get back to you guys. I can email out the time. I think it's still in, in works a little bit, depending on people's schedules. So um, I can follow up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, and now moving on with our agenda. And council members, uh, if you want to support Parks and Rec, you can change your Zoom background to show support. I will now make a few announcements and we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left here in person at council chambers. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside our chambers. Thank you. For the consideration of our community, please stay home. If you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way, if you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. <coughs> Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. If you're calling in for public comment, please raise your hand, either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. Please note public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 11 through 42 on the agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements or of disqualification today. Okay, and I'm not seeing everybody, so let me just make sure I'm not missing anybody. Nope, okay, great, thank you. I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay. And moving on, now is the opportunity for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so council and public can be informed. Mayor, if I could afterwards, if you can um, we get the city attorney report out. No? Did I? Uh, okay, let's let's go to that first. Thank you. I'm I apologize. Moving right through my notes here. So at this time, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session that we just ended from this morning. Happy to do that. Uh, the council met with its staff to discuss real property negotiations related to city-owned property uh, behind 4112, 412 Woodland Way. The council met with staff to discuss real property negotiations related to renovations and a potential lease amendment at Firefish Restaurant located at 25 Municipal Wharf. The council met with its labor negotiators to discuss ongoing labor negotiations. The council met with its legal counsel to discuss providing amicus support in the matter before the United States Supreme Court 303 Creative LLC versus Aubrey Elanis. And the council agreed to sign on to an amicus brief supporting the state of Colorado in that matter. And the council met with its legal counsel to discuss one item of potential initiation of litigation. Great, thank you. All right, and so now at this time, Council members can report 
on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. And I will begin with Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since our last meeting, the Metro Board met and adopted its budget. And um, the Youth Action Network jurisdictional representatives met um, with um, each of the cities and the county representatives uh, to discuss their other jurisdictions efforts around the Children and Youth Bill of Rights, which other communities have taken our lead on. So that's all I have to report. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be quick. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission met at its uh, monthly policy workshop past, uh, two weeks ago, at which time we uh, adopted the 2045 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan and the EIR for that plan. Um, that's a plan that describes all of the existing transportation system components, um, forecasts, funding, and identifies um, needs over a 20 year time span. Um, so we were able to, um, to adopt that and it serves as a guide for how the RTC distributes transportation funding and programs projects. Um, we also heard a report on the Santa Cruz County's draft uh, regional conservation investment strategy which is a comprehensive regional conser conservation plan that involves the RTC. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, we accepted our Measure D annual report. Um, Want to thank the voters, as always, for approving Measure D to help us fund transportation projects uh, in our county. Uh, the other um, interagency board I'll mention is the Area Agency on Aging. Uh, most of our meeting was dedicated to discussing uh, the what to do about the cuts that uh, seniors programs will be they're facing as a result of the core investment process decision making and um, so more to come on that <laughs> um, but I will say that um, the the area agency on aging uh, are, as a body, we are committed to finding funding to meet those critical needs for seniors. Um, so nothing particularly um, uh, new to report on that, but it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and we're also in talks about the Live Oak Senior Center uh, kitchen and the, continue, the potential for continued use of that for Meals on Wheels, at least for a, a temporary short-term period. I think I'll leave it there. Interest of time, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member uh, Golder. Council Member Golder, are you with us? Okay, I'll come back to you and I'll move on to Council Member Myers. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just two quick updates. Uh, the uh, Mid-County Groundwater Agency um, did receive and um, uh, it, it, it put into their budget this year uh, a $7.6 million grant from the state of California for the groundwater management plan. Um, and the, our committee also met two weeks ago. Um, we just meet quarterly. Um, and um, there's a number of items to get various consultants up and going um, with string gauging and other important things to characterize the watershed as well as to um, you know assist with modeling of our both groundwater and surface water resources um, and we did adopt the agency's budget for the year as well um, and that includes some reserves for operations um, of the agency moving ahead uh, and the agency is also involved in the drought um, task force, which is required uh, by every county in California now um, does uh, need to establish an emergency drought task force. And those meetings are being facilitated by um, Sierra um, 
Ryan, who is the county's water resources director. And uh, those meetings are available through the county website. Um, but the drought um, emergency task force is obviously important to uh, folks uh, in our community because of current situation we're in. Um, our water department is, I think, exemplary from um, what a lot of people are faced in the state right now. So, um, but people can find that information on the county website in the water resources department. That's the uh, drought uh, emergency task force that has been formed by the county of Santa Cruz. And then the only other uh, committee I'm on is the Cal's working group. And I think we're on to our third year now of being off the beach bummer list, which is amazing. Thank you, Mayor. I saw some of the press on it and I'm uh, really excited that we're entering summer again with uh, Clean Beach at Cal's. So those are my reports. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. The um, Climate Action Task Force met uh, a couple weeks back. Um, the public review draft of the Climate Action Plan 2030 was released today. And so if people go on the city's website and search for the Climate Action Plan, they can find a, a draft copy for review. And I believe that comments on that um, will be taken until I think July 25th, but that information is on the website as well. So if you have comments on the Climate Action Plan that draft, um, be sure to take a look at it and get back to us by the end of July. Um, the um, planning and scheduling for the public review draft climate action plan webinar has been uh, deferred until later in the July, later in July uh, by the, the group. Um, many of the members of the, the um, climate action task force were interested in uh, discussing developing a climate action plan 2030 101 video to introduce the community to the climate action 2030 plan. And uh, the city is working with Ecology Action to customize the Bright Action Community Activation Platform that will launch in August or September after the adoption of the Climate Action 2030 plan. As far as the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, we adopted our final 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan sust Sustainable Community Strategy and Environmental Impact Report. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, as it relates to the draft six cycle regional housing needs assessment allocation plan. There was, uh, there were two appeals uh, that were received by AMBAG. And so um, those appeals will be coming back for public hearing to AMBAG on August 10th, 2022. Um, and that there will be a public hearing that will be held as part of AMBAG's effort to prepare a final regional housing needs pl assessment plan for the AMBAG region in accordance with state law. And those are all my updates. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Golder. Uh, I have nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I too had a number of my outside committees um, canceled this this time. So I don't think I have any updates since the last time we um, reported out. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, and for me, everything has, for my updates, has been spoken for. I do want to emphasize, thank you, C Council Member Cummings, for bringing to everyone's attention the public review period has opened today for the Climate Action Plan on the city website. And it will be open for the next month. So we really encourage folks to go on there and, um, review the information and I believe here at City Hall as well, if you cannot access online for whatever reason, there are resources here at City Hall to assist you in accessing that information. And there is the slide, uh, thank you. Uh, the draft community-wide climate action plan 2030 opens later today for public review and comment through July 25th. And that URL is cityofsantacruz.com forward slash climate action plan. Thank you. Okay, moving on with the agenda. 
Thank you, council members. Now is the consent agenda portion of the agenda. These are items number 11 through 37 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you wish to comment on items 11 through 37. And instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. If you are here joining us in person and wish to comment on consent agenda items 11 through 37, please sign in up here at the clipboard and uh, you will be called upon to approach the podium at that given time. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? I have two hands raised. Any other hands in the virtual world? Okay, Council Member Brown. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. I have questions on item 27 and 32, and 25 was was postponed, so I was going to pull that, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I was going to pull item number 16. I had comments on 26 and 38 and then questions on 32 and 37. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with uh, the comments on item 26. And let's go to our, pull it up. So item number 26 is um, an award contract for decking and railing rehabilitation on the floating walkway at Neri Lagoon. Um, over the past few years, um, I've received communications from members of the public who are interested in wondering when this work was going to take place and just wanted to thank the staff for moving forward with this agreement because I think that from folks who live in that area, we're really hoping to see this come forward. And I just want to express my, their appreciation or my appreciation on their behalf <laughs> for uh, moving forward with this project. Thank you. Our next uh, item for comment uh, is item number 38, and that's Council Member Cummings. Let's see. 38, it looks like, is that public consent? Oh, that, that actually hearing? is, sorry. Mm, sorry. So My we're mistake. going to, we'll, talk about that later. we'll get to that next. Um, our next, we had a question on um, item number 27, and that was Council Member Brown. Item number 27 is the Consulting Engineer Services for Wastewater Treatment Facility and Capital Improvement Project. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm glad to see this project on our agenda um, and just had a question about noise related to the project itself and then the potential noise from expanded operations. Just some people in the neighborhood um, have no noticed in the past the noise related to construction, which I don't think we can avoid, but I'm just wondering if you could talk about the noise mitigation what you anticipate. Sure. Uh, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Um, the noise that you, the people in the neighborhood are experiencing right now is due to the Pure Water um, SoCal <coughs> project. They're doing the, the pump system for, for the Pure Water project as well as the tertiary treatment. Um, though this contract or this, yeah, the contract before you is really the design services for future work. So. Um, not necessarily as much noise. This is a, uh, a large excavation and, re and construction from ground up, so it is pretty noisy, at least the deconstruction part of it. Um, I don't anticipate you're going to have the um, consistent noise from these projects, but 
it depends on the project, and as the project comes forward, we'll be we'll be able to alert you to that effect. And I appreciate I appreciate everything you do to try to mitigate those impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Director Duddle. Our next question, we had two questions on item number uh, 32. And 32, it looks like, is the item Housing Matters Hygiene Bay Remodel Project. And Council Member Brown, you had a question. Yeah, I, I guess I... Um... So I, I see this is a bid protest for the Housing Matters Project Hygiene Bay. Um, and I see it's a 30% increase um, on the project. I understand the logic and I've, I've read the, the bid protest information, um, but I just wanted to get a sense of, like, is this really special epoxy? <laughs> or um, <laughs> I see a head shaking, maybe it is. Um, just to hear, because that's a pretty significant increase for a, a, um, materials. Um, so um, for you, I'm associate engineer with the Public Works Department. So um, when our architect team uh, put the specs together, they had referred to a waterproofing software, and this is the product that the project is going to use, and it comes with a drain pipe that will go into a septic tank. So necessary. <laughs> Thanks. And then Council Member Cummings, you had a question on item 32. And if you can move the, the microphone closer oh, to your mouth, thank you. you know, I, I, had a, I had the same question, but then also was just curious about in terms of the funding and where that's coming from, um, that increase in funds. And it said from the American Rescue Plan, but I'm just wondering, um, you know, it seemed like some of those funds have been allocated towards certain things. We're gonna see some other adjustments today, but I'm just kind of wondering how that funding has been shifted uh, to account for that increase? Uh, my understanding is that there's $1.8 million for this project. So the highest bid was, what, $1.36 million? So, um, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Associate Professional Engineer You, nice to meet you. Thank you. A uh, question by Council Member Cummings on item number 37, which I believe is the last item on consent. That is Santa Cruz mm -hmm. and Jabuna Salmonid's Habitat Conservation Plan. Yeah, the question I had um, on that that came in was uh, just what the timeline was on, on those permits and getting that kind of moving forward. And so I don't know if there's anyone who might be able to answer that question, but there's people who are asking what the timeline for approval for that to be moving forward. Yeah, thank you for that question, Council Member Cummings. I have Chris Berry, our um, Water Resources Manager, that can address that question for you. Hi, thank you, Council Members. Actually, Watershed Compliance Manager these days. Um, the uh, That's a great question. It's been a long road since 2001. Um, we're hoping that the permits will be complete in Early to mid 2024, we have to complete the environmental review before the agencies can actually finalize the permits. So, um, we had a meeting recently with the new regional manager of DFW, and she was very happy with that schedule. So, it's great. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep. Great. <clears throat> okay. So, at this point, we have one item that has been pulled. So we will proceed to public comment on items number 11 through 37 with the exception of item 16. We will address that separately. And 25 was an adjustment in the agenda that was removed from the agenda today. So items 11 through 37, with the exception of 16 that was pulled, and the exception of 25 that was removed from today's agenda. <clears throat> and so I will look out to any hands raised from our participants virtually, and um, then I will address any participants joining us here in council chambers. 
and I have one hand raised and that is the name I am watching you go ahead and press star six welcome okay thank you uh, as to item 35 there may or may not eventually be no cost to hook up our water to Scotts Valley and vice versa but many other details are still missing there will be future financial responsibilities and I see no clear analysis of is this a good deal for Santa Cruz I remind we have water rights and water should be a commodity the public pays cost for. What assurance is there that Scotts Valley would pay equitably for any water diverted from Santa Cruz and thereby reducing our water uh, bill with no ill water constrained effect on city residents? Please do tell. Scotts Valley should pay us to drink their yuck water, PU. They want our clean surface water having no rights to such, having blown their chance at that a long time ago before my time. As per item 12, the COVID emergency declaration, we've talked before how the COVID emergency is over. While test positivity cases are up, the hospitalizations are nowhere near pandemic levels and deaths are really flatlining in absolute numbers compared with winter surge levels of the last few years. Currently, the fatality rate is down to the same level about like uh, seasonal influenza. It doesn't rate an emergency declaration. What benefit is it to anyone except granting the city manager authority he should no longer have? Uh, what we have learned from various studies is that vaccination protection is quite short-lived, not so effective on Omicron. After five, six months, vaccinated people are now more likely to contract COVID. If there is an emergency, it's the mental state of the drones walking around alone outside with a mask on, offering no protection from zero risk. If there is an emergency, it's from the surge in drop dead sudden deaths, vaccine side effects, and worrisome increase in all-cause mortality. If there is an emergency, it's that live births are taking a nosedive in a Six Sigma statistical decline early in 2022, which is extremely alarming. While I don't know why this is, I suspect these gene therapy vaccination. Uh, when the lipid nanoparticles containing the vaccine invade cells, including uh, buildups in ovaries, heart, brain, and other organs to produce spike proteins, the immune system destroys those cells, some of which are never replaced. Uh, this is the very definition of an induced infection. If there's an emergency, it's the entire government response from day one. If there is an emergency, it's the forced corrupt vaccinations of children at more risk from the vaccines than from uh, the virus. So big pharma can get a pass on liability. Timer from, has rung. Even more Thank you. Your risk. time is up. Thanks. Wasn't sure if you heard the timer ring. Thank you for your input. I'm going to look out to our in-person participants. Um, are you here to speak to consent agenda items 11 through 37, with the exception of 16? Great. Will you please approach the podium? Thank you. Item number 10 and item number 4. Oh, we got three minutes. Whatever. So um, I'm interested in the Assembly Bill 361, which is consent agenda number 11. Number 12, extending the COVID pandemic emergency. You know, I walked over here from the county building. If this was so dangerous, I would have imagined that just to be a uh, cemetery where the 500 people are living right there, the homeless population. Don't you think if this was really an issue that any of those individuals had problems, that would have come up? You guys are scripted actors. Also, number 13. CZU fires, you know, CNN did a really cool presentation on that in 1985. They were talking about 60 gigahertz as military weapons and lightning as weapons. So this is just kind of a hoax. I could go on f for some detail. This is a book about the Fabian Society. Um, what was it? Bernard Shaw started it. We have a previous mayor. Maybe he's going to be the city manager. This is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. I appeal to the chemist to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly, dead to the sleep by all means, but humane, not cruel. Got members in here as part of that. Another reason I refer to you guys as actors is I'm gonna hold up the backside. Action, Agenda 21 Community Teamwork in Action Now. So this is the Santa Cruz Local Agenda 21 final draft for consideration Santa Cruz County Municipalities and Board of Supervisors dated June 3rd 1997 you know but the you guys being scripted actors goes much further the city council members and county and board of supervisors since before 1917 are controlled by the city and 
county manager. So I don't know why you guys are holding these things, uh, Zoom, because if this was a problem, people would be dead on the streets. Thanks. Thank you for your input. Are there any members joining us here in person in the council chambers that would like to speak to consent agenda items 11 through 37, with the exception of 16 and 25? Okay, thank you. I am going I'll to- Move the consent agenda. Great. We have a motion to move the consent agenda by council member Brown. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a second by council member Cummings. <laughs> May we have a roll call vote, please? Council member Kowantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? <coughs> Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner. Aye. Okay, uh, those items pass unanimously. And now we will address item number 16, which was pulled by Council Member Cummings. This is an amendment of existing contract with the Salvation Army for expanded shelter operation at the National Guard Armory site. Council Member Cummings. Thank you. So um, this item is pulled because um, a number of people had concerns around, we've reached out with concerns around um, a variety of questions. Uh, I'll start with the first, which was um, people were wondering if um, we could speak to the fact that there's a number of services the Salvation Army um, included uh, where Measure F funds were anticipated to help sustain these services over time. And um, with it appearing that Measure F is not going to pass, we're wondering what um, <coughs> the future of these services look like and what we can anticipate on um, you know, how we can continue to maintain these services over time. I see we have Homelessness Response <coughs> Manager Larry M. Wally joining us. We also have City Manager Matt Huffaker. Uh, so. Go ahead, welcome Larry. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for your question, Council Member Cummings. Um, that is correct. If you recall in the three-year homelessness response action plan that we presented in uh, March um, with updated information in May, uh, the first year of funding for expanded shelter services is uh, is allocated from both ARPA and the California 14 million, but subsequent years uh, were unfunded and contingent upon the ability to find alternative sources. So uh, the tax measure was one potential funding source. Um, as you mentioned, it looks like that is not gonna pass. So we'll continue, that will have to be uh, a source of um, general fund budget allocations in the future, as well as uh, we continue to look for additional funding sources from the state and federal government that can be utilized to continue and support expanded shelter operations. And council member Cummings, I would just add to uh, Larry's comments that there is sufficient room in the budget, both through the 14 million and the ARPA funding that we have available to cover the contract in front of the council this afternoon. Of course, we're gonna to have to explore other funding opportunities with Measure F failing to um, sustain these programs over the long term. Great, and then um, the next question. Recently, we've been receiving information about the um, many of the homeless hotel programs shutting down. It sounded like, based on an article in the Sentinel, that um, about 100 people were placed in homes and the other 600 were kind of just they had to put them on the street and were given backpacks and more or less a good luck. And so, and I know of a number of people who actually have, uh, were, part, were in those programs, seniors who were, uh, who were disabled. And many people are wondering kind of what the county's role is in kind of making sure that those people have somewhere to go. But in addition to that, it's been sounding like a lot of those people are ending up in the bench lens, which is gonna further complicate 
our ability to house people and also meet um, the needs around Martin versus Boise, for example. So I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts around kind of where we're going from here now that we're seeing <coughs> a significant amount of shelter come offline. Um, and it's great that we're increasing the number of beds. I'll say that um, from 60 to I think 135. But um, there's I'm starting to hear these concerns and people are asking me where can we send these people, where can they go, especially some of whom are seniors and disabled. Thanks for the question, Councilmember Cummings, and we've all certainly been receiving correspondence from the community concerned about that as well. Uh, I want to make very clear that these facilities um, are county-run emergency shelter facilities that were stood up during the pandemic with COVID-related funding. As that COVID funding dries up, the county has made the decision to discontinue uh, those programs, and that has unfortunately resulted in the displacement of those that um, have been residing uh, in those shelters over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the timing is very challenging as we're in the process of standing up additional shelter beds. We're currently um, essentially reaching capacity um, as we now move forward with expanding uh, additional beds uh, in part with the contract that the council has in front of you today uh, with Salvation Army. So we continue to do everything we can to explore all shelter options in front of us. Uh, that's the reasoning for this expanded contract today. Um, and it was unfortunate uh, to see uh, that uh, folks were displaced uh, from, from those county facilities. I guess follow-up question, is there any, has the county expressed any interest or is there gonna be any partnerships with the county to expand shelter capacity? There continue to be a number of uh, efforts underway in coordination with the county. One of those areas is, is expanding uh, beds and shelter capacity at the Housing Matters campus. The county has committed to funding those operations once the physical beds can come online. That'll most likely come in the form of additional pallet shelters or something similar. So that work is underway. Um, of course, we would, we would always like this, uh, these efforts to move faster. Uh, the armory is, is um, the most immediate expansion of beds, and that's what we're prioritizing, but we're also working on these other locations uh, in parallel. Um, the next questions I have were directly related to the um, Salvation Army. Uh, one question that came up was that uh, it was brought to my attention uh, that it sounds like the transportation for people to get from the city or from the different stops to the armory is not ADA. Uh, accessible and also that there are no ADA showers being offered at the armory and so I'm just wondering if someone could speak to that uh, because if we're expanding on this contract one of the uh, requests was that we include ADA transportation and ADA showers uh, for people who are going to be staying at the armory would you like to speak to that Larry certainly Yes, um, with respect to the ADA showers, um, the city has purchased an ADA shower trailer um, a couple of months ago that we're waiting on delivery for that we're expecting sometime in July. Uh, so that will, resource will come online uh, for that. Um, in terms of uh, transportation, yes, shuttle van, the shuttle vans that are used um, are difficult for folks who are wheelchair bound. Uh, that particular shelter location is not prioritized for people with those disabilities and our outreach team works and looks to place those um, individuals at more appropriate shelter that can uh, accommodate their disabilities. Um, that location up at the armory is, is um, presents some challenges for disabled persons. Um, well, I think to the extent, I mean, it we're pretty strapped on shelter capacity. And if we're expanding beds, it would seem that I think many people would agree that our priorities are around making sure the people who are vulnerable, the most vulnerable, have a place to go. And so, um, you know, to the extent that we can include language in the direction today to provide ADA transportation, I think it would be, um, you know, our ability to show that we're trying to get the people who are most challenged off the streets and into shelter and hopefully on the road to housing. And then I guess the last comment I would make is that um, we, I was also contacted with interest in the um, um, unemployment insurance, which I know came up before and it's not required by the state of California, but 
it sounds it sounded like from our previous conversation in the current one that it is something we could include. Um, so um, I'll just leave my comments there. And I don't know if anybody wants to provide feedback on that, but it sounded like um, you know providing unemployment insurance for workers is something that is really important to members of our community, especially those who've actually worked and provided these services. So I'll leave my questions and comments there. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Are there any other questions in response to that? Any other comments? Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in, in terms of the, the question about the Salvation Army's capacity to provide ADA trans transit to the Armory, um, I haven't talked with them lately, but in my conversations, I know that they have issues with respect to their own equipment. And so I, I, I don't think they actually have the ability to provide that. And so, but I do think it's really important to be having that conversation. So it, it would be great to see if there are folks from our staff who can talk with them about what, and just get a handle on what those needs are currently, um, because it does seem like a big gap to not be able to offer um, a space at the armory to people who are in a wheelchair, um, not ambulatory. Um, and then with respect to the question of um, unemployment insurance, I it, it did come up and my recollection is that this is something that the Salvation Army as an employer just does not provide and they are exempt from uh, the uh, re requirements because of their nonprofit status. So I don't know that we can cause them to do that. Um, I am interested in that as well, um, but I just wanted to um, follow follow up on, on that comment. Um, but it would be great, if, and I don't know if it requires a motion, but if can we just get some additional information about what it would take to make that ADA... Um, Accessible? Trans, yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, the questions, Councilmember Brown, and the and the concern around ADA accessibility. That's something that our homelessness response team is aware of and has been an active uh, dialogue with Salvation Army around. As Larry had mentioned, transportation to and from the site has been challenging. Uh, part of that is just having access to to the type of equipment that would allow for uh, that full access. But it is something we continue to work on and, and prioritize. Uh, when it comes to comes to the insurance, that's a question that's come up in the past, and our city attorney's office has confirmed that as a religious organization, they are exempt from providing, and uh, we have an inability to require uh, that they provide it. Thank you. I know there was an email that we received um, with um, some suggestions regarding the transportation, which I forwarded on to city staff and the homelessness response team to explore. Thank you for uh, your input and I hope we, I see some more uh, uh, hands for public input. So we'll be hearing some more input on this item. Does that conclude your questions? Great. All right, I will now take it out for public comment. And uh, let's see. If we have any members of the public that would like to comment on a consent agenda number 16, please sign in here at the clipboard. And um, anybody in the virtual world, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and following the instructions on the screen to call in. And I see one hand raised and the name is Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Serge. Good afternoon, Mayor Bruner and members of the city council. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the executive director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. We support both the housed and the unhoused in being a part of a welcoming community to foster healing and to achieve their goals for stability. Um, I was the one who uh, sent a letter to the city council uh, regarding this item. Um, two parts to it. One is the ADA accessibility. Um, and my question, I'm very happy to hear from Larry and Wally that there was a um, ADA shower that was ordered 
um, but I didn't hear where it was going to be placed. Is that going to be placed at the armory would be my question, and I hope that he can answer. Um, the other question is about transportation. Um, the county actually is renting a minivan that is ADA accessible, and since the Salvation Army is renting their vans anyway, I'm not quite clear why the city and the Salvation Army can't rent an ADA accessible minivan uh, for those people. I hear uh, Larry's comments about trying to place people at other sites. It's not uh, the preferable site. Um, I worked really hard to get that person uh, placed up there because there were no other sites available. Uh, the loft was not taking anybody. They were only taking people from the county's armory program. Um, so I would say that it, it seems like with slight modifications, it could be made accessible. Uh, I'm hoping that can happen too. Uh, on clarification about the unemployment insurance, um, this actually started from a conversation that I had um, because I worked for the Salvation Army and I wasn't able to get unemployment insurance when I left. A conversation I had with Captain Harold and he told me that they actually do provide it in places across the country where they're required to do so. So I'm confused on uh, comments that were that in the contract uh, there's an inability to require it. I understand that they're not required to do it by their 501c3 status or by their by state law, but that doesn't mean we're precluded for requiring it in the contract. So if there could be just clarification on that one, I would really appreciate it. We've had so much, we really would love to limit more on uh, homelessness because we've had the pandemic, we've had the fire, we have the recession and unemployment insurance for low income workers is really uh, one of their lifelines when they're in between jobs. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment on consent agenda item number 16? Okay, B, I'm gonna bring it back to council and I would like to ask a couple of quick questions uh, related to that public comment and if we can, uh, and I think Council Member Brown also gave the uh, direction to look at making slight uh, modifications or what it would take to have ADA accessibility um, at the City Overlook location so that nobody is excluded from a shelter opportunity. And uh, the uh, employment un unemployment status uh, requirement is there is the city attorney is that something you could come back to us with i mean i don't want to put you on the spot right now i'm looking up the past memo on this issue so if you come right back to me in a second that would be great great and okay are there any other uh council members any comments council member cummings i can go ahead and, and make a motion and then we can get some more great Thank you. Feedback. Yeah, so I'll move the staff recommendation um, and include that um, we um, include in the contract flexibility on funding for um, an ADA accessible uh, rental minivan and um, provision of unemployment insurance for um, Salvation Army workers. So I have, um, don't mean to interrupt you, um, but on the issue of the unemployment insurance, um, we previously looked it up and the problem was, so they're exempted from requiring it. As for you know voluntarily opting into it, there was an issue with how long the contract is. Um, so uh, because there's basically um, a requirement that, that they be employed for uh, a period of two years or greater and our contract was gonna be for I think it's 12 months now, six months, 12 months, so it was less than the two-year threshold. So their application to actually apply for unemployment insurance would most likely just be denial, denied because of the short length of contract. So a minimum of two years is required, or Correct. is that what I'm Correct. understanding? Okay. Um, we, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings, and I'd like to ask if Anybody would like to second it? I'll, we'll I'll second. discussion here? I'll, I'll second. I wonder, though, given the um, 
what we just heard about the potential for unemployment insurance being a conversation. Um, it's, I'm not sure that we, it sounds like we may not be able to do much now, but I do think that, um, so if, if the maker of the motion would, wouldn't mind maybe amending that to consider unemployment insurance opportunities in the future if with longer term potential longer term contracts okay sorry this is in the future um uh explore possibilities for the provision of unemployment insurance in the future uh with potential long longer term contracts i also would like to ask the maker of the motion if um you would be amenable to broadening your term on ADA accessible transportation rather than specifying rental van, making it a broader ADA accessible transportation. Sure. Okay. City Clerk, did you get that? Thank, Thank you. you. We have a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown. Uh, and can we read back the motion or see it? it just, yeah, what you have, just to make sure. Does that look accurate, Council Member Cummings? Yeah, I think all in the friendly amendment, I think it will be um, broad term from. I'm still cleaning it up. Okay. But yeah. 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 Did you say there was something else with the friendly amendment? Is that what you were saying? No, that was, no. Oh, that was, okay. That was good. You were cleaning it up, so, yeah. Okay, great. May we? I just have one question. Yes. Um, is, is there a way we can get an update since um, the homeless services manager mentioned that we purchased the um, ADA accessible showers and that they're, we're expecting to, to get those in July? Is there a way we can get an update um, with the city manager's update in August on kind of where these, where this is all at. Happy to do that, uh, Councilmember Cummings. In fact, I think we'll be bringing a quarterly homelessness response update in that same time frame. There are, is a lot of work happening on multiple fronts, um, and I can certainly include that in my CM update uh, if it makes sense as well. And I have a quick question for Larry and Wally. What will the where will the ADA showers be placed? Yeah, the intent is to put the ADA shower up at the armory building, so we'll be servicing that facility. And do other shelter sites have ADA accessible showers, or is that the only ADA accessible shower? Um, I can't speak. I mean, for city programs, for city programs. it's just twelve twenty and the armory, and um, so we'll have an ADA up at the armory building. The shower trailer at twelve twenty River is not ADA accessible. Okay, twelve twenty River thirty participants. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I just wanted to uh, make a brief comment and thank. Um, the staff for your work on this. And I know it's it's been in the works for a long time and it's really difficult to get qualified, experienced service providers, especially right now, um, to provide the very urgent and essential services that we need. So I just wanna acknowledge that and I wanna thank city staff for your work on it and um, the nonprofit provider Salvation Army for, for supporting our community in this way. 
Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I just have a, a question for probably Larry um, and maybe Cassie, I'm not sure, who um, put together the contract with the Salvation Army and the negotiations it took. I know it took a number of months to get that done. Um, with the potential um, uh, sort of it's not a it's not a directive, but with the with the um, request to try to also have them provide that um, unemployment insurance as part of it. I mean, do do we see that as a being having a problem with negotiating contracts, both longer term contracts with them um, as an employer? Um, so, in other words, I guess my question is, you know, we're hiring them. Um, and just trying to understand what that may, how that may, that clause, whether it's Salvation Army or any other nonprofits, um, do we anticipate that being a, having, do we have, anticipate having problems with that kind of contract language in the, in, in the, in the future? I'm not sure who that would go to, I guess Cassie maybe. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Do I anticipate the way I'm, I'm the way I'm reading the um, the way I, I think you remarked that um, the way I'm reading the the, the motion uh, is to include um, basically for a longer term contract that the that the basically that whoever the company is or the nonprofit that we are hiring should be required to provide uninsurance uh, uh, unemployment insurance for people who have worked for them under this contract with the city. So I'm just trying to understand if that would, be, if we think that would impact our ability to complete contracts with various vendors. I understand the intent. I don't, I'm not questioning the intent of trying to have everybody have access to unemployment insurance, but I'm just kind of wondering about how it may impact our ability to actually attract and get vendors under contract. Well, maybe I see Lee, Lee's head popped up and he may be able to comment on this. I, I can just say generally, um, because uh, they're exempt from requiring that benefit, that's something that they're going to be hesitant to provide. Um, and I can say, um, you know, we're in a situation where they, li they literally can't provide it because our contract length is too short. Um, you know, whether or not we would be able to, if we had a longer contract length, we'd be able to negotiate with that with them. I think um, that's up in the air right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, um, um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I would just add that um, we would need to have, as uh, Attorney Bronson mentioned, a uh, minimum of a two-year contract in order for the state to approve that. So that would mean we would need to have the funds set aside for the two years. Um, and what I would say is if the, um, if we were, pursuing a two-year contract and talking with them, they would likely have um, an increased cost. They would say, all right, if you want us to do that for more than two years um, and include that insurance, then they would pass that cost along to us is what I would anticipate. But we would need to have that funding in place for two years. And as you know, right now, we're, we're only looking at the one-year contract and only have the funds at this point in time for the one-year contract. Thank you. Thank you, Director Butler. Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, the the language was simply to suggest that in the future, should we be exploring longer term contracts with a provider, that we explore the possibility of including unemployment insurance. So I'm not sure why we're going down the road of wondering what the Salvation Army will do if we get if we ever get to that point. The whole point was just to say it's a priority to explore that should we be able to in the future. That's all I'm and Councilmember Brown, we appreciate the spirit behind the request. That's how uh, we interpret it. We hope to be fortunate to be in a position where we can have some longer term agreements with our community partners and not be in the situation where we have these short term contracts. And a lot of that's just a symptom of the the limited funding that's supporting these efforts. So um, if we find ourselves fortunate enough to have some longer term agreements, it's something we can certainly circle back on. Thank you for the clarification. 
And at this time, we have a motion and a second with accepted friendly amendments. May we have a roll call vote? Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Devices? Aye. 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 Uh, Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. That was item number 16 on our consent agenda. Okay. That concludes our consent agenda items. Moving in to our uh, consent public hearing items. These are items number 38 and 39 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on items 38 or 39, now would be the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you're joining us here in person at council chambers, please sign in up here at the clipboard to let me know that you are here for public comment on items 38 and 39. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any of the items? And I will look for hands. I don't see any in the virtual panel. Council member Cummings. I just have a comment on item number 38. Great. Comment on 38. And Council Member Brown, did you have your hand up? Uh, I had a comment on 38, but it, I'm guessing it's going to be the same comment. So, but I'll okay jump in. Great, thank you. Okay, well, we will begin. So, item number 38 is the second amendment of the 555 Pacific Avenue Apartments Development Agreement. And uh, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just want to um, thank city staff and the developer on this project. Um, for members of the public, uh, 94 of the units uh, that are within this project are now being proposed to uh, this, the small ownership units uh, being converted to 100% rental and subject to the city's inclusionary requirement, which was increased to 20%. And um, I think that this is going to provide, um, one, it's going to meet the needs uh, that have been set out in our city's ordinance around trying to reach 20% um, in perpetuity affordable housing units, uh, which is something that will help us with our arena numbers and is something that many people in the community have expressed they wanted to see and demonstrating that we're you know, able to um, meet these requirements. And so I just want to um, express my appreciation for what's before us today because um, many people have said it can't happen. and. We've now seen two projects where we've met that 20% inclusionary. And so I uh, just want to express my appreciation for getting us to this point. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Brown, did you have additional comment? No. Great, thank you. All right, at this point, I will now bring it out for our public comment. If there are any attendees with their hands raised, you can press star nine by raising your hand or choosing the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. I don't have any members of the public that are speaking to these items 38 and 39. Let's see, and no attendees with their hands raised. Oh, I do have one, Jesse B. Uh, Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself.
Go ahead. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bruner. Thank you, uh, council members. I just wanted to, uh, Jesse Bristol, Swanson Builders, just want to say thank you to staff um, for helping us work uh, with this DA agreement. And we really appreciate um, planning, planning commission as well and also city council. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. There is a, a phone number. Okay, that I think that's it. Great. Thank you. I will bring it back to council for uh, action on items 38 and 39. And I see council member Myers. Did you wanna make a motion? Yeah, Mayor, I'll move these items. And I just have a comment on uh, item number 38, um, which I'm happy to support. Um, and along with um, certainly uh, achieving the 20% inclusionary, which is a really, really great outcome. Um, you know, this project has long been vilified in Santa Cruz as um, this market rate project that was sort of a scourge on the neighborhood for a long time. We've had multiple people talk about 555 Pacific in a very negative way. Um, but I think this project is very interesting in that um, at the end of the day, because of the relationship with um, the success in, in both the market rate version, market rate period of this housing, but then the conversion that we're gonna be approving right now. Um, and with the fact that that market rate piece actually had to get done so that the project could actually get financed. Um, this is the complicated world that affordable housing has to live in. And so, you know, when we, we hear a lot of people, you know, really slam 555 Pacific. And um, so I, I want to thank our staff. Um, I think they always have their eye on the creative approaches needed. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Bristow and their work um, in building housing, albeit sometimes it's market rate housing, but oftentimes um, we do end up with uh, affordable units through their work. Um, and many times it is the building community that is actually building affordable housing, those affordable housing units. So housing of any type is hard to do all the time, especially um, with the building costs um, that we have here of upwards of $600 a square foot. So um, this is another formula of a successful project ending with, with, um, with some great outcomes for affordable housing, um, as well as market rate um, uh, as well. So thank you Mr. For Mr. to Mr. Bristow for being here. And I'm happy to, to make the motion for both items number 38 and 39 on the, on the, um, on the uh, no, what's this one hearing. called? It's not consent, it's the uh, public, public hearing. Public hearing. Thank you. Yes. Council member Kalantari Johnson. And I'll second, thank you. So we have a first and a second. First by council member Myers, seconded by council member Kalantari Johnson. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Boulder. Aye. Aye. Coming. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Have a good day. We've caught back up in our timing. Uh, do we have anybody joining us? Uh, for this next item. Great. We do, Mayor. Great. I think I'm, Laura Schmidt is jumping on as well. I'm wondering if we can just take a five minute bio break. Yeah, that okay. works. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. If council members can turn on their cameras. Thank you for that brief break. We've been sitting since early this morning. Welcome to our guests as well. Thank you for joining us.
Okay, we are next up on our agenda, item number 40, Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Final Award Recommendations. This is the core final award recommendations. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions that will be on your screen. The order for this item will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Please note public commented, comment will be limited to no more than 30 minutes. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item, 33 emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. So at this time, I would like to hand it over. And I see we have from, we have a, a assistant city manager, Laura Schmidt, and from the County Human Services Department, Randy Morris. And uh, who else? I'm looking at all my squares. Kimberly, Kimberly Peterson. Peterson, thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor. I'm Laura Schmidt, the Assistant City Manager, and I would like to welcome our partners in CORE. We have here with us as guest speakers from um, the Santa Cruz County, Randy Morris, the director of HSD, and Kimberly Peterson, a deputy director from HSD. They will be taking us through the presentation heard earlier at the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and the final recommendations for the next three years for core recipients, as well as follow-up that we've been working on with the county that they have been nicely leading us through possible follow-up actions related to transition funding for those recipients current core recipients who are not funded in the next cycle. And with that, I would like to thank once again, Randy and Kimberly and hand it over to Randy and I will start sharing the screen. Um, okay, hi, city council members. Um, again, just awkward with this important discussion to be in front of you virtually and again, to Matt, I want to say thank you to Laura for answering every text I sent, sent in the last three weeks, which I'm not going to tell you the hours of the day, but Laura, appreciate your partnership, kind of figure this out. Dual jurisdictional funding is complicated. Um, let me start with what happened this morning. I'm, I'm very mindful that, you know, we are five, six of the funding and you are one, six, but the one, six funding is your money. And it's just a byproduct of the timing that, you know, we have a board hearing in the morning and a vote is made. And then we're in front of you and you're sort of following. So I just wanna take a minute to recognize that that creates a dynamic in and of itself. But I do wanna make sure for those who did not have an opportunity to hear what happened to the board, just start with what happened. And then you can kind of have that in mind as we walk this through. And if there's any implications of your city wanting to go in a different direction, which is completely your prerogative, I feel like my role is just to explain kind of the interconnected parts and sort of the dominoes that could play out just so you have full information as you make a decision. Because as I've said, every time I've been in front of you, this is your money. And I know it involved choices and decisions to partner with another jurisdiction, especially since we're larger, kind of just creates a dynamic. So there were really, um, there's actually four specific actions in front of the board this morning. One of them doesn't apply to you because of the MOU we have with you where your budget gets moved into our budget collectively puts together and therefore there was an action this morning about how our department could move the money forward before we came to the board and the auditor controller so that didn't apply but the three items the more simple one was um, approved 5-0 which is to make sure we have a comprehensive report back to the board and if your city wants to be involved we would include you in december with a whole host of um, report backs on a whole host of things and we got some additional direction because of concerns the board had about some of the lessons learned already about things that were complicated that might be less complicated if we apply them next time so we've got some very concrete direction to make sure when we do a lessons learned process we apply those we welcome any similar direction from you all um, of course don't mind hearing things you thought went well but we understand usually what you hear about is the things people don't like so anything you can give direction to us if we want to work together on a lessons learned 
process and report back, we welcome that. Um, and that is one of the three things that were voted on this morning. The other two are separate budgets. The first was the actual core budget and the recommended um, awards, which were modified from June 7th, were approved 5-0. I'll come to that in the presentation. Um, but the second was, and it really your direction on June 7th of the afternoon was very specific and direct to look for other, another funding stream to try to help those who are not getting funding. And so that, along with what we we're hearing from the community, we did find another funding stream. And that was a second recommended action. And that was voted on this morning to approve with a modification. And I will come back to that. So wanna let you know everything passed, some additional direction on the lessons learned exercise, a modification to some transition money, um, but the slate of recommended awards, including some new ones that are in the materials were all approved. So that was this morning. So Laura, if you or other are uh, moving the screen, this is, yeah. So I'm gonna walk through what those modified recommend actions are, briefly walk through the appeals process. I think there was so much energy and concern about was the process fair, was it applied evenly? Just wanna make sure to take a minute to let you see that there is a letter, letter from the general services department director in the county that outlines in great detail what happened. And what was not public is that every one of the agencies that appealed got a very detailed letter outlining the response so that um, that information happened. And then summarize, close out with next steps. This will be a much briefer presentation than last night, I promise you. <laughs> okay, so the next slide. So this is the first um, recommended action this morning. We were directed by the board on June 7th, and I don't understand the, the process for your city. That's up to you all to talk about now where it was resolved since then. We got one direction to remove funding to one of the um, recommended grantees and specifically directed as county staff to return and recommend how to repurpose that money to something else. So that was one. Number two, the RFP structure, which your council and the board approved, gave staff discretion to come back with recommended awards at up to a 10% adjustment to the recommended award amount that the um, CBO applied for. And in the June 7th recommendations, we brought forward 3% adjustment. And that allowed us to get a, two more medium and two more large tier grants. In full disclosure, it was in part all of those meetings that we had with the community. There was sort of this leaning, I wouldn't say consensus, but leaning to make the money go deeper it's hard to spread money thin. So we did not want to, at least in our first recommendation, to trim the full 10% because we wanted to have the money go deeper for that those community discussions. But clearly between June 7th and to date, the feedback was this is really difficult and hard for the community to, to take that a lot of important agencies weren't funded. So we put that repurposing of the one grant that we were directed by the county to not fund and that extra 7% to stay within the parameters of the RFP we put that together to take the full 10% and that allowed us to fund the next highest ranked large tier application. We could not go deeper in large tier because those are such large grants. We didn't have enough money to go to one more. That made it easy. <laughs> so then we took the balance and we were able to fund four more mediums, all in rank order, all following the parameters of the process. And this is a list of who they are. The large, and this was a point of discussion at your council and a lot of discussion in between the seventh and now, senior network services, aging and community program, pretty comprehensive program, helping frail older adults stay in their home. And it specifically in their, rec in their application says, we will use this money to draw federal and state area agency on aging money, which was a discussion item. We didn't orchestrate it to make this happen. It just landed well that that sort of checked that box because that is the largest grant in this new slate. And um, if this is approved as the board did this morning, that would check that box. And that's the one next largest um, grant. The four medium grants that then in the next four highest ranked are Big Brothers, Big Sisters, a mentoring program, the Family Services Agency Suicide Prevention Funding, which ties to the new federal mandate to have a 988 program. And that agency, Family Service Agency, is the regional provider. So that um, ties well. They had shared a lot about the concerns about that with mental health issues that have played out some, since the pandemic, very righteous issue. Um, community Ventures, 
a guaranteed income program that the application identifies 30 low income working families, uh, Latinx working families to help them with a guaranteed income program and a whole host of financial literacy programs to help them move um, off of government support into self-sufficiency. And then last was the diversity center, which is a package of mental health services for the LGBTQ population. I do wanna share that of these five agencies, four of the five are current funded agencies. So that sort of coincidentally addressed one of the concerns that was raised by many. Um, and the one that is not is the Community Ventures Program, which since five years ago, guaranteed income was a concept in Stockton, California, that's been getting a lot of attention in the last few years. So it's sort of an emerging best practice that was newly proposed and made it in the top rank. Um, I do wanna briefly share that this, this package, um, and I apologize in advance if this is redundant, but the full package is a 11% increase in the current allocation when you put the city and the county money together. Um, of the slate of recommended awards with these amended uh, awards, two thirds of the money goes to current programs and one third is new. So I just wanna share that just cause that question has been coming out. Like did this just like clean the slate and restart it? it, it yes, it had some big shifts bigger than ever before here, but two thirds are sort of agencies uh, continuing to get money. And as Kimberly and I presented in June 7th, though there is a change in agencies of that one third, the analysis we did is there is an equitable distribution by age population, by geography, race, ethnicity, core condition, and it mirrors what the application volume was. There's about three times the number of applications in terms of dollar amount than money, but it actually spreads evenly. The change is what agencies delivering what and to who, but, but the services are actually a similar mix. So I just wanted to share that. So next slide. Aha. Okay, Laura, this was your slide. Um, so this number two was a combination of your specific direction to your city staff. And that's what I think Laura was probably mentioning is that we immediately started talking about, you know, is there any um, general fund you have? I don't know your budget, that's your process. That's Matt and Laura's role to work with you all. And you had the direction to come back on the 14th in your budget hearings. I think I understand that got deferred to today, technically in terms of any new money for fund agencies. I shared this morning publicly, I'm not gonna go through it all in detail here, but um, it, what happened is we, County Human Services that are 88.5% federal and state funded, we are heavily dictated by how the state economy is rolling. And so the way our budget works is we have a certain amount of general fund approved, um, you know, a year ago for the current year budget. And that general fund is in our budget. And when state revenues come into human services at a higher than estimated, our process is then what general fund is not needed, which is usually not the case, but this year it is. That goes back to the CAO general fund and it usually goes into reserves or other priorities or we negotiate something. So we were able to identify between June 7th and today's presentation the materials when we made them public that our estimates of the state funding coming to human services, um, we can confidently put $500,000 of money on the table because that is the money that's offset by the higher than expected state revenues into county HSD. And then Laura and Matt, without giving a specific dollar amount, had just conceptually said, we will share in that to amount to be determined by you all. So we had put on the table this new recommended action and it was in complete response to the community-based organizations saying between our own push to delay the RFP process because the Omicron variant and we were delayed in being able to get our applications in, we are back at the two days before the season closes. And then there was a lot of agencies who have been used to this funding a long time. So we put forward this proposal with that money, which is one-time money, and we do not anticipate having it next fiscal year at this moment. What our analysis is with that money landed on a three month transition bridge for all current core agencies at their current contract amount that are not recommended for funding. So that is what was proposed. The check mark of additional material 3A is as soon as we put that money out, we realized because this money is not tied to the RFP parameters, it truly is money for elected officials to say, well, okay, well, that's a good step idea, but it's not tied to the RFP. So what about this? What about that? So we submitted some additional materials to the board that through 
ended up sharing a couple of different ways to use that 500,000. There is a good discussion at the board this morning, um, considerations to look at some of the um, other ideas we put forward. In the end, this is what the board voted on. They accepted our staff recommendation with one additional direction. And that additional direction was to not provide bridge funding to the current core agencies that have a grant of less than 25,000. The uh, motion was put forward by Supervisor Coonerty. His argument, you can go listen to it yourself, but basically was the dollar amounts at that point are so small, the agencies that really need this bridge funding, they are more dependent upon this funding than the small agencies to add a couple thousand here and there versus really being able to provide bigger bridge funding. So the board deliberated, they looked at all this and they ended up voting to accept that amendment. So the board direction this morning was to fund three months of bridge for all current core agencies, except those who have very small grants under 25. I will tell you since the board hearing, we've done the math and that adds about 10% of bridge money from that 500 and it allows us to extend the bridge for all of the agencies that are above 25 from three months to closer to four months. So I just want to disclose that to you, but we understand you know, you might have deliberations or questions on this new action that was in front of the board this morning. Um, as Laura or whoever crossed off number three, um, okay, that's, and then the last was that we would be um, back for a comprehensive report to the board. If your city council would like us to, we would come back to you. And we did get some additional direction, as I said earlier about really re exploring creating some more guardrails and some more parameters because the absence of some parameters like, why didn't you wait um, an applicant's ability to leverage federal and state money higher and said, okay, fine, that, that can be added. So we were directed to include that in our lessons learned and a few other things. Um, the last one is the MOU that we had, your city council approved on the 7th and our board approved on the 7th that then allowed your June 14th budget action of your 1 million and 80,000 to be approved. And it has been actually included in our county budget and it was approved on consent today. So that's the full 5,953,000 core allocation to fund the um, slate of recommended awards with those five new ones listed earlier. So next slide. Um, just for a clarification for our council, um, the recommended motion language number three in the our city council agenda report um, that was a detailed nuance that got swept into the action for number four and that's the reason why it struck out here so um, when, if you approve the direction for number four it will include a status of agreement when we come back in December. Okay, I think this is the second to last slide. Um, this is just a quick summary. You can read the attachment that comes from the County General Service Director. We were firewalled out from the process as human services by design. We did get called by General Services to ask answer a question or two as they did the review, but here's the findings. Um, there were 19 agencies that filed appeals. Um, they were allowed to appeal on anything they felt they wanted to appeal. And so of those 19 appeals, there were 73 specific items appealed. The General Services Department deemed 30 of them to be what's called a protest or statement. It's actually a technical term in procurement. Um, and just to give you an example, it's like when an agency appealed, you know, my agency does really important work in the community and if I'm not funded, this will happen. That absolutely could be righteous and real. It's just not an appealable item um, as listed in the RFP. There are four specific terms. So those were noticed and recognized in the response to those agencies where those were deemed protests or statements. But of the 43 items that were remaining that were deemed appealable within the construct of the RFP, um, 42 were denied and the, there was one partially substantiated and that was one agency noticed that the panel comments that were provided to all um, applicants that asked made positive comments about the agency's budget, but the ranking was um, in the medium, it wasn't the top. And so we were directed to give that applicant the top ranking, we did that, and that did not change their aggregate score to high enough to bump the, anybody above them. So it did not in the end change the recommended award list. So that's the summary of the appeals. So next slide, and this is the final slide. Um, pending, well, based on board action this morning and pending your action, because of the MOU we have between with you, and if you approve most of this or all of it, of course, then it's straightforward. 
we have board authority from this morning, both to our department, human services, and the auditor controller who has a role that we can execute contracts immediately. And we do not have to go back to the board to show those contracts to get approval. And we're allowed to give, um, and not to mix up the second check mark, but under executing new contracts, we're actually allowed to pay providers per um, county proce uh, uh, process three months upfront payment while we're negotiating the scope so they can get started and have cash flow. The second check marks mark is pending your city council's approval of your share of this, which is that bridge payment. So we have authorized the bridge payment with that amended action from this morning that I listed. The second next step is we will make it public in the fall, but we are actually going to start the work um, end of July and get a whole committee together and do an evaluation process, make it very public. We talked about this on the 7th. If you all still want to, we want to interview every elected official at the county and the city. And, and this doesn't dictate that we have to do this the same way or we have to continue to share funding. We just want to hear what you all think, what worked, what didn't work, harness the, the concerns and grab it while it's all fresh. And then report back. We don't think we'll be done with that effort in December, but include a status update in December but we just don't want to lose the moment. This was a very emotional process, a lot of opinions, and they're varied, um, but, you know, because some have been very positive. There's much more positive public comment this morning supporting the actions than there were on the 7th, where there's a lot of concern stated. So all of it put together, we want to harness that energy and figure out how to apply anything that we can. Um, and then in December, and this is where I'll sort of close out, um, we have a host of things we need to report back on. We owe the board and your council as funders of the last five years of the grant, um, a summary and an overview of what came of it. So that five-year report would come back, the lessons learned update and where we are, and then also um, kind of where we are in executing these contracts if the three-month bridge payment goes through with you as well, just to give a full comprehensive update to everybody on all of those actions. Um, so Laura, if you're the one controlling it, that closes out the formal presentation and Kimberly, who did not give a presentation with me that she did last time, because she is, she's got a big binder of stuff next to her if you have questions and has a lot of the technical information, but we are both here to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Randy Morris and Kimberly Peterson for joining us. Um, I. You know, thank you for uh, running through that summary as concisely as possible in such a short time. Uh, this was a very new process for myself and some of the other council members. And I think um, for many of the community members, it was, as you so accurately stated, very emotional, very hard. Uh, funding and resource constraints right now are being felt across our county in so many ways and this was definitely one of them so i'm uh, excited to see some of the direction for moving forward especially from what you said the understanding that in the fall there will be a public process or input process um, to make the process, to receive input on the process for the next round, for the future. Um, is that my understanding, what that fall 2022? Yeah, um, yes, and we can take any specific direction from you, how you would like us to govern the process, but let me be more precise. What we anticipate, and this is what we did in advance of the RFP, is we would have a number of community meetings that wouldn't necessarily be Brown Act governed in public, but invite as many people as possible to participate. We would have individual interviews with all elected officials who want to participate. And then we would like to bring that information and make it public so that the county board and the city council can then hear the summary of what came of that process, give the public an opportunity to make comment, have deliberations, and if we stay on schedule, we are not going to have another RFP for, you know, two years and when we initiate the process. But again, we want to harness all that now and not wait and have a process in a year from now when this is yesterday's news, et cetera, because now is when everybody's really raw about this. So if that answers your question, Mayor Bruner, yes, we want to grab people's thoughts, feelings, opinions, recommendations now, and then air all of it publicly to have public input to a, um, a process that helps inform us to what the next RFP cycle will look like. Great, thank you. I think that does answer my question and making sure that um, everybody's clear on where to be able to input that process. Like if, if 
once that is established, how that will, how, how the input will be received in person, online, or a variety of methods, uh, and really from not just the elected officials, but the nonprofit organizations, the programs, the applicants, and the community members that received the services had a lot of opinions that I'm happy to share as well. It was, I think, $16 million of requests for a almost $6 million pot so clearly the needs far exceeded the, the funding available and um, this process, uh, I think a lot of input came on the eligibility. A lot of the uh, suggestions for next time were around the eligibility requirements. Um, so looking a little more with a fine tooth comb at that process. So thank you for spelling that out and I'm going to bring it out to uh, our council members for questions and uh, council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor and hello, Randy and Kimberly. Thanks for the presentation and for your work on this. I, I did have a couple of questions. Um, so for the bridge funding, how many organizations fall under uh, the under 25K? That, that was the amendment from the Board of Supervisors. Do you know how many organizations there are? It is as if we anticipated one of you asking. I think Kimberly has this in an email that came in the last hour. Am I right, Kimberly? And if so, can you answer what that number is? I, I have to go sort through my email, but I think, okay. yes, Kimberly, we have it, right? Yes, yeah, so based on our fifth goal of the board meeting, um, if there are 11 organizations, I will state that some of those organizations have multiple programs that um, were funded under 25,000. And if I, and I wanna share uh, council member Colin Tari Johnson, and I apologize if I'm getting ahead of you, but I feel like this is the inevitable extrapolation. This is what used to be called set aside. And now they're called small tier. So I just wanna say, I'm looking at the, I found the email. Those grants range from $4,500 for a year to $22,000. And that's the, that's the reference, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, that's the statement Supervisor Coonerty made for grants that are so small, carving that by a fourth, grabbing that and giving more to the agencies that are more dependent upon. That was the policy statement made, but now we have the numbers and those are 4,500 to 22,000 split up over 11 programs, which is one, two, three, four. Well, it's 11 agencies, about 15 programs. 11 agencies, 15 programs. And, and what I'm understanding is and, that- and oh, yeah. for, for clarification, um, these agencies that meet the 25K are less in the city of Santa Cruz were not necessarily set aside agencies our set aside agencies were, were different. So we had reoccurring annual grant, small grants that were not set aside. So our list is a little bit different than the county's. Okay, so that was gonna be my next question is within that, how many are city of Santa Cruz agencies or programs? And we probably maybe don't have that breakdown. We have, I have an approximation and I tried to do this really quickly, anticipating the question and let me bring that up for you. Um, Are you able to read this? I'm getting my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, that's better. There you go. Okay. Okay. Laura, can you uh, clarify what this list is that you're showing? So the amendment motion that passed at the County Board of Supervisors 
this morning related to the bridge funding, the three month bridge funding. They made an amended motion for the existing core recipients that were awarded annually less than $25,000 to not do bridge funding. And so I did a quick analysis of city of Santa Cruz fiscal year 22 existing core recipients that are underneath $25,000 that were also not awarded in the new cycle. Okay. And this is our city of Santa Cruz. That's not confusing enough. (laughs) Yeah, but but then some of these organizations um, are part of the recommended fund. They have programs that are part of the overall recommended funding. Like for example, Big Brothers Big Sisters, for example, Diversity Center. That's what I I can confirm. And Laura, I this is an organic moment because I admit yeah. to the the future slate of awards. Now that we have an MOU and all the city money is proposed to be combined with county money, and therefore all contracts will be merged. I admit to not having at the ready in my head what current contracts are, like Laura, for example, what you just displayed. I don't know if that's standalone Mm -hmm. contracts of yours or if that's your contribution that merges with ours and therefore it's above 25,000. That's part of the complexity of this. So I just want to be transparent that we don't have that analysis given this new action just showed up five hours ago or four hours ago. So you might have to do some quick thinking, but Laura, I just, was that list all city owned contracts or your contribution, some of which come to us and we commingle our funds? Those are fiscal year 22 existing city core recipients, not funded. Okay, so I, I just- $25,000. Well, one of the, re, and I'm bringing this up just to make sure everybody has all information and I don't know the answers to this, but my understanding is one of the reasons we put the MOU in place was to minimize the challenge for a CBO to run one program and have one contract with the city and one contract for the county that for the CBO comes together as two contracts, even though it's for the same program. So it might be the list, Laura, that you just disclosed is your contracts, right? but they might not, they might together be above 25,000. So we, we, in our analysis only included those contracts that together are above. So we have to do some digging and I don't know if we're going to have that while we're here talking. Uh Oh, maybe Kimberly has the answer. I did just want to add that the, the list that we were going by um, was was started from basically to determine which organizations, um, were, which programs were funded at less than $25,000. We started from the list that was, um, I think you guys had it, attachment 3A. And so that was the base from which we pulled. And that list of programs came from a comparison of all of the um, core proposals that were received for this next round in comparison to the current core contract. And so we did a cross-reference to see who reapplied. And then for those that reapplied and were not funded for the, those same or very, very similar programs, then they were listed on that list for bridge funding. And then this afternoon, we pulled out those that received less than 25,000, um, if that helps. Okay. I, I, yeah, I think what I'm trying to get at is to zero in on how many of those have the braided city funding and how that impacts it. And maybe we don't have that information. Um, and then sort of related to that question, if, um, Kimberly or Randy, if you can answer. So, so what I'm understanding is that um, the county is setting aside 500,000 from their general funds for the purpose of this bridge funding. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so we put in our board materials and in full disclosure, <laughs> the draft we sent to Laura at like, what was it? One o'clock Thursday did not have the 500,000 figure. So your materials don't have that, but they are on the board because we chose to add the dollar amount literally because we were debating and this is a full disclosure to do we put the dollar amount or we just put the concept out and in the end we decided to put the dollar amount so the 500,000 is what we county human services mm-hmm. in those machinations I told you happened because we got so much more state we got 500,000 more state revenue in the last two months that we didn't expect 
that offsets the general fund that's appropriated to us in our budget. So the CIO would normally take that for CIO purposes, increasing reserves or other projects, Watsonville Hospital, whatever. We collaborated with Carlos, our CIO, and said, given the pressures, the needs, the quick turnaround, we need to put that 500,000 on the table. I will let Laura and Matt speak to the words they use, but I called them immediately. And I just said, given this is collective funding and you have a direction from your council to find new revenue, do you believe you have opportunity to at least share in the funding so that I can put that in the board, county board materials? And Laura, Matt, I hope I'm not going too far down the road. They said, yes. So we didn't commit a dollar amount from the city, but we just said we will share in it. So, so uh, we have 500,000 of county money as I described, and then whatever you can put in that, that adds up to the three month bridge. And we did assume that it would be 500 and change from you that would get to that three month bridge amount. So yeah, Laura and Matt, if, if you could speak to that. So does that mean that that we're, we are contributing within that 500 or we are then going above the 500? No, we would be contributing a portion of the total bridge funding of $500,000 that county estimated. And anything that we contribute, we would have to find in the general fund by offsetting it from somewhere else. So has that from been the budget we just adopted and and has that been discussed among staff and what does that look like um we have not gone into it in any level of detail we're waiting for council action depending upon the dollar amount if um based upon um, how big that is and whether or not we can handle the change administratively we could do so if it um, doesn't meet administrative fund transfers criteria, which is usually around $100,000, and we would have to come back to the council for action. Okay, thank you for clarifying those pieces. I'll um, pause my questions for now, because I'm sure my colleagues have questions too. Thank you. Laura, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, and other funding streams, have those been explored? Um, I know some small discussions have been had, for example, the Children's Fund and potentially um, other options, or is the General Fund right now the only option at this point to explore? It would have to be from the General Fund if there were options um, that it was related to the Children's Fund. That would obviously be something we could take a look at in the future. But um, the general fund, probably the easiest location to look at would be um, the capital investment program. Thank you. Council member Cummings. So I'm trying, <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around where we go next with this. So um, it seems like based on um, the presentation, the county has identified certain organizations that they're gonna prioritize that funding to go to. And it also sounds like if the city wants to match funding or if we wanna also fund those organizations as we have in the past or in any other type of way, we need to do that, make that decision today. Is that correct? Because I'm just trying to, to, to understand how, you know, if we're going to be making decisions, because I believe that we all have organizations that, uh, some of which I think we're, are in complete alignment with the county, um, some of which maybe there's certain council members that want us to fund and go towards and other council members don't, but I'm just trying to think and see how we can get to <coughs> um, our ability to take action today since we don't have, you know, the, count, the, the county made the decisions and we don't have all those numbers in front of us and it's it's a little challenging without those numbers for us to kind of navigate the situation. So I'm just kind of curious if like, what is the next kind of um, the need from us this time? Uh, I, Laura, I feel like this might be a moment to share something that happened this morning at the board. It seems similar enough to what council member Cumming is is bringing up, I wanna bring up this nuance. The action in front of the board this morning, they chose to separate the motions into two independent motions. 
and I want to explain to you why. And I can't speak for you, Council Member Cummings, but if it's on point, maybe this is relevant. Uh, and I am going to own that I'm choosing to respond to your comment about county prioritizing because the second item was exactly the county prioritizing. The first item, and that's where I'll start, the choice to bring back the county directed elimination of one grant, which created money and we were directed to propose how to repurpose it. And then moving the grant awards down to the full 10% trim. That was one motion that lived on its own. And my comment about the county choosing, we applied the RFP parameters, which I understand are controversial, but it wasn't a arbitrary, what do we think is most important? We just went to the next ranked. The purpose for that being independently voted on as an independent motion is it kept that through line of, hey, we had 12 community meetings, seven public, we created the rules. And we also, in hindsight, chose not to add certain rules that maybe we should have, but this is the process. Let's go with the rankings. Let's take all money we have within the allocation and get five more agencies awards. And we listed those. So that motion was considered independent and standalone and the board voted 5-0. Randy, can, uh, the next grant, can I just clarify when you say that, that's the next grant in the scoring rubric? In the scoring ranking. So ranking. we have So it rankings. wasn't that they randomly chose. Uh, correct. And that's five, what I'm choosing uh, to be specific. Programs. Is that we <laughs> didn't, was oh was my gosh, this agency said the most compelling, we just went to the next in line based on the ranking. Okay, thank you. So that you. large tier grant to Senior Network, they were literally the next. And those four mediums, they were, and in fact, two of them were tied, I think. But they, they, it's just literally following the process per the RFP parameters within the core allocation. Thanks. Now to the 500,000. That was considered a separate action and it was a separate motion to help simplify the, the decision points in front of the elected body. And that is where, just to, to key off of what I I, at least I'm hearing council member Cummings, that was indeed a collaborative staff recommendation between your city staff, Laura and Matt, myself, I think Tiffany was on vacation and Kimberly, can we find some new money? We've got to do something. This is really hard for these transitions. And what do we do with it? So that one, we for sure came up with this idea as an, another new action with a new pot of money we found for a one time, can we help? We came up with the idea of a bridge. But we then added this supplemental material because we're like, well, this is actually not in the parameter. So let's throw out other options because literally this is county and city general fund money. So that I'm parsing out council member Cummings because the board chose to separate that and take a vote on the RFP grant slate first and then go to what do we do with this 500,000 and the small and, and, and they did that second. So if that's helpful, I just want to let you know that's what played out this morning. Randy, that, that is helpful. Um... I think to follow up with that, it seems like the what was presented with their their applications that were submitted by certain agencies, and the programs under those agencies could be you know it could be one program or multiple programs. So I'm just wondering if maybe we could have that up on the screen or if some kind of email can be sent to us because, for example, I know that the a lot of the um, you know for example community bridges there was like Elder Day and a number of different programs that they offered and it looked like they were one of the recipients, I think, of the larger grants. It's just hard for us because we don't have that information in front of us since the, the decision was made while we were in the meetings today. And so it's hard for me without having it in front of me to, to be able to just constantly think back to what um, you know decisions were made, what the funding was, what programs it supported. So I'm just wondering if we can at least maybe get something sent to us while we're here or if we could have that back up on the screen. I, I'm wondering, Laura, if the doc, I, I admit <laughs> that there are so many documents. We tried to produce as much information as possible. And in hindsight, now it's hard to cross-reference all of them. But Laura, the document I'm wondering that might be responsive to council member Cummings is we put out a document, I think it was on the 7th, where we listed recommended awards, not by rank, but just by alphabetical order. Then a second tier was, I think we called it competitive because they scored above a certain threshold. And then a third tier was under a certain, that would give, if that's responsive to your point, council member Cummings, that would give you a picture. And oh, no, it's actually Kimberly, it's on the 27th, because then we added in green, the one additional, and then you'd be able to see, 
Council Member Cummings, everything else that wasn't recommended award, so you could see the whole universe. That, that's it, Laura. If that's helpful, Council Member Cummings, that's the one of the attachments. Council, uh, does that complete your question, um, Council Member Cummings? I'll, I'll stop there for now. Uh, I know Council Member Brown might have a question with, regarding this. It's, yeah, I just have a, a I won't interrupt your string of questions, but I, I just want to be clear here that that what was just put up, that is what happened. What, that looks like the same document that we already have, but now I'm hearing about changes that were made. So that document isn't accurate either. Well, so, let me let me put it into bucket A and B, I guess. Um, bucket A, within the parameters of the RFP, within the allocation the county and the city appropriated for the core budget, that document that showed is in bucket A and you already have that materials. And that shows the difference between June 7th recommended slate for awards by ranking. And then the modified recommendation in front of you, which is the five additional, one more large based on ranking, four more medium based on ranking. So that's materials for bucket A. Bucket B, we then proposed three months of bridge funding, finding 500,000 city committing to some portion of that. And that is a different set of doc. That's a different list. So depending on if we're talking about A or B, we, I guess just to be really focused, it's a, it's a different set of lists. So, can, can I just follow on that? So um, because there are so many documents that you can't really match up and they'll make your head spin if you try to put them all out and cross-reference, right? So um, um, I've had some help from a volunteer and we've been looking at and actually put that information into one spreadsheet. Um, but what I'm looking at now, so to be able to see, you know, what would have been really helpful from the beginning would have been uh, ability to see which programs um, were, you know, how much the programs that used to get funded lost. Because that is, whether or not we wanna talk about that because we wanna honor the process, that is the reality that brings us here to have this conversation was the response to that and the concerns about those programs, workers, jobs, services for low income people. So um, I so I so I'm have that, but and that's been very helpful. But now I'm trying to figure out if the, these additional changes um, actually <laughs> are reflected there. So like I see, for example, um, I just want to see if I'm getting this right because it's hard to make decisions uh, about what we want to do when we're not exactly sure what, <laughs> what it is that we're doing. And these may seem minor, but these are very big decisions um, and they mean, they mean a lot to the program, especially the small programs. I, I just, I'll go into comments later. Um, so for example, I see a program, so I, I think Advocacy Inc. is one of them that's on our list, so that'll work. So Advocacy Inc was not recommended for funding. And that was um, uh, $55,525 that they had received in the past. Um, they now, again, sorry, I'm like, I, my head is spinning. I've got to say, you know, I'm all the way to Z on the spreadsheet. Um, so they are gonna get, it looks like $10,000 bridge funding. So they n then did not, re that, that means that they've lost 45,000, right? Advocacy. Um, is that, am I getting that right? Another question I have, so another example that is, I guess, maybe more relevant, senior network services, and this is a county funded program. Does that mean that senior network services received more than what I'm seeing in the chart that I, that we put together based on all the PDFs we had before today. Um, so what I'm seeing is a loss of, sorry, I think I'm, yeah, I may be, it's apples and oranges now, so never mind on the seniors, senior network services and the seniors council. Um, oh no, it, there it is, sorry. Seniors, so the Seniors Council is losing in my chart based on all the PDFs we have, and we have scanned them all. We have reviewed everything. Looks to be losing 
$151,262. However, I heard that they're getting funding because we bumped down the into the next tier. So does that mean they are getting funded? Is this over uh, um, projecting the cut to senior network? I, I mean, I, I'm just, how do we figure out <laughs> You know which pro like for those I guess for those of us who would like to make these programs whole at least the city contribution and that's what I um, will advocate. Um, how do we figure out who got made whole based on the county's actions? And I'm asking this with a spreadsheet in front of me that literally has input into it every bit of information that we've received and it's accurate. So I can't figure out other than going one by one and asking those questions how to to wrap our minds around that here now. Okay. Um, I, I think I heard two or three or four things, and I think that's diagnostic of the complexity of the moving parts. So <laughs> <I'm staring laughs> um, let me start with what I think is the simplest, because as I understand it, it's only one county core grant, though, asterisk, the city has some money in it from what Laura flashed earlier, Advocacy Inc. They are a recipient of the local nonprofit, AAA. They are the local provider of the federally and state Older Americans Act mandate. And I know Council Member Brown, you um, sit on the advisory council. I, I ran the AAA in Alameda, so we both know it from different seats. But they, you, know, you have the federal and state money that comes in. And in this community, um, Advocacy Inc. Um, has used uh, general fund, formerly community programs money as a match, a draw, and a supplement. So to your question on that one piece of the puzzle, their application did not score high enough to be recommended for award, nor in the amended recommended awards did they bump high enough up. So that's part one. Part two, they are in our spreadsheet getting more than $25,000 of core money. So they will be a recipient of a bridge grant that is was proposed this morning to be three months. And based on the county action this morning, it increases it a bit to closer to four months of bridge funding. So that's one moving part. When you say senior network services, what gets complicated is some of these programs looking in the rear view mirror had a couple of different core grants and then looking forward applied for a different slate of core grants. So it's very hard to look backwards and look forwards at the same time when they got, well, for senior network services, they did not get an award until we came forward today, adding one more large, they are recommended. But I think if they apply for more than one, then they are recommended for that one, but not the other. <laughs> so council member Brown, yes, it's very messy, um, but we're doing our best to sort of bundle it all, all together and make sense and answer your questions. But I appreciate it's really hard to put it all. The best we could come up with is separating, as I said earlier, the A and the B and consider the action or not. It was agreeable to the board this morning for the slate of recommended awards because it was the process, et cetera. If you do like the board did this morning, that would be one vote. Then the focus is what to do with 500,000 and can you find more? And that could be a, that is a separate budget and a separate action. Okay, um, I, I thank you. I, I think that what I'm, yeah, and I get those intricacies as well. Um, so it sounds like really to know, we just have to ask on a, case by case basis, but I'm the, now what I'm hearing is it does sound like Advocacy Inc. will lose $45,000 in funding. Not all of that was city money, but 45,000 total. And that that's ac that is accurate based upon what you just described. So I'll try to, in my head, keep doing that with the others <laughs> for now. <laughs> Thanks. Do other council members have questions regarding the funding actions this this morning, the process that was presented? Okay, so I will take it out for public comment and then we can come back for action and deliberation on this item. And I do see one member of the public here in council chambers. Are you speaking to this 
uh, item on our agenda number 40? No. Okay, thank you. I will then take it out to our virtual members of the public. And I see several hands raised. To raise your hand, press star nine on your phone or choose raise hand on the webinar features. First name is Reverend Beth Love. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruna, and thank you, members of council and city and county staff. Um, first of all, I want to say that I I do not um, I do not envy any of you your job. This is a very messy and very difficult situation, and I think I want to acknowledge that there has been goodwill all along in terms of wanting to serve our community, and that I believe that everybody in this meeting, whether a member of the public or elected official or staff, wants to serve the public. And so I want to acknowledge that. And I want to say that, um, you know, a little bit of bridge funding has got to be a tiny bit better than not having any funding at all, though I do have a lot of compassion for those agencies that are um, not recommended for ongoing funding who have been counting on and using this money to serve our community. Um, I'm the executive director of Eat for the Earth. We were recommended for funding. And I just got back from vacation to find that the new recommendation is for 7% less. And um, while I, um, while that feels like a, it's, it's a large cut for us, it's only around $7,000, but we're a very small agency. I wanna say that it respects the integrity of the process because it doesn't throw away the results of the, the whole RFP process. So I appreciate that respect and that integrity with the process and that um, sharing, the, sharing the pain a little tiny bit um, so that more agencies can be funded is I think a very um, noble cause. And so um, I just wanna say that I don't have any specific recommendations for you all, but I, um, I look forward to partnering with the city and the county um, in creating a healthier community that is, uh, has greater access to the services that we offer um, and that people can heal their chronic disease by getting support, education, and dietary intervention. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Helen Ewan Story. Press star six to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, City and County Staff. I'm Helen Ewan Story, Acting Executive Director of the Community Action Board. Um, and as you know, CAB is the county's designated community action agency charged with eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services. We serve over 10,000 low-income people annually, including through our youth and young adult employment services, immigration, legal, and advocacy, as well as homelessness prevention and intervention services. So today, I just want to express CAB's thanks and appreciation for all the work that's gone through this process um, and let you know that we support the adjusted recommendations for CAB's core proposals, which we know reflects a 90% um, a recommendation of our request, but we support that in order to stretch the dollars and um, and have more uh, organizations funded. Um, and it's still going to help support CAB in helping thousands of low-income people, including at-risk, at-promise youth, young adults, day workers, farm workers, seniors, families, disabled households, many, many folks access needed services and supports to more fully uh, thrive in our community. I also you know, want to appreciate what challenging time this is right now for the city and the community as we're continuing to recover from the pandemic and then the current economic challenges we're facing. However, um, we also know that this is exactly the time when safety net services are needed the most. And so I really want to appreciate um, all of the thoughtfulness that you're putting into your deliberations to try to find some additional funding uh, for um, safety net services that were not recommended, but still provide important services. Many of those are our partners. And as you know, provide childcare and, and senior services, mental and physical health services um, that are, are important to our community and important to our social safety network and to other organizations like ours. So thank you very much. And we look forward to our continued partnership to equitably serve our community. Thank you for your input. Our next uh, member of the public is Sandy Davey. Press star six to unmute yourself. 
Um, I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center, and one of the ana the complex analysis, Sandy, I really appreciate, like your reflection of how difficult this is to maneuver all this data. One piece of information I think is really important that didn't come out in any of this is that um, funding for child care as a sector was essentially cut over 90% from the last core process. Um, I don't I don't necessarily think that that was an intention of the of the process, but that's one of the impacts of it. So essentially, the outcome is, a, is saying that the city and the county don't think that child care is an important service for, um, for local people. I don't think that you believe that that's true. And I agree that the process was complicated. Um, and part of the, I think part of the impact, the reason for um, some of the low, the low, the big cuts to child care was um, child care centers there was many child care centers that applied and were funded in past cycles that did not apply for this cycle. And that was because child care was so dramatically impacted by COVID um, that pretty much anybody, the directors who would have applied were essentially in the classroom trying to hold things together. So the dynamic of the process like eliminated child care from even participating because of the circumstances. And I can give you more information about that. But the result of it is essentially at this point for the city of Santa Cruz, there were, um, there's, there's three child care centers that I can look at that provides care for city of residents. One of them had some funding. The total funding of the corp is like about 0.001% of all core funding went to that one child care center. So it's like a rounding error how much actually went to child care. And then there's a toddler center who's one of the few places that provide quality care for children that are younger than three years of age, which is in desperate, desperate need. Anybody that has children knows this, it always has been, and it's just getting worse. To have our funding completely cut is unbelievably dramatic. As well as I want to point out, when you look at the numbers, you have to multiply them by three because the core decision is a three-year commitment. So Thank we got you. Your time is up. Dollars, that's 225000 So when you look at it that way, you Thank need you. to understand that. And then find some money, either Matt. Our next member of the public for comment is Nora Caruso. Welcome, Nora. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm the program director at the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center, co-director with Sandy David, who just got cut off. So yeah, I think what she was saying is that 75,000 times three is our total grant that we are losing for a total of $225,000. And a bridge grant gives us, you know, right around 20 grand, 90% um, cut is what we're looking at. And um, you guys talked about this being an emotional process. Yeah, it's emotional. I'm, I'm really, really sad, right? I work with toddlers. I know how to name my emotions. I'm sad that a decades long partnership with the city and the county is ending. I'm sad that the realization during the pandemic of the deep importance of childcare for functioning communities and economies has already been forgotten. I'm sad that our low income families will no longer have to have access to our high quality childcare program and that childcare is now going to become something that is only for the wealthy. I'm sad that my highly qualified teachers will not be eligible for wage increases despite the high cost of inflation that we're all facing living in Santa Cruz even worse. And I'm grateful, I am grateful for this idea of the bridge funding, but um, I'm not quite sure how in three or four months I'm gonna tell my families that are receiving subsidies that they can no longer receive care at the toddler center. Uh, do I? I, are they going to be able to work anymore? Because there's no other programs for one and two year olds. Um, they're not affordable because we are mandated by the state to have a very low ratio of teacher to children so that we can provide this quality care. It's three times more expensive to provide this than preschools, which is why it's so hard to find infant toddler programs that are still in existence. We're still in existence for the most part because of this partnership with the city and the county. This is why we can provide this care, but we will no longer be able to have a sliding fee skip without this partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you for your input. Uh, next is Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. And I believe this is the group that asked for additional time. 
Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yes, we uh, we were allotted uh, extra time on this one. Um, I'll try to keep my um, comments short, though. Good afternoon again, Mayor Bruner and members of the City Council. My name's Serge Cagno. I'm the Executive Director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. We support both the housed and the unhoused in being a part of a welcoming community to foster healing and to achieve their goals for stability. We were one of the new agencies to make our first application at appeal for core funding. We were not selected for funding, but we appreciate the integrity and sincerity of staff in the creation and management of this process. There have been challenges with the process and for future iterations, we look forward to collaboration with the government entities and the nonprofits to use lessons learned to improve this process. For where to go from here, we would like to state our appreciation for the fourth staff recommendation. Each of the nonprofits works hard to diversify their revenue streams. As you know, separate from core, city and county departments make contracts with nonprofits for needed services. They co-sign grant applications with nonprofits and they see grants which they do not apply but could suggest nonprofits apply. Presently, the fourth recommendation only includes supporting nonprofits who were previously funded by core but are not being funded in today's allocations. We simply ask that the city council include in its direction to staff to include trying to find funding for those nonprofits not recommended for funding who have not previously been funded by core. This recommendation is a momentous step towards officially collaborating between the city and county and local nonprofits to finding opportunities to meet the goals of our city, the county, as well as supporting our local nonprofits. Our ask is for a modification of recommendation number four to both including include partnering with the local human care alliance and exploring other funding sources and to include all agencies who did not receive core 22-23 funding regardless of whether or not they have received previous core funding. Thank you for considering this modification. Thank you for your input. Our next caller, Maria Cadenas. Welcome, Maria. Thank you. Recording in progress. And thank you uh, to, good afternoon to all the council members. Uh, my name is Maria Cadenas, I'm the executive director of Ventures. And uh, we're honored and, and privileged to thank you for the consideration of funding uh, two of our programs, um, Semillitas and Alas. Uh, we know that all Santa Cruz residents can benefit from a shared and prosperous economic future where zip code, race, or gender do not dictate income or wealth, and that the pandemic highlighted the fragile financial stability of our economy, which is why creating and recognizing the value of creating a vibrant, healthy community requires a shared prosperity that, is, that will not happen overnight. It'll take working together. We're honored to work with many of the safety net providers as well as other agencies like the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed, Dientes, First Five, United Way, and others to make sure that we are working towards a better future for all. Semillitas provides college savings accounts to all newborns in the county. About 40% of those come from the city of Santa Cruz. Thanks to this funding, we'll be able to partner and extend our partnership with the state to make sure that children get additional funds as they grow up and that parents get additional education to find financial stability and mobility. Our ALAS cohort has proven that within six months, we could get families not only financially stable, but to increase a household income an average of $1,500 a month, thanks to the use of the funds for support for transportation to new jobs, for childcare and other services. I have great news. Today I have found out that University of Santa Cruz Blum Center will be partnering with us to fund the evaluation of ALAS, that guaranteed income model, which means that the funding today will help create valuable lessons learned for the future of the city and the county. Thank you again for your consideration, the thoughtful approach of this process, and for the support and extension to those that were not funded, listen to and consider for future partnership. Thank you for your input. Our next uh, member of the public is Reggie. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I just want to direct this at folks listening in today. I'm hearing a lot of like nonprofit service providers, people who serve 
the poor and the homeless um, feeling like this is this is normalized. This is like, you know, the city did everything they could, and this is just how it is. And I just want to let people know that this doesn't have to be how it is. We have money. Um, it's just going towards other things. Uh, if we cut the police budget by just 10%, uh, we could probably fully fund a lot of these services. Um, Santa Cruz police self-report 80% of calls for service are about homelessness that they can't do anything about. We're passing laws like the Camping Services and Standards Ordinance or the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance to just massively increase the police, the unnecessary criminalization of poor people at the same time that we're cutting services and creating more poor people. <clears throat> We've got city workers protesting outside saying that they need to live in vehicles. At the same time, we're funding police to take those people's vehicles away and send them to the bench lands. At the same time, we're talking about clearing the bench lands with no plan. At the same time, we're talking about kicking people out of Oceana Inn with no permanent housing, and they're going in their vehicles. And then we're going to kick those people out of their vehicles, and they're going to go in the bench lands, and we'll kick them out of the bench lands. So I want everyone listening right now to understand how unnecessary this is. And if you want to reach out to me, find me. My name's Reggie Meisler, M-E-I-S-L-E-R. Uh, and let's work together. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Raymond Cancino. Welcome. Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to just recognize and appreciate um, the thoughtfulness of the additional transitional um, dollars that are being pre presented um, in front of you today. Um, I do think that that is a step forward in helping to support um, long lasting partnerships that we've had in this community. Um, and I just want to urge you that to be more bold and to find additional dollars and resources to be able to do more. Um, I think that uh, we know, um, like the previous scholar, there are additional um, opportunities and places in which uh, you are making uh, budget decisions and making choices about what um, is valued in this community. And we know that there's a need uh, across our community uh, for many people that have been left out of uh, both uh, as a result of COVID, but as a result of just the inflation that we're seeing all around us. And right now is not the right time um, to stop uh, continuing to support services and individuals. Um, as you know, from the results of CORE, there are many uh, services that are mission critical to ensure uh, the well-being and health of our communities. Um, and I hope that you look uh, to additional resources and opportunities for, uh, to invest uh, in your community um, and that you put direction to and measurement to uh, what these um, kind of uh, loose uh, speaking um, directions of helping support nonprofits really means. I think it's really important to uh, understand that your staff already work with nonprofits to, to apply for grants. Many times they're asking us for letters of support to apply together. Um, so at just saying that we're going to do that um, is for something that we're already doing and without results is just going to lead uh, to the same outcome that we know is going to happen at the end of this meeting, which is um, some programs will lose and some programs will have to close the door. Uh, and so I urge you to really understand uh, what the impacts of these closures will mean to your community, to the services that are provided to your citizens, um, and understand how you can actually implement that change and invest in those services if that is what you want to see in San Cruz County. And so um, with that, you know, I just respectfully ask that you look at um, other funding sources and opportunities um, to look at the uh, at the ability to invest in some of these resources and programs. Your time is um, up. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Joy S. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I called in and commented this morning, or actually I was in chambers and commented this morning in support of SEIU workers. And listening to this conversation is just heartbreaking. Um, 
especially learning, I shouldn't be surprised, but learning that um, child care programs have been so severely cut. And, you know, all of these issues with the core funding are also labor issues, especially when we live in a place that is so unequal and we have so many hundreds of workers, thousands if you expand that beyond city workers, who, who rely on these, these things. How can you have workers when you don't have childcare and parental leave and, um, and benefits? And, you know, it's, it is, it's very difficult to think, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said that a budget is a moral document. And, you know, that's where this is. And I know that you're all trying with your best intentions to to figure something out that it clearly is a mess and it's not just the city um, that's that's responsible for this. It's, you know, made more difficult because it's, it's um, you know, other people too. But thank you for doing what you can to stick up for workers, to stick up for working people, to stick up for elderly people, to stick up for the middle class families with kids that are having mental health crises that fall through the cracks because they're not poor enough for state benefits and they're not rich enough for the most private benefits. There's just, there is, there are so many needs. Who is Santa Cruz? What, who are we and what are we building? You know, let's redistribute our wealth, our incredible wealth to care for people, to have a really caring community. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Clay Kempf. Thanks, everybody. Clay Camp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council. And I appreciate what the city's trying to do to make the best out of a bad situation. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to bring to the forefront what you want to do with these funds. Historically, they've been an effort to maintain a local safety net. And now the funding is, is moving on to be processed focused rather than results focused. And I think a process that doesn't focus on results is a flawed process. The results have to matter. So going back to the first comment, if the goal is just to be another foundation or grant source, will you fund special projects here and there? That's the path you've gone down. The historical way to make sure that the community has a long lasting and sustainable safety net needs to be revisited and talked about in depth. And I think that was one of the flaws of the past four years of the core project, which I've spoken out about many times. Um, I also just need to say aging is an equity issue and it's troublesome to see a huge amount of money taken away from programs like nursing home protection or ombudsman that go towards an equity project when that equity project does not include older adults. Uh, can you imagine, uh, just imagine that, how can you have equity that ignores a significant part of the population, except it takes away services from that population in order to fund it. So that's, uh, I think, a flaw to look at this. And, and I just really encourage everyone to look towards long-term solutions that go beyond the simple, we'll try to get funding from elsewhere. Everyone has always done that, but let's look at what exactly we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is David Bianchi. Yes. <clears> Hi, <throat> Mayor, members. The council, uh, uh, David, executive director for Family Service Agency, and you're muted. We heard you for a minute, but now you're muted. David, we lost you. I see your you arm now. Yes, let's start can, over. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Now you're good. Yes. Go ahead. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, 
again, I appreciate the adjustments that were made, uh, the bridge and transition funding and looking for new resources. Um, you know, my agency has been downtown the last 35 years. I think relationship building here is important so that you understand the programs and not just look at reports. Um, I'm grateful our suicide prevention program was refunded with the adjustments, but we have lost funding for five programs providing unique services that were put together as a result of the merger of four small agencies with us um, so that we could provide them in a more efficient and cost effective franchising those over 400 clients supporting children in counseling and women fighting cancer and survivors of child sexual abuse and care facility residents advanced programs we worked hard to integrate and share common mental health objectives and outcomes. I am concerned now, I have a new concern that what I heard this morning about transition funded funding said organ or not proposals. A number of my programs were under $25,000 in the last core cycle and I feel like I'm about to get penalized again uh, listening to it defined as programs. So I finally put them together in a proposal which I don't think the panel properly processed or understood. And now I feel like I'm about to lose transition funding based upon some of those being separate proposals last time, which Your time got is less up. than 25,000. So, so I understood the motion. Thank you. Our next caller is phone number ending in 1705. Hi there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi. Uh, um, thanks. Uh, I appreciate the difficulty that council and the supervisors face in making these decisions for all these worthy uh, nonprofits and community organizations. But um, I think the city has been missing a really core function. We really don't have a public swimming pool. And what we're talking about limited public funds. I would really like council to um, figure out how to either get Harvey West going full time or enter into an agreement with a Santa Cruz high school, which we, we paid for that swimming pool through a special uh, bond, we're still paying. And while all these social service programs, these non-governmental programs are, I mean, most of them are probably great. I really think um, that our limited funds need to also be serving the general populace. And I think that's some of what maybe made, um, looks like measure F is failing. And I think that is a reflection on people being dissatisfied. The average person also needs to be served by its, its local municipal government. And so I recognize this might be an impolitic time to make this comment since you're talking about cutting funds for these um, non-governmental nonprofits, but you really also need to look at the you know, sort of some basic needs of the majority of the uh, the city. So uh, I, w I would know that this has been kind of in the winds getting a pullback, but, um, you know, we had it for a little bit when the county was running it. And uh, I really hope you can uh, do whatever you need to uh, make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. That's okay. Our next member of the public is Jasmine Mia or Maya. Hello, um, this is Jasmine. Um, I am a therapist in the community, a licensed marriage family therapist, and I've worked at um, Family Service Agency. And I was just shocked to see that they weren't recommended for funding and um, kind of just this whole discussion about the, they're not, you know, basically like it's being posed as if there's not enough to go around and taking some from ones that were awarded and then this extra money like that's you know something and i think that's good but i want to echo what um reggie said in his uh comment that i think this is a you know a problem that doesn't have to be a problem because if we look at broader sources in general of kind of reallocation of funds and how to get funding for these crucial social services i think there are ways to to change up the city budget like you know the police as um was stated you know, get so much of a budget that goes towards calls for, you know, um, serve basically for responses to unhoused issues, which 
are more of a service oriented thing. Like a lot of the people who need services, if they were to have these kind of like FSA or these community um, organizations would not be in a position where then the police are being called, where then they need that police budget. So I think some of it's looking broader scale and being able to rebalance that budget of, um, well, if we take it out of that, there'll be less, with services, there's gonna be less crimes of poverty, crimes of necessity. And so, um, so I just think that's where you have to start is kind of services first. And these agencies, you know, are, are just part of the heart and soul of Santa Cruz and are just super important for so many people. Um, and there's just, there's no reason they should be not getting the funding they need. Um, I think we're lucky to have a lot of these uh, organizations and I want to continue to see them thrive and help people who are underserved or marginalized communities. Um, and so, yeah, so I just encourage you to look broader and not just like this dollar amount in this one category, but look across the board and figure out ways to rebalance and reallocate money um, from other parts of the budget, like the police. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Rose Klein. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself or choose the unmute option on the webinar features of your computer. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Rose Klein. I am a um, graduate student and an organizer um, with the Graduate Student Union at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, I just want to um, echo some of the comments that have been made recently. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we cut the police budget if we are going to be investing in a lot of these uh, fantastic programs and these nonprofits. Um, we've been talking about how to uh, build a better process, and you've been talking about how to build a better process for uh, funding these programs. And I think that's really admirable to think about the process for funding these nonprofits. Um, at the same time, yes, there are funds out there. You know, 40% of the city's budget, approximately, is sent to the police. And um, I was just the other day at an event where someone got hurt. And the police were just standing there and doing nothing um, the pretty much the entire time that someone was actively in a confrontation. Um, and it was the members of the community who ended up actually doing things to make that situation better. Um, so, you know, what is the job of the police uh, in this city? Literally, what is their job? They are getting paid to do very little. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, is, you know, we, we spend so much of our budget on them. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, that money could be going to, uh, I think, much better sources um, is, is what I'm saying um, to these nonprofits, to these uh, systems that support the people in the city um, in ways that will actually help our community, um, in ways that will actually um, build us up uh, as opposed to uh, you know breaking us apart. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Are there any other members of the public in the virtual world that would like to comment on item, agenda item number 40, the core final award recommendations? I see uh, the name, I am watching you. Yeah, I spoke to this last time pretty thoroughly, so I, I don't have too much to add, but I, I'm going to repeat uh, that I still think your priorities uh, should respect the jurisdictional funding, like who pays and uh, uh, and where the you know benefits should go. And uh, I, I, there's really no good reason to fund any nonprofits that operate countywide, statewide, or national unless they do a majority of their work here in this city. Uh, and you could, you know, your process of just going along with whatever the county says, I, you know, they have responsibility, they have their jurisdictional responsibility to the county, and I get it that they can, would fund, you know, countywide nonprofits. But, uh, you know, your mission is different. And uh, I don't know why you can't prioritize uh, nonprofits that operate mostly in this city if they're valuable, they perform, and it's what the people want here. And then if there's any money left, I mean, then I guess you could consider widening that circle. But I don't see just, you know, going along with the county and 
Yeah, so that, that's all I have to say. Bye. Thank you for your input. We have members here in the chambers. Did it either anybody want to speak to item 40? Just making sure. No. Okay. It looks like that concludes public comment. At this time, I will bring it out to council. Uh, council member Myers. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to everyone who called in. Um, I also want to say thank you to um, Randy Morris and also Kimberly um, Peterson, um, who have obviously done a, a tremendous amount of work. Um, you know, this I, I, I do a lot of work in Monterey County, and I, I don't think there's a county in California that probably doesn't have a similar conversation at some point during their budget hearings. Um, Unfortunately, because um, on, in so many ways, it is becoming more and more difficult for people to be, um, you know, to be in California, to find safe housing, to find adequate childcare, um, to have a good wage. And, um, and uh, you know, as a, as a small local city government, a, a city of 64,000, um, you know, the money that we have been able to bring into our budget year after year is substantial. Um, and um, we continue to make that commitment, um, you know, years and years and years over the decades. And um, I really appreciate the way that the county and the city, uh, I have just, been privy to this a little bit over the last three years on the council as a council member, but really, really watching how, um, you know, the program is starting to be um, morphed and designed for impact. Um, I think we've learned that there's also critical service aspects to, um, you know, what so many of our nonprofits provide. Um, as a former nonprofit executive director, I sat in people's shoes and watched my funding disappear as well. So um, nonprofits are the piece of our community that um, oftentimes are the lowest paid, no benefits, no unions, um, uh, no overtime. Um, these really are the groups that um, tend to take care of the majority of the people in our community that need, need the most assistance. Um, and that goes um, everywhere from the seniors down to the toddlers. And we can see that in our lists. Um, and we see a, a very compassionate group of, um, of service providers. And um, I do wish that we, we would have more um, to, to provide. And I wish we will we'll have more in the future. Um, we've, we've tried with, with some investment, um, you know, attempts this, this past election, yeah, it doesn't look like, look like we'll get there, but those are the kinds of things that help cities, um, provide impact back into the community community and, and provide support into the community. So, um, I really appreciate the callers. Um, and I do know that the County has, um, uh, you know, done some, a little bit of morphing today. And I, I know we're all trying to catch up. Um, so I'm going to make a motion just so that we can get um, rolling on trying to put together um, the recommendations. So um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion uh, pretty much reflecting uh, the staff recommendation number one, um, which I believe fits with um, the uh, work that was completed by the county today, which is to maximize the use of all available core funds to fund additional proposals across the medium and large tiers in ranked order of scores. Um, and then and then that's specifically recommending funding that the next highest large tier application as well as the next four high medium tier applications um, would be supported. And those would include the large tier uh, agency of the senior network services, um, eight specific to the aging and community program, the medium tier um, service providers, big brothers, big sisters of Santa Cruz County, family service agency of the Central Coast, and that would be specific to the suicide prevention service of the Central Coast, um, Santa Cruz Community Ventures, the ALAS program, and then the Santa Cruz Lesbian Gay and Community Center, otherwise known as the Diversity Center, um, and that would be for their health and well being initiative to provide mental health counseling and referrals. 
to LGBTQ plus um, community youth and Latinx populations. Um, I'll go ahead and make that motion uh, as a starting place, and um, that way, um, Mayor, we can we can start from there if that's appropriate. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. You. Thank you. We have a motion by Council Member Myers on uh, the staff recommended motion, and uh, I'm looking for a second. Vice Mayor Watkins, you had your hand up. Sure. Yeah, I have a second and I'll second the motion and I, I have a friendly amendment and a few comments if that's okay. At this Great, time also. thank you. And okay, then I'll ask you. city clerk to pull up the motion. No? No, I didn't get it. Okay, we're gonna repeat it after we the friendly amendment. I think we have the agendized recommendation and then the recommendation. Okay, we'll need on. clarification on the motion, but let's go ahead and hear from Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay. Or did you want the clarification prior to my comments? Council member Myers. Yeah, uh, staff I recommendation look to staff, um, in our agenda packet or what was presented by Randy Morris. Uh, I would, I, I, could staff speak to, I'm sorry, I have to admit, I, I was trying to track, but Maybe staff can confirm whether our motion is is tracking or what we need potentially to change. I believe the motion as it stands in the gender report um, should be congruent with what you just read off because the agenda report list of recommended awards includes at the end of the different categories, the green rows, which are the ones that you read off in detail. So the motion in the staff report says you're basically approving the recommended awards as it's listed in that attachment. And the attachment includes the items that you read off, I believe. Randy? Yeah, and if I can just, going back to the complexity of this, just to extrapolate from what Laura said and from a budget perspective, that would mean that your $1,080,000 that you passed in your budget on the 14th, that would then per the MOU move to merge with the county's budget that was just passed this morning, put together, that money would then fund the slate of recommended awards, including these additional five. So that would stand alone if you go ahead with this and vote for it, period. Then there's a discussion about the 500,000 and coming back to look for new funds, et cetera. So that's how it kind of played out this morning. And that was what was passed this morning. Okay. I'll let uh, council member Watkins um, continue then. So, you know, she's been tracking on amendments potentially. Yeah. Well, when, um, sorry, always on cue, I think my dog comes in and starts barking. I apologize. Um, well, let me just first start by saying how I appreciate I appreciate the staff work. I appreciate the folks who called in and more importantly, just the everyday work that they do for our community and our, just our safety net services. Um, this is not easy. It's hard every time. It was hard when we first did it. I wasn't part of the council when there was um, just a different type of process. So I also really understand and agree with the direction of, of and the theory behind CORE um, and um, understand that there's, challenges associated with that and things that we can do to learn from it and improve upon. Um, and I appreciate your interest in reaching out to the council members and others to learn right away while it's fresh so that we can really take that into account moving forward. Um, I agree with this, this, this proposal at this time. I, I also just have a few comments before and I have additional amendment, but one is in terms of, you know, particularly, a, a, sector near and dear to my heart, which is childcare. And I think it's in a really, it's a, it is an integral part of our society's infrastructure and care infrastructure. And so it's, it's really um, challenging to, to see it not be funded. We basically nationally, to be quite honest with you for, for decades um, in a way that it deserves. And I think what happens is now we, we see child cares and families and cobbling together funding and, um, we're really just not investing in our workers. We're not investing in parents and we're not supporting women generally. But that being said, um, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do as I've been on council is look at ways that we as the local city council can support childcare uniquely 
and that we have our child care developer impact fee, one thing that we passed most recently. Um, and the mixed use library project, for example, has in it a proposed design for a child care facility, looking at other ways we can support child care, but also really thanking the community for voting on our dedicated children's fund to really support our youth and to be the set aside uniquely for that population. So in advance of this meeting, I had an opportunity to talk to um, our first five director about our process and how we've um, overseen those dollars. That will be changing most likely. No, it will be changing because after the voters voted it into um, into our, our policies, it, it encompasses now advisory body. But that being said, absent that being the process that we have in place, he was very open to having conversations with the city about how to support some of these child care facilities, understanding how to access the dollars, which is in the form of early learning scholarship, which really speaks to what I heard one of the um, members of the community speak to, which is that bridge funding for um, kind of an equity scaling system for subsidy based on uh, people who don't necessarily qualify for state subsidy, but are working really hard and um, are just above that threshold who could potentially get some of that scholarship dollars to help with their um, offset the cost. So my um, all that to say, you know, that's one component of, I know, a broader network of a lot of multiple supports that are happening from, you know, early years of life to the end of years of life. And, um, and, and so one suggestion or one addition that I'd like to add as a friendly amendment is to direct our staff to work with First Five on how to support child care providers in Santa Cruz City and or those Santa Cruz City, serving Santa Cruz City families and or workers, accessing the early learning scholarship program funded through the Children's Fund. So that's my friendly um, amendment. All right. Can you repeat yeah, can that? Can you repeat that really quick? That. A little slower. <laughs> I'll go slower. And I, I do accept that amendment. Sure, no problem. Sorry, Bonnie, I will repeat that. So to direct staff to, uh, to work with First Five, on how to support child care providers in Santa Cruz City and or serving Santa Cruz City families and or workers in accessing the early learning scholarship program funded through the Children's Fund. And I can do it too, Bonnie, if that's helpful. It would be, thank you. And thank you uh, for accepting that, Councilmember Myers. And I know it's just one bit of, I think, a bigger conversation, but I think, um, you know, we are losing our workers, we're losing our families, and having childcare available is a way to balance the um, cost of living here in this community. So thank you. Bonnie, I'll send that to you right now. And you didn't want to uh, mention first five directly in that? I did. I'm going to send it to Bonnie. It's uh, okay. Got it. direct, direct okay. acceptable with first five. Yeah. Okay. And Laura, I'm seeing that is there three, two additional amendments that we should be looking at? Um, sorry, I'm not tracking um, those. I see a number two and a number three, but I see Randy has this question up too. His hand. I, th I think. Depending on how council wishes to proceed, if you wanted to disposition the recommended award and vote on this and then move on in a second conversation related to the bridge slash transition funding, That's that nice. could be how you could approach it. And then Randy, did you have something else to add? Yeah, and just in case this is relevant, there was a paragraph in the staff report that is not linked to the item where the friendly amendment was added, but hasn't been discussed now. So I wanted to share this because whatever, wherever the direction lands probably doesn't matter, but I'm just trying to organize the buckets of activity. <laughs> we already propose that the County Health and Human Service Agency work with other jurisdictions. We didn't say the name, but we included first five in our thinking, so you know, to immediately after this, go work with all of us to find ways to see if there are other revenue streams to try to help support sort of backfill. So I just wanted to share that's already conceptually in the report. And I share that because whether you drop that in this, which is about how to fund and close the core RFP, or you drop it in what you direct staff to report back on as part of our activity, it's gonna happen. 
So I just wanted to share that, that in at least in our activities this morning, those sort of things got put into a different recommend action, which is how we report back in, in direction for what to do between now and then. So I just wanted to share that case that impacts where you want to drop that additional direction. I appreciate that. And I'm not really attached to where that additional direction lands as long as it occurs, right? So, and it's really um, encouraging to hear that the county has been thinking about that and that's something that you're going to actively be working on, particularly with some of these organizations that I think can really help be, um, can have a lifeline to some of these other initiatives. And just, you know, moving forward, really, um, you know, in terms of the Children's Fund uniquely, I just, you know, that is a, a that is there for supporting kids that are, you know, supporting early learning, and that's there to support prevention and it's equity centered. And I just, I'm, I'm really proud of our community and I'm really proud of this council and this and the voters here for putting that in place because for years to come beyond my term on council, um, I hope that resource will always go to those, it will always go to those purposes because the voters voted that in. So anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but yeah, thanks Randy. Thank you for bringing that friendly amendment up. So we have a motion by council member Myers on a staff recommendation in the agenda packet number one, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. Is that correct? That's correct. And there's a friendly amendment by Vice Mayor Watkins. And let's see, I do see uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, you have your hand raised, and Council Member Brown. So we'll have discussion on the motion and then we can move on. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a few comments. Um, I also wanna thank those who called in today, in particular, um, nonprofit providers who are doing the really hard work and as a grant writer in this community and someone who's worked with nonprofits pretty extensively uh, for the last couple of decades, I, I have been on the other side. Um, I was a grant writer for the last set of core funding and I share um, very intimately the frustrations that, that um, our local nonprofits are going through. Um, I've been talking in the last several weeks since the June 7th meeting to some of the nonprofits who have been impacted, both in that they were recommended for funding or they weren't recommended for funding and they had received funding in the past. And, and so I have um, pages and pages of notes for you, Randy, and for whoever else I will be speaking to in terms of what we can do differently. A um, couple of things that I just want to um, bring forward here is just that what I heard uh, multiple times is that even though we tried to simplify the application process, it was very difficult to navigate. And in particular, difficult to navigate for those smaller organizations who aren't, um, don't have the capacity and the resources to hire someone as a grant writer um, to help them you know, figure out the language and how to compare the RFP to what they wanna say. Um, the scoring rubric was really challenging. And I think we can do more there in terms of um, expanding the parameters of the scoring rubric and um, looking at the scoring rubric differently in terms of the different uh, group sizes of organization and communicating the scoring rubric and criteria to uh, interested applicants ahead of time. Um, and then the timing of the funding is something else that we can pay attention to as well. I know that there was community foundation had deadlines at the same time. So those are just a, a few things that I wanted to bring forward here. Um, I do wanna share that the other piece that, that we county, city, all of us can do uh, differently is to work really closely and directly with our local nonprofits on sustainability and looking at other sources of funding um, just here in our community, I just I named Community Foundation, um, Small Pockets Dignity Health, uh, Community Health Trust of the Pajaro Valley, Monterey Peninsula Foundation. So there are a number of other resources here in our region that could be a fit. And I think if we can make that part of the, um, the core program uh, workshops that we have, that would be that would be, I think, beneficial to everyone. And then aside from that, 
um, helping nonprofits navigate the state funding that we have available. The state has a surplus, a huge surplus right now, and they will be allocating funds towards some of these very essential services that we have all discussed, mental health being one. So again, just the role that the city and county can have through the core process and helping our local nonprofits navigate the other resources that um, could be available is something that we can do um, uh, in the future. And so with that said, I know, I know that this is very difficult. And as I said, I've talked to a lot of the organizations out there and we'll continue to have the conversations, but I would be in support of moving um, with this first motion that's put forward. And, um, and given that our funds are braided, um, I, think, I think it would get really difficult and tricky if we went line by line, score by score, um, I understand the thinking behind this, that we went to the next tiers in terms of how the scoring landed. And we've already said there's work to be done there, but I would be in support of this motion with a friendly amendment to um, really focus on childcare. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Um, okay, so um, actually, can I, I have a couple of questions that I'm just trying to figure out, so can you go to Council Member Cummings first? Thanks. <laughs> Council Member Cummings. I just had a couple of questions. I was just wondering um, in terms of what, because I was taking some notes earlier and I'm trying to see if they're aligned with what is occurring right now because um, I'm trying to understand how this aligns with the county's decisions on um, what to fund I know we saw some recommendations earlier during the uh, county staff presentation. So I'm just, I'm just also wondering how these align since actions were taken today that might not have been exactly with what was put in our agenda packet. And so I'd just like to better understand how these are lining up currently. So my under, my understanding, thank you, council member Cummings. My understanding from what the county board of supervisors passed they adopted their budget as it relates to the total five plus million dollars, including our 1.008. Um, our budget was adopted during the budget process. And what this action would do is disposition that little bit over $1 million for the city and disposition it to awardees as listed in attachment one, the list of recommended awards in addition to the friendly amendment that was just um, added to it. So if council were to disposition that, you would be in alignment with what the county approved. The change that the county made, if you disposition in a second conversation, the bridge funding for transition, the change that they made this morning in real time at the Board of Supervisors meeting relates to bridge funding and transition funding. So, um, so that would be the United Way of Santa Cruz County, <clears throat> Cradle to Career, um, Community Bridges, Meals on Wheels, Santa Cruz County, Dientes Community Dental Care, Semillitas from Santa Cruz Community Ventures, Second Harvest Food Bank, Santa Cruz County, and then we'd be adding the aging and community, is that correct? And then, um, Big Brother, Big Sister, Santa Cruz County, Suicide Prevention Services from Family Services Agency, ALAS, and the Diversity Center's Health and Wellbeing Initiative. So that's, those are the, that's what's before us right now. The uh, council member coming. Bonnie, if, if Bonnie, if you can bring back up yeah. your. It's a much larger motion. list it's, at it's the in full there. slate. Laura, if it's more appropriate, we can keep the motion in one in one grouping. That might be easier. I'm happy to continue to to, to um, make the full motion if necessary. Is your question answered, Council Member Cummings? The five additional uh, you listed the awardees plus those five additionals that you That's, listed. Yeah, off. I was so, I was just trying to get the clarification. Yeah. On that. So yeah. Count Council Friday. Member Cummings, I just want to clarify because the list you read is a small subset 
of the entire package of recommended awards that include your one million and eighty thousand dollars. These five that are I'm seeing up on the screen are the newly recommended from the slate proposed to the county and the city on June seventh. But the full list is available in that attachment, um, and it's much larger than the list you just read. Right, and, and the reason why I brought that question up is because I'm trying to understand which ones have been funded, what are the new recommendations, and what is not being funded. Because um, if we're gonna move into a conversation about where we wanna see additional funds allocated, it helps to know which ones are funded, which ones are not gonna be funded. And I think it's also very transparent for this process because this has been obviously a very, you know, with decisions getting made and then those decisions coming to council not being before the public, trying to make sure that we're as transparent as possible with how this money's getting spent is something I'm trying to strive for and being able to visualize and see what we're deciding on is what I'm trying to do right now because I don't even know 100% exactly what we're deciding on, which is why I'm just trying to see if we can get a list in some way to see what we're spending our money on, how much is being allocated because this is just a list of names of organizations. The people who are watching don't even know how much money we're allocating towards each of these organizations. So my intent right now is to just be transparent because I'd like to support this, but I really just want to know if there's something missing, you know, would that be something we want to include or if it's already included in this larger list? Laura, I'm losing track of what attachments were June 7th and June uh, today, but we had a list, I think it's attachment three or three A that listed the agencies that are currently funded but not recommended for award. I don't think it's this one. So, think, yeah. No, but the motion right now that council member Myers put forward is related to this list. So it's the recommended awards. So what she put forth is an idea for the council to vote upon approving this list, which adds up to the city's 1.0 080 million commitment to the new core model. And the items that she listed out specifically are the green items that have been added since June the 7th, but were in the June the 28th packet from the beginning. So that is, that is what is on the floor right now. The rest of the conversation and the questions coming from various council members relate to what is not on the recommended list and would be part of the conversation of how the council wishes to help other agencies underneath the transition slash bridge funding. And that would be like the next recommendation in the agenda report, which is not one that council member Myers had put forward yet. Which is my understood my understanding, Laura is number two on the recommended motion in the staff report, correct? Correct. But that's where the county did something a little bit different at the Board of Supervisors meeting. And I think the conversation is going to be quite involved. So you could either try to combine them or disposition this that's out on the floor for conversation right now. Right. That and that's why I did not uh take on number two uh, with this one. It did seem like things were changed a little different. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Did you have any further questions? I guess the, the next question I have is um, if we're gonna go through these recommendations one by one or if we're gonna go through them all at the same time because it's a little confusing, but. Uh, well, currently there is a motion for number one and so we can, um, after we discuss and decide on number one, we can decide on the following recommendations. Um, and I do see uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I just wanted to point out that, that these are listed in our agenda packet. They're um, trying to pull uh, what's online, but it's, it's where, so the, the list of the additional recommended agencies and their dollar amounts are in our agenda packet. On um, I don't have the page in front of me, but but they're in there. Thank you. And council it's member the first Brown? attachment for this report. But beyond the attachment, it's in the it's in the agenda report as well. It's uh, on page forty point four. Thank you. 
Yeah, so it's all in there. Uh, are you ready, Council Member Brown, or do you want me to go to the next? Well, now, now I want to ask the question because I thought I knew what what we were <laughs> talking about. But so it's on page forty point four or whatever in your books. It's attachment three. I just read it online. That includes programs that may have gotten bridge funding cut, right? So, but we're not, but we're not talking about that until item two. Am I getting that correct? Bridge funding, correct. Bridge funding, we're going to have to go, go back to go with for another shot. Okay, got it. Okay. I, I do have some comments that. On, on this motion that's on the floor? Um, yeah. I think, it, I, I think I'd like to make them now. Um, okay. So I, I'm having a hard time supporting this um, because I am concerned about the kind of, I, I guess I'm thinking about the, some, some of the things that I heard said um, by members of the public about the, um, the fact that <laughs> this is not inevitable, I guess. Um, um, this isn't just the way it is, and you know we have to do this. Um, we have the ability to make a different choice, and I think that choice should include additional funding for community programs. Um, I don't think right now is the moment to talk about each one of those. I will make comments later, um, but I'll just say that it's it's very difficult for me to support um, moving forward in this way without. Um, Talking about the realities of, you know, the consequences for these programs, um, but I'll, I guess, to be continued for additional motions to come. Okay. Are you able to pull the motion up? Yeah. And may we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Councilmember Golder is currently absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That I'm motion aye for passes. the record. Bonnie, I don't know if you can hear me now. Oh, great. That is okay. Sorry. Council Member Golder, that's an aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, and now we have the item of bridge funding. There was um, a recommendation to approve three months of transition funding for all core programs that applied for and were not recommended for funding. Um, <coughs> there were some dollar amounts that were uh, approved by the County Board of Supervisors this morning, 500,000 was uh, additional funding, unexpected funding that was uh, applied to this purpose. And um, we also have two other recommendations. Directing staff to return with the County Human Services Department with a report of all agreements executed, as well as any agreements with a revised dollar amount or where negotiations exceeded the September 30th, 2022 deadline. And the last recommendation is to direct staff to return with County HSD, which is Human Services Department, by the way, when I use that acronym, 
with County HSD on or before December 13th, 2022 with an update on the three month transition funding. The newly established contracts and performance tracking mechanisms, efforts to explore other funding sources for current core funded agencies not being recommended for award and progress on the lessons learned review of the request for proposal, the RFP process. So council member. Mayor, Mayor Brunner. Yes. So before you all start on this, my apologies, but number three related to the September 30th, you do not need to disposition. That will be incorporated. If there are any issues with the contracts, we will incorporate that in item number four. So if you'll recall in the PowerPoint, we had struck that one out. So please consider what you read off as number two and number four. Okay. It's just something we tried to consolidate between the version with the county. Thank you. Great, is that clear for everybody? Wonderful, council member Cummings. Yeah, so I have a, um, there's a, a number of motions I think that we're gonna be getting into, but um, something that came up at the last meeting that we haven't addressed is the fact that the council took no action on harm reduction coalition and they were recommended. And so I'm gonna make a motion right now that we fund the harm reduction coalition at the full amount recommended in their initial proposal. Second. Okay, we have a motion to fund harm reduction program uh, by council member Cummings and seconded by council member Brown. Uh, Randy Morris. I just wanted to make a technical clarification. Um, in the June 7th awards, all um, recommended awards that were made public for the June 7th hearings, county first, city second, every program, but for the seven that did not propose to serve the city of Santa Cruz had dollar amounts listed. That was the county share and the city share. And I think the formula was the city share is something like 21%. So I just want to technically make sure, uh, Council Member Cummings, when you say at the full recommended application amount, the county board passed 5-0 to eliminate the county share, which is about 79%. So I just want to make sure everyone's aware, and that is your jurisdictional decision, um, that the full application amount was split that kind of, you know, 79-21 basically, just to make sure everyone understands that. Yeah, I'm just speaking on behalf of the city's contribution that was listed in that report. Thank you for that clarification. So council member Cummings uh, motion is recommending not cutting the 21 to fully fund the 21%, the city's share of harm reduction in the core process. And if I can just comment on that, um, you know, we initially at that meeting, people spoke to process on how people were, how these organizations were receiving funding. I think that, um, and then after speaking to process, there was a, a motion to deviate from that process. Um, under the um, under the notion that Harm Reduction Coalition had violated some policy at the county, but no policy had ever been described and nothing had ever been explained about what they had done. And um, they had been um, approved by through this process and um, although we're gonna be making some changes, I also believe that um, they have an evidence-based approach of how to provide services to our community. They went through the process just like every other organization and were approved, and I believe that we should um, support them as well and allow them to demonstrate their ability, whether it's, and I believe that that group has an opportunity to demonstrate to the community um, how they can provide services and based on the outcomes of those services, we can determine future funding. But they went through the same process as everyone else and it's only fair that we also um, support their efforts. Uh, let's see, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, just a couple of points I'd like to make about the Harm Reduction Coalition and my support for um, 
restoring the recommendation for the city's portion of their funding. Um, this is an evidence-based, data-driven program, um, widely seen as having, using best practices. Um, they have received um, what I would consider to be a strong show of support from federal and state agencies in that they have received significant funding. They scored very highly. The decision to cut their funding was, from my perspective, entirely political um, and ideological and um, unfortunately personal as well. Um, it's been really ugly, the things that I hear people say about the Harm Reduction Coalition locally and the work that they, not the work they do, but the individuals. It's just been shocking to me. Um, so this is a political decision. If the majority of the council wants to make that political decision, it's not my politics. It's not a decision that I'm willing to agree to. Um, I think they deserve funding. I think they deserve to receive um, local funding. I believe they do uh, tremendous service for our community. And um, those who don't, I think, are, have their blinders on um, and are just can't look beyond their politics here. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for, for this one. Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, what I, my understanding is that, you know, the board did, um, and I, I'm not in the weeds with the, at the board level, but is that they didn't find that their policies were in conformance with board direction um, and have yet to establish certain policies that they had um, already requested of their agency. So it's not about the work that they're doing, for me at least, it's about um, the, the ability to work with the government agency that's um, in partnership with them until that's, uh, you know, until that's repaired, then I, I personally don't feel comfortable funding them at this time. Um, so that's sort of my, that's sort of my uh, opinion on this at this time. Uh, Randy Morris. I just want to um, clarify, because I am, I don't have any history on this program. I don't know them. I, I feel myself apolitical on this, but I clearly know this is a lightning rod issue for my colleagues at Health and the County Board. And now I'm sort of in the middle of it because it's a core funded agency. So I just want to start with, I feel, I feel like I'm in a benign place just observing the energy. I want to confirm that as council member coming said something about violating board policy, I want to own that I said that. And what I was messaging was two comments that anybody can go watch at the board archive on June 7th. Supervisor McPherson meant, mentioned something about board policy, and then Supervisor Coonerty mentioned something about, not about board policy, but duplicate services, because health already has a program. I don't remember if it landed on which was what. I own that I only mentioned the verbal comment that McPherson made, but it didn't recognize another policy comment. I don't know if that's relevant, but I just want to say it was not as narrow as I own I message because I only shared one particular message from one board member. So whatever it was, whatever it was, the end result is the board did vote five to zero after McPherson's comment, Supervisor Coonery's comment, then they had a vote. So I just wanted to clarify that because I feel like I was part of this, not knowing what I was stepping into when I shared one part of a, a board comment. Um, and my question, um, is, is there any data that supports their their decisions to buy I don't know this either process. way. I just know it wasn't discussed in the public meeting that I was, you know, staff presenting on. So I don't know. That would be a healthcare, my colleagues in healthcare. I don't have the answer I, myself. Thank you. Council Member Brown, did you have a, another? No. Okay. We um, have a one motion. Uh, and if there's no further comments or discussion, we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, Mayor, I'm not sure we don't have our interim finance director on. If you would need to direct staff to find funding because it's approximately $30,000 and it is not appropriated. That would be the 21% city share, approximately. The, yes, the exact amount was 
$29,956.72. Council Member Cummings, is there any additional direction you'd like to make regarding funding? No, and I imagine, and I, I would, I guess one comment I would make is that, you know, part of the recommendation at the previous meeting to have our budget coincide with this meeting is because we're going to be making a, a number of, of, of recommendations today on funding from our budget to help support these programs. And so, you know, although we've approved our budget, you know, there was an effort to try to have this meeting coincide with our budget so that we can make these um, recommendations in conjunction with the decisions on our budget process. So just want to make sure that that's also clear for the community. Um, that wasn't, that was, you know, voted down. And so here we are today. And I imagine that we're going to have staff coming back to us with um, more recommendations in the future for a, a number of items that we'll be making decisions on um, after we um, vote on this item. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Golder? No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Brunner? No. I think we uh, have allotted the 1080 as a total package. And um, as the previous motion, uh, we have, we're moving forward with this process to support these programs. So thank you. Our next, uh, uh, Item is uh, item recommended item number two and four on our agenda packet. And um, I'm looking for a motion and discussion from our um, council member, council member Kalantari Johnson. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would like to make a motion to, um, I gotta pull it up. Sorry, I had it and then it moved to move the motion number two, um, which is to approve three months of transition funding for all for all fiscal year 2022 core programs that applied for and were not recommended for funding in fiscal year 2023. So that according to the MOU and amended for this direction, the county can pay the full three month transition contract award amounts prior to the agreement being finalized. And I'm not, I'm choosing not to include um, exclusion of the organizations that the city would contribute to that were funded for under 25,000. Um, I think that uh, it's really difficult for small nonprofits and it's difficult for these small programs that have small budgets. And um, even if it's just a few thousand dollars, I would like us to support them um, with these bridge fundings. Uh Vice Mayor Watkins, are, are you seconding? I am seconding, and I agree with that um, addition and proposal. Okay, uh, Council Member Cummings. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think that would be really important is that we're helping to, oh, actually, I have a question before I make my motion. There were a number of uh, agencies that were mentioned earlier, like Advocacy Inc., um, CASA. Were those included in the full funding amount um, from what the county, when the county made its decision earlier? I was trying to highlight things as we were going through the county's presentation earlier, and since this isn't in our agenda packet, I just want to double check on that with the county staff. I think there were um, the Stroke Center as well, Families in Transition, Community bridges. So I was. I just want to double check on on. Um, Council Member Cummings, are you asking specific to the three month bridge funding? Which agencies did the county vote to approve three months of bridge funding? 
Yeah, or if, um, or if some of these organizations were included in the um, earlier funding. Okay, so the, the, the motion you just passed unanimously to approve the additional five grants with the ones brought forward on the 7th, that list of people who are funded, and I know just given two names, you said Advocacy and Concasa, they, their grant applications were not ranked high enough to be in the slate of recommended awards. So then that moves to the what I kept call bucket B, which is we have staff had proposed to the board this morning to fund every agency, including Advocacy Inc. and CASA that had been funded today that was not recommended for award with a three month bridge. So that was what was in front of the board this morning. What got nuanced is then that in the moment, additional direction to take those funded at 25,000 lower out. And so that's the part that passed this morning. Um, I'm gonna ask Kimberly, who probably has the list in front of her, if you need to have specificity, but I believe Advocacy Inc. Kimberly is in the group, because I know Advocacy Inc. was at the board and said thank you. And I don't know about CASA, but Kimberly could probably answer the specific questions about which ones were in and because of that board direction, which are below the 25. Kimberly, do you have that? So, so the, yes, I have, I have um, I can answer based on what I have at the moment. So Advocacy Inc. definitely, yes, is um, included in the full three month transition funding. It, um, they were receiving more than $25,000 um, previously. And um, the other one you mentioned, uh, CASA, they also, they had a couple of programs and um, at least one was, uh, would still be included in the bridge funding. And then and I guess. I, oh, I was just gonna acknowledge that earlier when we, we pulled the information for those that would be excluded, it was it was a quick pull. We'll definitely be going back and listening closely to, you know, to make sure that we've got our list act correct. So please go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, so, I mean, for example, um, Community Bridges, there's the Family Resource Center, there's a number of Community Bridges programs. And, I, and I'm wondering, because this is, it sounded like there are certain, that there was a recommendation, what I'm hearing is that there was a recommendation by county staff to fund organizations uh, that were above 25,000. And is that for, that 25,000, uh, that threshold was the county contribution. And then I guess the second follow-up question to that is, was that to fund them for a full year or f to fully fund them moving forward? I can break that down into moving parts. First, the staff recommendation that mirrors the recommendation in front of you as written before the board deliberated this morning was every agency. We didn't propose to staff any threshold above or below anything. Every agency currently funded who did not get recommended for award. And then to your second parts, council member Cummings, for three full months. And that's what we backed into when we identified um, 500,000 uh, city county share to be determined. What's getting complicated, and I do wanna use the moment to share with you what happened at the board this morning. We could not say to the board with specificity exactly every agency. So we said, please give us clear direction so we can follow the clear direction given your vote to to add this under 25 and over 25. So we have policy direction and we are still doing the analysis. So I think it's complicated because we real time until and if so, and then we add for back to what I think is your last question, council member Cummings, having to figure out proportionate shares is I think something where there's probably some toggle room between city and county staff, depending on how much money, which is between you know your city staff and you all, and our money that we're gonna have to execute after the policy direction we get to take it. I just don't anticipate being able to get exact because it's just the math's complicated. Final comment, for example, when you say some of these agencies, some of them have multiple programs and some of them have small grants at 10,000 and then they have two that are at you know, 100,000. So you know, trying to do the math to figure out what their bridge funding is part of the work we have to do next and we just couldn't in the fly figure it out with that new direction this morning. Yeah, and this is this is the challenge that I'm, I'm trying to overcome with how to make this decision today because um, on some of the attachments we have, we have dollar amounts. On some of the attachments we have, we don't have dollar amounts. Uh, we've been getting you know a lot of concern from a lot of these organizations, and so it's really difficult to know who's going to get cut, who's not, who's going to get funded, um, and and so that's why I'm asking because you know it, we're trying to figure out how we can 
do the best to make some of these organizations hold, especially depending on the services they provide. Because for example, or, you know, the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center, I would like to recommend that we try to fund them at the 2021, 2022 amount for the next fiscal cycle. Um, I'd like to do that for all the, all the organizations, but we don't even know how much that would be, and it can vary very widely amongst the organizations. Um, so I just want to express that that's a challenge that, that I'm grappling with right now. So I guess amend, an amendment that I'll make to the motion is that we um, fund um, the recommended bridge organizations for the amount uh, for fiscal 2021, 2022 for fiscal year 2022, 2023. Is, um, is there a no, motion on this? It's, it's, it's a motion to amend. Yeah. Is it a friendly amendment or a subject? It's a motion to amend. And I'll second that. So I believe the next step is to vote on whether or not to accept the motion to amend. The amendment, yeah, the amendment to the main motion. And I will say that for some of these organizations, it's like, you know, Advocacy Inc. is $13,000. Um, the, let's see, CASA would be 18000 um, And we're going to have to find funding regardless, but it's, you know, I think that we should try to maximize the amount of support we can provide to these organizations, especially since they've done a lot of um, you know critical help for us during a very difficult time, and so that's I'll just leave my comments there. It's hard it's hard for us to navigate the space given that um, we don't have all the information before us, and so you know if we're gonna go blindly at this, I want to see if we can support these nonprofits to the greatest extent possible, or that we put this off until we have more information. I just want to clarify your amendment. Okay. So my understanding on the motion that's on the floor uh, is that it's regarding the bridge funding of three months of funding as a transition for to those that were not did not receive core funding awarded. So all agencies would receive three months transition funding. And Council Member Kalantari Johnson, you made, or uh, you included that the, t the organizations currently funded at 25,000 or less is not part of our motion as the it's county. Not being, it's not being cut out. Um, it's not being proposed. So ours is just all, all organizations across the board. Yeah, I, I, I'm not understanding Council Member Cummings' motion, so maybe we can see it up because I'm I'm really so not understanding. That. I mean, yeah. This is regarding the three month transition yep. um, that anyone who was not awarded would receive three months of transition funding. Anyone who was not funding. awarded, period, or anyone who is not awarded who is currently funded. Right. Anyone who was not awarded, period. So anyone who applied who was not awarded. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay. I'm confused with that. Is that the motion that? What I'm talking about the motion you made, Cal uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, my motion was to move forward basically with staff recommendation, not integrating what the Board of Supervisors had um, added to it this morning. That was my motion. That's what we're referring to. Yeah, and my amendment was that for those that reapplied, that rather than it be the three months, it's what they had been allocated in the 2021-2022 budget cycle from the city and have that uh, carry over to 2022-2023. A full year of funding. And we don't know where that's going to come from. We don't know where any of this is going to come from right now. Well, we... We do oh, we have do. A, an allocation <laughs> of a million eighty dollars. Okay. So this all falls within that, right? Can Can you clarify, uh, Laura? In the city manager, yeah. Or uh, Matt, if you have any input. So, this is all discussing within our our framework of existing allocated funds. It's in the budget. Yeah. So, if you were to award 
full years of fiscal year 22 levels for fiscal year 23. We currently don't have budget appropriation to do that. You could either have and carry on in conversation related to the appropriation of a little bit over 1 million that you just awarded and edit that, or you would have to direct staff to find the funding elsewhere from an example place such as the capital investment program or other sources. Another cut in a different service area to offset the increase in a service area that you would ask and direct us to do today. And um, city manager Huffaker. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, what we're talking about here is an expansion of the total Again, zooming out of the total allocation that the council's already approved in the fiscal 23 budget, which would, which would require that we program other dollars. Um, as Laura mentioned, the most likely candidate for that uh, would be our CIP program, which would allow us to uh, protect against impacts to staffing and programs and services. So depending upon final action by the council today, uh, we would be uh, reprogramming some of the dollars that the council has already directed towards the CIP, which will have some impact on those projects. And of course, the, the longer that bridge funding would be, the larger the financial impact. Probably goes without saying, but just wanted to make that clear. So it's both. So I think what I want to clarify before we vote on your amendment is you're recommending not a three-month funding, but a year funding? Is that what Correct. I'm understanding? Council Member Brown? Thank you, Mayor. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going <laughs> to, so, so what my understanding is, and you can all go back and look at the 21 22 funded amount for each of these programs in pick a pdf um, and you can look at all of those and see what the city gave to the core the last core round for those line by line each organization i believe what council member cummings in, intending is to say we're going to restore that funding for those programs for a year at the city level Correct. I support that. And while I have the floor, I'm going to say, we're talking about, I'm going to just, I think we should be clear about this. That's Advocacy Inc. And I do have a question about that one, um, but I'll ask it offline. Um, the uh, federally mandated program that our city, that the county is no longer going to operate if we cut this funding, um, the Stroke Center large amount of funding from community bridges, some CASA funding, families in transition. It provides rental assistance to poor families to prevent eviction. We know that eviction prevention is much more cost effective than dealing with houselessness after the fact. Um, the Mental Health Client Action Network, Planned Parenthood, Barrios Unidos, the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center, who you've heard from, and um, hearing that the Diversity Center received funding backfilled, I'll leave them off. But that's my list from what I could glean from putting all this together. That's who's going to lose funding. I want to restore what the city has previously given them for this year as a stopgap measure to reduce the pain of these cuts. All right, uh, Council Member Golder and then Council Member Myers. Uh, thank you. I appreciate everybody's um, comments that called in, and I understand what valuable services um, these nonprofits provide to members of the community and the community in general. That being said, I'm just wondering, Council Member Cummings, like, where would you propose that we pull the, mon the money from to cover this? And just after this morning's talks around, you know, negotiations in closed session, I'm, I'm really, I'm wondering 
if, while times are tough, I think that we have to think we as the city have to pay our employees. That's their only way they can get money. But uh, nonprofits have other places they could seek grant opportunities and grant awards. And while it's really disappointing and um, hard for people to hear, and I'm not saying that these services aren't valued, it's just we only have a limited pot of money unfortunately, and we have to make these difficult decisions. And so I just w wonder, like, do we have a dollar amount that this would cost, um, Laura? And if so, then Justin, where would you say we would pull this from? That's my question, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Golder. Uh, Council Member Myers. My understanding um, was, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, either county staff or city staff, but I believe the first motion we passed um, was a directive to look at, um, to get together and look over the next little bit here, you know, probably next couple months to see specifically around um, working with uh, first five. Um, I believe that was your intention, um, Council Member Watkins or Ma Vice Mayor Watkins, to look at trying to help with, for example, the um, toddler center and other child care related um, uh, cuts that. Are currently on the books, but we we're going to look for other resources. Um, is there other resources out there that, with a little bit of time, there we would be able to identify those? I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Without a number, um, it, it's hard to support going back to full funding when we've we know that we can't fully fund without cutting something else. We don't have a we don't have a revenue measure, so we don't have any funding. So I'm just curious, county staff or maybe uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, was that, I, I believe the intent of your motion uh, or your amendment was to, to explore support uh, for those back to hopefully those levels or close to those levels. Um, I'd be happy to hear from city manager or county staff or Vice Mayor Watkins, whatever, <laughs> whatever's, whoever's best. Uh, thanks for thanks for that, uh, Councilmember Myers. I'll, I'll admit we're we're wading through the mud here a bit, so I'm I'm going to try my best to try to bring us back to clarifying what we have as the main motion, as well as Councilmember Cummings' amended motion, and then what I would see happening as we move forward, depending upon whether Council moves the main motion or the amended motion. So, uh, because it's difficult to run the numbers on the fly, given the complexity of this braided funding. What I would anticipate happening based on the council's direction today is we would return to you in August with a funding plan, which would clearly delineate where we're pulling that funding from to fund whatever the Delta is. Um, the, the main motion is a shorter bridge period. So we're obviously talking about a smaller dollar amount. Even if that fell within my authority, I still think appropriate to bring it forward to the council so we can very transparently show um, what we're thinking in terms of um, where to pull that funding to make that happen. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that clear. That would be our intent based on the council's direction. Um, and th those, would, those would be general fund dollars would likely come from our CIP, but that would give us time to determine how best to accomplish that without getting into uh, the exact numbers um, today. Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Randy. Um, thank you for going first, Max. I, this is your house. Um, I just want to say back of napkin math, the three months of bridge funding, 500,000, a full year, 2 million, that means there's 1.5 million not accounted for. So that's one point. And that's just the rough. Number two, I think what Council Member Myers was getting at and the specific additional um, direction from Vice Mayor Watkins is first five. And I just wanna throw in the other variable that it's always better to find state and federal funding <laughs> to fund these important um, anchor programs than general funds. So we don't know exactly where the state budget's gonna settle and then to first five. So I think to me, that's part of the, the landscape discussion, which is, is there a way to find resources to support any of these programs of importance to the community that is not city or county general fund and then what's left how do you backfill the 1.5 million if that's what you passed ish so i just wanted to throw that in there in terms of part of process i'll just clarify really quickly also in addition to i think what randy just brought up 
specific to first five and child care funding, you know, there's so many, I think they describe it as like the spaghetti of funding streams that come into early care. Um, but uniquely, the city of Santa Cruz has a dedicated children's fund uniquely to support city residents, kids and families and providers and workers, kids and their child care needs. Um, and those who are necessarily qualifying for subsidized care, which you have to be very poor to qualify for, but have a need to get support for child care. And so it's this early learning scholarship system. And so my conversation was also in addition to what Randy, you're speaking about, about leveraging state and federal dollars, but also looking at how our children's fund that goes through first five with no overhead or administrative costs, mind you, and I, you know, kudos and thanks to them, but directly back to the providers, how that it can also be a part of the solution for organizations like the toddler, toddler center and others providing this essential service. And that's beyond core, that's beyond anything that's in perpetuity based on the voters of the city of Santa Cruz who said they want to see those dollars go to that purpose. So that's what I added. So it's it's a both and I'd say. So I, I guess, um, thank you everyone for that. Um, for that. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree that we should be trying to fund um, it fully uh, all of our organizations <clears throat> that that provide services in the city. However, um, we do not have a revenue source. Unfortunately, Measure F failed at the ballot box by close to 100, 100 votes, um, and um, you know we needed full support to be able to get that. Um, what was hopefully going to be an eight million dollar source of funding um, for the city forever. Um, and so we have um, to live with, we have to live within our means. Um, the state has the enviable job of, of divvying up about a $94 billion surplus. I think um, Randy's point is well taken as is our city managers, which is we know there's gonna be trailer bills in August and trailer bills in September. Um, all of that is gonna happen with state, state funding as well. Um, and so I, I, I'm not going to cement uh, support the amended motion because I do believe that, you know, with direction as in the in the uh, uh, the original motion, our both staffs at the county and the city are going to continue to watch these funding streams as well as uh, look at resources that are also um, within the city's control. Um, to try to look to see if we can plug those budget gaps. But if the back of the napkin, whether it's a little bit 10% um, one way or 10% over a, another way, a um, million dollars is just not in our budget. Um, and um, to one of the speakers today earlier, you know, we do need to build our bike trails. We do need to do the things that help take care of our parks. Um, and so um, we are in this difficult decision right now because we failed in our revenue measure. And, uh, you know, there was not full endorsement by all city council members, unfortunately, on that revenue measure. And, you know, I'm not sure how the voters responded to that or not, but um, I know the voters looked to the leaders of the community to try to see, it, you know, um, a lot in terms of weighing their votes. So um, I think we um, unfortunately have to tell our community that we have to keep looking and we, we're, we're committed to that. Um, but at this time, I won't be able to support the amended motion primarily because it's it's not it's not good fiscal um, policy to promise things that we can't promise and that we'll have to make other cuts, especially to the tune of about a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. You had your hand raised. Uh, my points were just articulated by Council Member Meyer, so I don't need to add. Thank you. Okay, I I want to hand it to uh, Deputy City Attorney Cassie Bronson. I don't want to unduly cut off discussion here, but I kind of want to go back to we have a motion on the floor yes. uh, from Council Member Kalantari Johnson, I believe, and we have the substitute motion by Council Member Cummings, and a substitute motion is uh, I'm sorry, we have an amended motion. Excuse me. Uh, by Council Member Cummings, but an amended motion is treated the same as a substitute motion which is there has to be a vote on whether or not to accept the amended motion. So um, I would suggest that the council go do that. And then, so there's, it's sort of a two vote process. So thank you. Yeah. We'll go ahead. Okay. Um, is it okay? Yeah, because I just heard 
Council Member Meyer say a million dollars, and my back of the envelope calculation based upon what I under what I heard from um, Randy Morris was that, and I think Laura as well, Laura Schmidt. Um, if it's 1.5 million for all the programs, and the city is roughly putting in 21% on the programs that are braided funding, then that's more like $315,000, just to be clear about what we're voting on. Because we can't compel the county to put more money in, we're talking about the city's share. Thank you. All right, uh, we will take a roll call vote on the motion to amend, which is to fund all uh, non-awarded organizations at uh, for one year. Is it up there? To, to award the bridge funding car uh, from fiscal year 21-22 carried over to fiscal year 22-23. Maybe I can clarify that um, language just slightly to award the bridge funding to total the recommended amount or allocations, I should say, sorry, from 2021, 22, to, to fiscal year 2022, 2023. And they include city? City, I'm sorry, sorry, the recommended city allocations. Funding. I'd also say to um, the recommended core organization programs that reapplied and did not receive funding. Sorry. Is it also to cut to take the funding from the CIP? Is that part of your motion? No, it's not part of my motion because the staff would need to go find that funding. And that funding could come from a number of different sources. So, no. With no suggestion of where Okay. And I'll just say this has happened in the past where we, the council has moved forward with programs. And I would imagine that even, I would imagine that the direction this motion is going in is it's, it's likely not going to pass. But in the next motion, we will still have to go and find some of those funds if we're going to give funding to all the organizations. And so we will have likely this discussion again of where this money is gonna come from. But I'll leave my comments there. So um, in, in your amendment, I'm not seeing the one year that you mentioned, and that's the difference with Cal mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson is the three Which month fund? of Which? transition funding. And I guess is that spelled out in the when you have fiscal year that's the intent but to clarify it to award the bridge funding okay. for one year so after bridge funding for one year to total the recommended city allocations fiscal year 20 yep all right may we have a roll call vote uh, is the seconder okay with that okay thank you may we have a roll call vote, please Council Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Golder? No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. Mayor Brenner? No. And I appreciate the intent with that motion. Um, Let's see, we are now back to the original motion, uh, which is to uh, fund the bridge transition funding for three months as recommended in the staff report. I had a question actually for clarification. I thought I heard that it was to fund um, all the organizations that didn't receive funding, was that the staff? Because I think the, oh, so it was the staff recommendation, not in alignment with the county. Right, Council Member Cummins. So the distinction there is that this would include all previously funded, but not recommended for this cycle, 
regardless of whether they're above or below the 25,000 okay. threshold. And uh, just for the council's information too, again, this is rough math, but we estimate that price tag to be around $100,000 for those three months, the city's share. I would like to add, oh, if someone would like to add a friendly amendment for to direct staff to return in August with that funding plan. I think you can make the friendly amendment. No, I'll make the friendly amendment. <coughs> the staff return in August with um, funding recommendations for a funding plan. The funding plan. Keep it general. And for the record, you could have made the friendly amendments. Uh, mayor, the, mayor, mayor. the mayor can make friendly amendments. <laughs> Thank you. Please, please do, Mayor. <laughs> please do. <laughs> All right, is the seconder uh, okay with that friendly amendment? The first and the seconder? Yes. Thank you. All right, may we have a roll call vote? Council member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and I look forward to refining this process and the input in the fall, the reports out of this. Uh, we need to see them before. Yeah. And I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I Didn't that motion include two and four? I don't believe so. Two included three. It was. Can you. Three, four included three. So now you have to do four. Number four. And I'd like to. I have my I, I can put that. Like I thought Council Member Kalantari Johnson made a motion to approve staff recommendations two and four. It, it was. It was number two. It was solely two. Okay. So. Now, my apologies, um, I had two and four written. Okay, so now we are on item number four and uh, Council Member Brown, would you like to make a motion? Sorry, I just didn't want to get lost in the mix. I know I it's hard if you're looking all around. It. There's... I don't mean to be aggressive, um, but there's a lot going on. Um, <clears throat> so I, I just wanna make a, a comment here uh, before I um, make a motion about this process, and um, and when I and I say this, um, you know, I don't take this lightly um, because I, I think that what I'm about to say is going to sound uh, that some people aren't going to like it, <laughs> um, but I, I feel the need to say it, and I want to say it with all, really with all due respect. Um, I think that the staff that have been involved in this um, have the best intentions. I, I know you care and you're, you're trying to do your best with a process that I believe has become um, over-engineered, costly, convoluted, and really has produced some pretty disappointing results and a conundrum for elected officials on, well, at least some of us, um, about how, what to do here. These are gonna have a significant impact, particularly the smaller, less resource nonprofits, um, and it's really negative impact. And, and so to say that it's emotional or you know, they're upset is, I think diminishes the gravity of, of what is gonna happen in people's lives, real people's lives, who have jobs right now, um, who are gonna lose their jobs, People who have jobs right now, uh, including one city worker that I know of, who's gonna lose her child, subsidized childcare um, as a result of what we're doing today. Um, and I could go on. I mean, these are, these are really, really, they, they, they're a big deal. And to, you know, when I hear council members talking about, well, it's a few thousand bucks, you know. Yeah, that's a, that makes a big difference for some of these programs that are, un, especially the under-resourced ones. Um, you know, uh, 
So, and I have lots to say. I have lots of notes that I'll be happy to share when um, we get around. If you still want to call me, <laughs> Randy, when you're doing the uh, uh, you know assessment. But you know, like what is, I just want to go. About, what is our goal here? Is our goal to have a robust safety net, or is our goal to operate like a foundation? I mean, that really hit me when um, a member of uh, I think it was Clay Kemp said it. Um, you know, and as a longtime grant writer myself. I see that foundations are always looking for the next shiny thing, right? And is that the, I don't want to, I, I want a robust safety net. I don't want to be another funder that's like, wow, you know, you know, tell the pan, wow the panels. Um, we're talking about real people's lives. Um, so I'm going to make a motion to, um, you know, this basically move the, the staff recommendation here um, with the following additions. Um, to return with an estimate of costs for consultants and administrative staff time for the 22-23 core funding cycle. What it cost in consultants and all of the staff, I know it's going to be challenging, but I'd like to get some, even if back of the envelope assessment, because I can tell you now, as a member of the Community Programs Committee, um, and as a member of the community who has gone to Community Programs Committee meetings for years prior to being on this council, um, the staff time involved in the previous process, we can call it imperfect, we can say anything we want about it, but it sure did not take a fraction of what the time that is being spent now um, to micromanage grants for these programs. Um, so I want to know how much that costs. So my, my again, I'm going to step back. My motion is the um, number four, um, to move the staff recommendation with the addition of um, a return with an evaluation of, um, or an estimate on the costs for consultants an administrative staff time to oversee the core 22-23 process. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, do you second that? Yes, I second that and just had some comments after Councilmember Brown is complete. Great. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Brown and a second by Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Uh, so item number or number four of item number agenda item 40 uh, is the motion is to direct staff to return with county human services department on or before December 13th with an update on the three month transition funding the newly established con contracts and performance tracking mechanisms efforts to explore other funding sources for current <laughs> core funded agencies not being recommended for award and progress on lessons learned, review of the request for proposal process with the addition of returning with an estimate of cost of consultants and admin staff time spent on the core process. All right, council member uh, Cummings. Yeah, and I'll just say it since I didn't have get to say my comments from before just on this process I do want to thank the staff and community members who have um, provided their input uh, on this process and who've worked through this process um, I will say though that to Councilmember Brown's point and to many other points out there as a not someone who runs a nonprofit and who writes grants for nonprofits um, you know one of the things I think moving forward that we really have to be focused on is impacts and be an impact driven uh, have this be an impact driven process because if we have organizations that are having positive impacts on our community cutting their funding to fund a new organization or to just give other people a chance I think um, can have detrimental impacts and um, impacts that are unforeseen because the people who they serve then will no longer receive those services and um, many of the people who are working for those organizations might not have jobs anymore and so figuring out and determining um, that criteria of if organizations have been performing good services and they have positive outcomes and they're having positive impacts on the communities, how we can keep those organizations whole should be first and foremost um, as we're considering to bring on 
the organization and create new pools of funding to get new organizations started. Um, because, uh, you know, we're taking a risk right now with, um, you know, um, funding some folks who are in the unknown. Not that that's a bad thing, but, um, you know, it's coming at the potential cost of cutting organizations who we know perform good work in the community. And so um, my hope is that uh, during that three month uh, bridge process that um, we also work to help those organizations um, find more funding. And I don't know if that has to be, that should be included in the, the motion. But um, as part of that um, bridge funding process that the county and city staff work with the organizations to find additional funding, I'm happy to add that in this friendly amendment. That yeah. efforts to explore other funding sources. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. what I figured. So, you know, that's already there, but um, my hope is that, uh, that we can continue to fund these organizations and we are not, um, you know, that they're funding, that the loss of funding isn't coming at a cost, as a cost to some um, vital resources for our community and services for our community. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thanks. Yeah, just on that note, um, that was a comment that I made um, earlier on in this in this discussion that that is that should be part of our lessons learned is that sustainability is a conversation that we have with all organizations involved and um, to outline and help navigate what other resources and sources of funding there are. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is um, just thank you, Council Member Brown, for your addition to that motion. Obviously, I second it, so I'm in agreement. Um, and and I just I want to speak for myself. I'm part of the Community Programs Committee and. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been a grant writer. I've also been a grant reviewer. So I understand all parts of this. And I think for me and for us as council members, like we, we, we all have a role to play. And so moving forward, my role as a community programs committee, I'm gonna dive into this a lot deeper. Um, and those council members, my colleagues who aren't on the community programs committee, you're included in the process as well, um, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to come in at this point, at this juncture and, and give feedback. Of course, we don't know what we don't know until we get there, but I think it's important for all of us to really be immersed in the process throughout this happening. I mean, um, county staff, city staff, this was a big lift. Um, the consultants we brought in, this was a big lift and you did a tremendous job, we're there things we could have done better. Absolutely, I think we all agree on that. But I just wanna name that it's also my responsibility as an elected official and as a community leader and um, someone who cares about these organizations and nonprofits that I stay engaged and I stay involved. So I'm committing to that and moving forward and whatever the process should look like. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I think it is appropriate that a lot of this uh, uh, input and work go through the community programs committee as we move uh, forward um, that committee that is you know a huge part of that function so thank you for uh, serving on that committee and um, for the direction I think uh, before we have a vote on this motion you know sustainability was was really the key word that was brought up several times and it's definitely been made clear that many of these programs and organizations are all vital, have not had sustainable funding to maintain and have relied on this award funding from the city and, and the county and um, you know, it's understandable, you know, the city itself, we are also looking for funding sources to fund all kinds of things. You know, we've made reductions across every department. We're, you know, reducing what we can as well. So um, it speaks very highly to the pandemic and the increased needs in our community and the reduced funding and resources for everybody. And so I'm really on the glass half full, happy that we were able to manage to um, put over a million dollars towards this. We would not be having this three hour discussion if we had um, 
you know, funding to fund all the programs, I think we would all agree that would be an easy motion to make if money was not the issue. Um, all of these organizations offer um, amazing uh, community benefit that um, we're all in agreement of needing support. So I look forward to seeing what other funding sources we can help these organizations uh, find as well as what other funding sources we can contribute to these other to these organizations core is just one funding stream out of our city general fund so there are other earmarked sources and i'm glad the children's fund was an example of one of those other funding sources um, i would like to ask for a roll call vote if there's no other um, really quick um i heard very quickly the words friendly amendment after no okay thank you for confirming <laughs> council member kalantari johnson aye boulder aye cummings aye brown aye myers aye vice mayor watkin aye and mayor bruder aye that motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much, everybody who was able to join us. Randy Morris, Kimberly Peterson. Thank you to Laura Schmidt. Thank you um, for all the work. And I look forward to the update. We are moving on to item number 41 on our agenda today. Item number 41 is the um, resolution ordering an election and requesting the county to conduct the election and requesting consolidation of the election to be held on November 8th, 2022. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council, and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing uh, we ha in person and virtually. We also received 119 emails to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. And those are also considered public input and public comment. We have two organizations approved for extra time. Cindy Dawson, the Yes on Empty Home Tax, and John Hall, our downtown, our future. Okay, at this time now, I will hand it over to our staff for presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor, really quick. Before you, you we're gonna start with a presentation from finance um, based on the staff direction for a fiscal impact report. In your packet, you had the county's verification of the petition, um, qualifying them for the ballot. And then you'll have a resolution to call the election, which the city attorney's office is going to um, speak to that um, when we get to that point. Great, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Marisol Gomez. I'm the Assistant Finance Director um, and the Council has had ordered us to have a fiscal impact report um, for the Empty Homes Tax uh, Citizen-Based Initiative. Uh, in your agenda report, um, we have uh, a summary of impacts based on um, Elections Code Section 9212. We worked with our um, 
internal departments to get some summary on, on those items for you, as well as uh, internally in the finance department to get some estimates uh, to put against this, um, to provide to you and the public for uh, our best estimate on revenue measures and cost measures on the citizen-based initiative. So um, let me just dive right in. We'll go right. Um, I don't have a formal presentation here. I figured we'll just uh, talk uh, some of the highlights um, and then get some feedback from from you guys. Um, all right. So as you're well aware, uh, we have um, the empty homes tax um, for consideration uh, by Santa Cruz voters. If you guys uh, pass this this um, agenda report here, um, and we were uh, told to report to you uh, no later than 30 days after the election, official certifies the sufficiency of the petition to the city, and that has been done. So, uh, number one, fiscal impact. Um, what we did here, as you can see from the um, the screen. Um, Actually, I should be sharing my screen. I'm sorry about that. Here we go. Sorry about that. Are you guys able to see the? Um, yes, thank you. The impact report. Okay. Um, so what we did here was start with a absentee properties list um, for our basis of calculation for the revenue estimates uh, as a starting point. So what that means is um, we looked at the city of Santa Cruz uh, parcels and uh, the absentee list provides a mailing address other than situs, which is other than the physical location of the uh, parcel. Um, so we started with that as a basis for uh, what we would assume would um, would uh, work for this measure for estimates. Um, from that, we uh, took away some of the, we, we audited the list to make sure that there wasn't any duplications in the address. Uh, you know, those that were abbreviated um, accounted for that. And then we also, um, reduce that amount by homeowner exemptions claimed, uh, which was left on that list. Um, what we also did as far as um, estimating what an exemption um, percentage would be, uh, similar to the city of Oakland and their, um, and their uh, vacant homes tax um, measure, we provided a range of exemptions. So we don't actually know what, uh, who and what and how many people will qualify for the exemptions under this ordinance. So it was best to provide a range so that way you guys can have a range of estimated revenue here. So the basis of that range was we took uh, some of the information from our um, long-term um, long -term rental program and they have certain exemptions on that list as um, under that program as well. And we found that um, from that a list of exemptions that approximately um, 30, 34% uh, uh, were on the exemptions for that program. So we used that as, as a lower uh, measure for our range. And then we had for estimates, a higher range of 60. Um, and we chose that range uh, just to show you the range of estimates that we needed to provide based off of that. Um, a lot of uh, the other information is based on the cost associated with what we feel the cost associated with uh, implementing this ordinance would be. Um, from the ordinance, there are some stipulations where 15% of, um, of the revenue would be, uh, would go towards the, the committee, uh, the commission that needs to be established. Um, and 5% of that uh, could be set aside for for homelessness um, and hygiene services. Um, and the rest of that was um, supposed to be, sorry. And then we have uh, some other information on uh, startup costs and also ongoing costs, but split out between the commission and, and what um, other costs would be besides that. So let me pull up the, um, Let 
you zoom in here. Sorry about that. So we provided the schedule because we, we know that you guys like to have transparency in how we came across, um, how we estimated some of these uh, costs. Um, and we also broke it down by startup cost, uh, which would be those one-time costs in the first year. Uh, ongoing committee costs, um, because as I said, the committee costs have a different cap or have a, um, don't have a cap on them. The administration uh, does, uh, aside from the ongoing committee costs. So we broke that out so you can see that these ongoing administrative costs are capped at 15% um, per the way the ordinance is written, um, the, the measure is written, the ongoing committee costs are not under that 15% cap. Um, so that's how we decided to break it out for you just to, to provide a little more information. Um, and with discussing internally about um, what departments might handle some of these um, administrative costs and how much time we estimate each uh, person would be um, allotted to these, uh, these activities annually. Um, we utilized our, um, our budget numbers for fiscal year 23 to grab the fully burdened hourly rate. So those are for certain positions in these departments. Um, some of these uh, departments up top here show multiple positions. So we're a very collaborative group and when we have to implement something or track something, we're working across departments. It's not just one person or it's not just one department. So some of these costs are multiple um, people in these uh, departments working on some of the administrative costs uh, as an estimate. Um, so that's how we got the fully burdened hourly rates there um, and then estimated uh, some hours on these tasks. So we talked with um, our departments, we talked with the auditors, we talked with um, with our legal team just to estimate uh, and try to gather and put some hours towards some of these uh, related costs. Um, so what we're looking at here is a grand total uh, startup cost of 607,000. Um, that is this first section here of just the startup cost. Um, ongoing committee costs we're estimating here at 126,000. And again, we separated that from ongoing administration because that's capped at 15% of revenues. Um, and this could fluctuate. One of the reasons why uh, you know this is an estimate is because even the, the current ordinance, the way it's written, is um, that the committee meets no less than one time a year. Um, but just based on the way other commissions are where they're meeting monthly or they might have special uh, projects or special meetings so we have to build in that estimate for time um and so some of that uh is what this estimate is is entailed in, in terms of hours and again um sort of like we do currently for our budget and revenue ad hoc committee it's not just one person in a department it could be a couple people because they're overseeing um some different tasks so we try to utilize some of what we do now um, to estimate who will be involved in, in that committee. Um, of course, that will have to be set up if this passes, um, but that is our estimate. So that's why you see multiple uh, departments involved there as well. As far as uh, ongoing administration um, here, we have we have some of these uh, based on you know the uh, the portions of the proposed measure on what needs to happen, um, annual audits uh, adjusted annually for CPI changes. We need to negotiate uh, payment arrangements or plans, and we need to have a process for exemptions and how to verify exemptions. A lot of that we talked with our our audits um, our revenue manager with over, who oversees the audits team currently for TOTs and short term rentals. So. We try to utilize um, those hours as a basis of why we have some hours here on on those ongoing um, on those ongoing pieces, those those tasks that will um, inevitably come if this measure is is uh, passed. So that is the breakdown of the cost. Um, we have also the breakdown of the the revenue there but i just wanted to highlight sort of the the report and what that means and why we broke it down by those sections um 
Uh, some of the other pieces here regarding the general plan, um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good information here. Um, what we're basically saying, if the revenue does, uh, is, sorry, if the measure does generate enough revenue beyond um, the ongoing administrative costs, um, there is a potential to, um, to fund these housing, uh, any housing objectives that would be had, right? Um, so the general consensus is, yes, if, um, um, if the, the measure has potential to raise funds that can be used in the creation of additional affordable housing um, and, and uh, in regards to affordable housing creation and promotion, um, this does coincide with our general plan and housing element. Uh, there's nothing that contradicts what's in place now. Um, some of the other areas here, land use and housing, um, again, if the total tax to be collected uh, uh, associated with, um, um, if the net positive is, is, if there is a net positive, that's how we know if there's gonna be a benefit or not. A lot of what we have here is estimated, um, but we have a statement here saying uh, this this would be good if there is a net positive. Um, the committee would have to figure out a way to um, wrangle these funds and work with uh, the finance department in the city to make sure these these funds are kept um, for these purposes and determine those purposes. Um, but overall, that is the general um, review on these items. So impacts for infrastructure. Um, right here, um, unlikely to have a direct impact on uh, existing properties because the vacant uh, home tax is, is sort of uh, administering against uh, existing uh, properties. It's not requiring um, it's not requiring the the creation of infrastructure. Um, it's only if we have generated enough revenue to to uh, work in affordable housing. Um, business attraction, retention, and employment. Um, again, if the ongoing revenue here um, could posit positively impact the community, um, if the revenues ex exceed the cost of administering the program and staffing the commission um, established by the measure. Uh, vacant land, um, the initiative will not have any appreciable, uh, appreciable impacts on vacant parcels. Uh, that was um, vacant parcels were omitted by the proposed measure uh, to be taxed against. Um, and whether a unit is vacant or not doesn't really have an impact on whether to develop land. Uh, so that's one of the items uh, in this section of code that uh, doesn't seem to have an impact. Um, again, the, uh, the ordinance uh, is, the proposed ordinance is related to existing properties, um, even though in the future, we could see that this has would have an impact if it generates enough revenue um, over the cost of the annual administration and the startup costs, then it can begin to build some positive impact in all of these areas. Um, and, and looking at research uh, for this, we did, you know, we did try to reach out to other cities that are doing this, Oakland, San Francisco. Um, a lot of them didn't return um, some some good responses. Uh, a lot of them had just responses on the ballot measure that we were able to get some information from and how they how um, their measures polled and, and that type of information. But we didn't really get any helpful insight on uh, from those people directly on how they did their analysis for um, revenue and cost estimates. However. Um, I did want to make a side note that the city of Los Angeles and more locally, the city of Capitola were having discussions on whether to add this type of tax uh, to their November ballots as well. Um, they uh, don't have anything as far as I know in their uh, agenda um, on their agenda uh, review yet, but uh, that is a side note, just more locally um, cities are looking into this. A lot of the information um, from San Francisco and Oakland um, started during, uh, since the ordinance started during COVID and San Francisco actually delayed a portion of their ordinance. Um, it was really hard to get some of that data that would have been helpful from those cities, uh, knowing that they didn't really have what we would consider a normal sort of process for this 
uh, data and research. So that's also something um, that we wanted to know. We did try to uh, reach out and, and get some information here, but uh, it is a newer type of tax. And um, even though some of these were in implemented before, just the times that they were implemented was not helpful in this data gathering. Um, so that's the overview of uh, the empty home tax um, impact report as presented by the finance department. Um, and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Marisol Gomez. Uh, appreciate the information and the dive into this impact report. I did have a couple questions and then I'll bring it out to council members for questions. Um, we did receive uh, a lot of input in emails. Um, there were some specific questions around um, the estimates on the revenue were under underestimated and um, estimates on oversight committee are uh, overestimated. And so how do we can you speak a little more to that um, process um, in uh, attaining and determining that information, um, you know, when there's uh, the question of, of underestimated and overestimated in this context? Yes, absolutely. So um, a lot of uh, the estimates and, and sort of where the bottom estimates are I think start with um, the exemption so again we don't know exactly um, how many percentage or units um, would qualify for exemption so we had to have a range and sort of show a range of what that would look like um, that exemption range was based off of our current exemption range with the long-term rental program just sort of having like a, a like um, a like data set to to estimate from um some of the other things we started with uh properties on the absentee list again that is properties um that the uh, property tax bill sent to um other than the physical location um as a good basis of you know if if we have people in their homes uh they're typically the property tax bill sent to their home um and so that was the starting point for some of uh, for this estimate. And then from there, we um, we took the uh, the estimate of the long term rental program as well. So the long term rental program, we have to um, assume that some of those that have the um, the uh, the property tax bill sent elsewhere that they have long-term rentals there so they're not going to be vacant so we reduced by an estimate of our long-term property uh, program so we worked with the planning department um, and and got their their data set there and um, used that as an estimate so we're what we're doing is trying to we start with uh, that list of properties and try to think of, um, you know, which ones would be exempted under what the ordinance reads, uh, which ones wouldn't qualify for the 120 days or more uh, being vacant um, and, and further reducing it there. Um, that, that's what we okay. have. Um, and your question on, um, did you have a follow up here? I know you had a question on the, um, the oversight committee. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the underestimate and the overestimate uh, question was, yeah. So the um, the oversight committee, again, we sort of based on who we thought, uh, what positions we thought would be pulled into these uh, meetings or uh, needing to be working on reports, annual reports, ad hoc reports. Um, there there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, staff time in agendas and meeting minutes and, you know, just, just as we do for the other uh, commissions and uh, the council. Um, so those estimates uh, were, were from um, the current sort of what we do for the revenue and budget committee. So again, these are estimates, but they're based on what we, what we do now and what we feel would uh, would be the hour spent on this program. Um, I know, um, 
I know the um, the ongoing uh, costs are um, aside from the committee. Again, those can be reduced, but we're trying to show an estimate. So let's say if we absolutely know there's only gonna be one meeting a year, um, then that would reduce it. But we're assuming uh, there might be other meetings that we're gonna have special meetings that we might need to convene on how to spend some of uh, the, the funds that have been building up. Um, um, <clears throat> Thank you. There was a question about the litigation response budget included in the startup estimates. Um, yes. And uh, the, the question was that uh, there's no indication that it would expose the city to a high level risk for litigation. So is, it, um, is that amount in startup costs unwarranted? Um, in the finance department, we don't believe it is. Um, we have, uh, you know, part of finance, we have our internal service fund, uh, the risk department. And and speaking with, uh, in the fiscal year 23 budget, uh, we have some estimates on uh, for the risk and the, the liabilities and, and working those in. So those estimates are already in the budget and they were based on um what was what was known at the time so this is a new ordinance and speaking with our legal team uh, being a new ordinance it's always subject to have some sort of um, lawsuit and whether or not the measure itself um, has some cause um, anyone can sue the city and even if there's not a, a good case when talking with our risk uh, manager um, there are costs associated with having to go to court and get those cases thrown out so we sort of are trying to approach this whole so, sort of wholeheartedly like what other effects will this have um, and we chose to put it in the startup cost because we don't believe it's going to be an ongoing cost. It could be a cost that we set aside and add to the risk, um, the internal service fund for risk because it hasn't been there uh, for this specific purpose. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we chose uh, to put it in the startup cost. And we did work with our legal team to get an estimate on um, on what this would, would be. And this is a conservative estimate. Thank you. I. I I was curious if that was standard and based on um, uh, uh, anything that we currently have in place. Like you mentioned with the, um, the oversight committee estimates based on other committees and what's currently in place. Uh, the one other question was on the web portal in the startup costs. And um, the question was, since the city already has a web portal built, is that, does that need to be, um, since one already exists, is this an additional web portal? What is that web portal cost? Um, for the cost on there, um, I believe we have a, a five thousand uh, dollar flat fee. So, sort of like with um, our current software system, if we're adding a new module or a, a new um, some user defined fields, it's going to have a cost. So that was uh, a close estimate to what we um, recently implemented in revenue. Um, uh, for some online payment. So we base things on uh, what we've had in the past. Um, and then there's always, if we have a new portal, we're gonna need to test it. We're gonna need time with IT. We're gonna need time with our revenue team, uh, just testing these things all around. So these estimates are just, it sounds like if we were to need a new portal, this is what it would cost, but not. it's not saying we do need a new portal. Yes, and um, it, even uh, if we have changes to the portal, uh, we're going to need to account for staff time to test that and, and implement that with IT. Yeah, I think the difference between the changes and the new portal is significant cost. Yeah. So um, I think it's that helps my understanding in that you're just laying out the estimates if it were to go that way. I'm not saying that we do need to have this in order to implement this. Mayor Bruner, if I could chime in, um, just to zoom the conversation out here a bit, because um, I'll, I'll admit there's a, a lot of details uh, that we're throwing out you, throwing at you related to these estimates. The cost allocation plan itself is a complex matrix. Yes. 
as we look at the services being provided across the departments and how we account for that staff time. So, um, you know, broadly speaking, I would say that the estimates included in the, in the study are conservative ones. Uh, staff took a conservative approach when they look at um, uh, what the potential uh, administrative cost could be. Um, and the same is true for the revenues. So as, as we look at the potential here, uh, could the revenues uh, certainly exceed what's being estimated? Um, absolutely. Uh, could the costs that are being estimated uh, turn out to be lower than what we're anticipating? Um, I think the same could be true. And uh, some of those efficiencies, including um, the example of being able to utilize the portal that we already have in place, um, are certainly examples of that. But to be safe, uh, yes, staff safe. included those estimates in there in the event that we would need to uh, go through that additional stand-up uh, cost as part of the program. So I just, want, I just wanted to make that clear uh, that these are estimates and certainly we, uh, we could see those revenues come in higher than we're expecting uh, and we may find ways that we could administer it uh, more efficiently, which would of course reduce cost. Thank you. Um, I will uh, bring it out to council members and I saw council member Myers and council member Brown with hands up. I think um, Mayor Councilmember Brown's hand was up before me. I know you're having to go through the two, two different uh, realities, so I'm happy to have Councilmember okay. Brown go Council first. Councilmember Brown. Okay. Yeah, either way is fine. Um, so, well, I actually wanted to ask a question about the, the timing here because I, I have many questions about this spreadsheet, and thank you for the transparency, but it's <laughs> causing me to have a lot of questions. And I know there are people who I see a lot of hands up. I have the participants bar open and I'm just can wondering I just, if we can, like I'll, I can wait on my questions. I just see. realized it's 6.30 yeah, and we have a time certain oral communications. I know. So I would like to recommend pausing this item so that we can go to our time certain oral communications. Can I just ask, to, for, because there are people who are gonna be now waiting a lot more Will we come back and then potentially have another hour of council member questions before people are able to speak? Or can we, I'm just asking if we could maybe yeah, that's let a them good question. do public comment. That's um, a good question. It's a question for you though, Mayor, because you're the, you're the chair presiding officer, if you would be willing to let people speak before we hash it out. Does that so when we sense? come back from yeah. world communications to go right into so public comment know, and then not, to have, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Um, always trying to be mindful of everybody's time. I know uh, these meetings are long. So um, uh, at this time, we will, uh, thank you Marisol and hopefully you're okay to pause right now as we go to oral communications. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> let's see, let me go to my notes. So oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. For members of the public streaming, if you wish to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. You can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And once you see the screen with the instructions. If you are uh, members of the uh, public who are here in person and wish to address uh, council, please line up to the right of the dais to my left. You will have two minutes to speak. If you could sign up on the clipboard and that way I know who's here to speak for oral communications. And can we get instructions on the screen for those that need to call in for oral communications, please? Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public on items not on our agenda today. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address questions raised after oral communications has completed. And now I will, um, we do have, it looks like one member of the public here joining us in chambers. 
So please come forward to the podium and make sure the microphone is close to your mouth. Good evening. It was nice to speak here earlier. I kind of need to apologize. Some of my wording I should say most because it certainly doesn't apply to every single person in the room. Um, you know, not to speak about things that have already been discussed. You know, this Santa Cruz County Local Agenda 21, this is only 85 pages. Imagine if this were a piece of uh, tempered glass on your uh, driver window, you were to shatter it into a million pieces. So I'm sure this has stuff to do with the agenda, but I'll be loosely specific. Um, I'll make a comparison between the County of Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors and what is spoken about here. I don't know if it's like Santa Cruz is some kind of an island. There are things going around all over the world and in the United States as far as shortages. I, mean, I don't think there's been much mentioned about since the beginning of 2021. Over 120 food production plants have been <coughs> destroyed. It seems like we're having not only just a diesel shortage, but we're various things that diesel motors need. And people I think are somewhat beguiled if they think that most of the electricity generated in the United States isn't generated by coal. If we don't have diesel, those locomotives can't move the coal, and we're facing some serious situations that it just seems that Santa Cruz is an island. It is a very special place, but it is connected to the United States and planet Earth, and there are things going on that are just not being talked about. Seems like people are going to be in a big shock <coughs> when certain things catch up to uh, smart city Santa Cruz. So thank you, and thank you for respecting the time because i got multiple places to be. Thank you. Good to see all of you. Thank you for your oral communications. Are there any other members of the public for oral communications in person? And let me go out to our virtual attendees. And it looks like a phone number ending in 7003. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. This is for oral communication. Uh, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Uh, good evening. This is Darius Mosby. Um, interesting presentation. Um, I would caution about the methodology used to estimate the number of parcels that uh, have a tax belt bill sent somewhere else in the absence. Darius, I will have to stop you. We are taking uh, oral communications on anything not on today's agenda. It sounds like you're speaking to uh, item of the empty homes tax item 41 and we will be i'm sorry I'm... I'm sorry go ahead is that true i'm sorry i didn't hear that last part are you speaking to empty homes tax i thought i was but i do have an old i do have something unrelated to the agenda if it's too late for that Okay, this is oral communications to clarify, so you can um, start over if you're speaking to an item not on the agenda. Okay, I have uh, a couple actually. First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to our new city manager. I listened to him being interviewed by Robert Norris at the public safety uh, um, meeting about a month ago, and he was extremely poised, extremely professional, and extremely and exhibited extreme restraint, extreme restraint in being interviewed. So just a shout out to him. And uh, yes, indeed, there are a few of us that do listen to that show. Um, <clears throat> second, I just learned that the Santa Cruz Wharf, the pier, is the longest wooden pier, I think, in the country. And there's absolutely no indication of that. And I would love to see a sign at the end of the pier say something like, now, congratulations, you've reached the end of the you know, country's longest wooden pier or something to that effect. Uh, it could be the equivalent of the, the same equivalent of the Las Vegas, Welcome to Las Vegas sign, appearing on Instagrams and Facebooks and so forth uh, near everybody. Anyway, um, that's all. Thank you very much, and uh, see you in August or September. 
Thank you. Are there any other uh, members of the public that would like to speak to us on any items not on today's agenda for oral communications? Okay, that concludes oral communications. Thank you. And I will now return to item number 41 on our agenda. And uh, there was a recommendation to uh, have council questions after public comment. I, I did have one clarifying question. I wasn't sure if we were gonna get a staff presentation or maybe it was mentioned about the our downtown, our future. I wasn't sure if the staff portions of presentations were over, if we're hearing that as two separate items. Are you talking about the impact report? In addition to the impact report, the library um, item that's going to go on. I There's guess. no pre staff presentation for that one. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I will now um, uh, look for public comment. If you're joining us here in council chambers and would like to comment on item 41, please uh, line up on my left and sign in at the clipboard. And if you are a member of the public joining us in the hybrid fashion via a virtual world, then um, please raise your hand by uh, dialing star nine on your phone or choosing the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. And if we can bring the slide up one more time for calling instructions, if you're calling in, the phone number should be on your screen. And this is for agenda item number 41. Uh, I guess I will start with you since you're at the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. And just make uh, sure I, you're talking into the mic. Okay. Thank I you. had uh, four minutes. Um, you allocated four minutes to me as uh, John Hall, chair of. Oh, great. Thank you for identifying. Our downtown, our future. Thank you. So, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council members, and other people. Uh, today, uh, our downtown, our future requests that you put our petition measure on the ballot for November. At your May meeting, ODIF strongly endorsed the motion that, a city, that the city engage a consultant to conduct an impact assessment of ODIF's measure. Despite the delay in finding a consultant and the resulting delayed impact report, we continue to encourage the city to find a highly qualified consultant that we can uh, assure provides a completely objective and unbiased analysis. It's our understanding that your decision to engage a consultant includes two important principles that we'd like to affirm publicly. First, in order to ensure a balanced and objective report, the city staff and consultant are expected to engage with our downtown, our future, concerning the measure and its impacts. We propose that such engagement include the co-chairs of ODIF and the members of its architecture and urban planning team. Second, because ODIF's measure, if passed, would establish an alternative approach to that being pursued by the city, the consultant's analysis should incorporate comparison of the present plans for downtown's lot for use, mixed use project, detailing costs and benefits of both alternatives. In particular, concerning the lot four project for fiscal responsibility, the consultant needs to assess a realistic timeline for securing parking garage bond financing and payment of bond debt by the city, given that the parking district is years away from achieving a surplus of revenue over expenditures. According to the city and county clerks, 4,912 registered Santa Cruz city voters signed our petition, more than 1,000 more than the 3848 required. Today, we especially want to thank the more than 60 volunteers who made it possible to complete a verified petition without the use of any paid signature gatherers. We want to thank the city and county clerks uh, and their staff for their efforts and the more than 1,000 people residing in the county who wanted to submit their signatures in support of ODIF but could not legally do so, and most, most of all, the 4,912 city voters 
who have supported making Otis' proposal a matter for voters to decide. Our measure is straightforward. It keeps the downtown library at its Civic Center location, allowing the full renovation of, its propose, of it proposed during the 2016 Measure S bond campaign. It requires to the maximum extent feasible for housing equity that 100% affordable housing be developed above the ground level on eight city-owned parking lots downtown. And I would note simply doing affordable housing on one of these uh, lots, lot seven on Front Street, would result in at least 50 more units of affordable housing than promised in the lot four project, plus with room for a child care facility, community rooms, and other amenities and social services. It establishes a permanent location for the downtown farmer's market at its present highly successful and beloved location on Cedar Street, thereby preserving a public space that ultimately can become a downtown plaza. And it avoids putting 60,000 cubic years, yards of concrete and unsustainable 24 million pounds of carbon dioxide into a parking garage when future parking needs can be handled through transportation demand management. We believe that we are charting a better, more sustainable way for Santa Cruz, and we believe that we all owe it to our community and future generations to choose this path. If our downtown, our future's measure passes, we look forward to working with the city to ensure that its planning framework is implemented and done so in a way that benefits the community on all fronts. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, our next member of the public in person. Hi, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I also want to say I love seeing all of the parks make life better backgrounds, and I heartily agree. Um, in 2018, I stood here and addressed Mayor Terrazas and the then city council members. I let them know that by then I had already attended many meetings about the future of our downtown library and the Measure S funds and our downtown. I let them know that I was strongly opposed to the proposal to move the library and combine it with a parking garage. At that point, there was no affordable housing in the proposal. And here we are in 2022. And while we could well have had a fully renovated library by now, had the city not kept insisting on this incredibly expensive project, I'm encouraged that the voters will indeed have a say in these important and far-reaching plans for our downtown. I support our downtown, our future, and I look forward to voting yes on that ballot measure in November. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Are you ready? I can go out to a virtual member of the public and give you a minute to. Uh, that is a suppressed report that they have not received uh, uh, since it was issued. Um, Can you like clarify to, what your... Uh, yeah, the name is Gary Richard Arnold, and I want to congratulate you on keeping the uh, communist and, and Marxist uh, 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 direction uh, that you've had. I know uh, Don Lane as mayor gave the key to the city to uh, communist Angela Davis, who was the vice presidential candidate under communist Gus Hall, who called for the slitting of Christian children uh, on an altar. Yeah, they, they said, if they love to sing about the blood, let's give them some. So anyway, I want to thank Don Lane, who was the campaign manager for Leon Panetta. And we all know about Panetta Gate, right? Uh, there's not one of you that doesn't know about Panetta Gate. Panetta Gate was speaking, when Leon Panetta you, gave military and policy. Are you speaking to item number 41? I'm sorry, what, what did you, what's your question? Why do you want to interrupt me? It doesn't sound like you're speaking to the agenda item. This I is. Uh, we've already. I made a mistake. I apologize. We've already concluded oral communications. We are on item number 41. Well, uh, again, I want to thank you for appointing uh, through musical chairs through the 
Senate machine, uh, Neil Coonerty, who is a Fabian socialist, and uh, as George Bernard Shaw said, I'm a communist, not a member of the Communist Party, but Stalin is a first rate Fabian. And your continuation. Sir, uh, I'm going to have to stop and, uh, you. Thank you uh, for the handout. Please stop. Not only Hitler, but Stalin and Mussolini. Can you please? I'll sit down. I'm Thank sorry you. I hit the, uh, uh, I, I Thank you. Shitty, uh, oral communication, so I apologize for that. But I hope you, uh, I, I've given you documentation that you can use. Okay, at this time I'm going out to our virtual members of the public for agenda item 41. And I see hands raised. We have the first hand raised is Cindy Dawson. And this is um, for extra time. This was a request for extra time. Okay, hello council members, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, council members. My name is Cindy Dawson, and I'm the volunteer campaign manager for the Community Driven Empty Home Tax. We'd like to thank you and city staff for compiling a fiscal impact report. The Empty Home Tax is bringing part of the solution to our affordability crisis, and it's imperative the public have accurate information to inform their decision in November. Unfortunately, the fiscal impact report is missing some critical analyses and contains information that is factually incorrect. The over 6,000 voters who signed our petition urge you to correct these errors before accepting the report into the public record. The report's revenue estimates are significantly underestimated. The report does not provide details on the method it used for calculating revenue, and it does not use the California Department of Finance numbers, which report over 2,000 homes may be eligible to pay the tax in Santa Cruz. This discrepancy needs to be addressed directly in the report. It's also important to uh, note, however, that the report finds the empty home tax will generate $2.5 to $4 million annually. This should be considered the low end of the revenue, despite the fact that the finance staff failed to mention that in their report. Uh, the report wildly overestimates the cost of the oversight committee. This report estimates included over $100,000 to hold one annual meeting of the oversight committee. The committee cannot meet more than once a year without city council approval. Um, and the committee is modeled after the 2016 Major D Oversight Committee so you can get exact estimates from the county. The report does not make a case for its inflated $100,000 lit litigation budget line. The city doesn't provide any evidence of the increased legal risk. This is an unsupported budget line and unnecessarily bloat startup costs. The city already has a reporting web portal for its transit occupancy tax and short term rental. The report includes not $5,000, but over $40,000 to develop a web portal and make changes. We call on the city to be efficient and modify the system we have instead of creating unnecessary costs. Startup costs are overinflated and not supported by case studies. The city of Oakland is over six and a half times the size of Santa Cruz with a much more administratively expensive empty home tax. Yet their startup costs were estimated at $100,000. There's no reason to believe our administration costs would be six times that. We strongly urge you to direct staff to update the report accordingly before accepting this report. We all know why we need an empty home tax. They're skyrocketing housing costs and stagnant wages that are pushing our friends, family, and neighbors out. We're not producing enough affordable units to meet the demand. We must create a revenue stream to fund the creation of these types of units. The empty home tax does that. And you can take action today to publicly support this community-driven solution as being reasonable, fair, and effective way to subsidize the creation of affordable housing for the lowest income levels. This community has stepped up to bring forward a positive part of the solution. And it's ready to do our part to keep Santa Cruz accessible and thriving. I encourage you today to step up with us and support the empty home tax. And I think I have a couple seconds that I do just wanna thank legal staff um, for responding very quickly to our notification that the proposed ballot language in your agenda packet had significant errors when compared 
to the impartial summary before, uh, uh, produced by your lawyer. And we really look forward to the updated language they'll be proposing for your consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public for input is Logan Haug. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome, Logan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Logan Haug and I'm a member of the Student Housing Coalition and I will be a rising sophomore at UC Santa Cruz. I'm also a Santa Cruz voter and I urge you strongly to support come out publicly support the empty homes tax. It's a community driven initiative and it raises uh, critical funding streams that the city desperately needs to uh, combat the housing crisis as well as the homelessness problems that it's so clearly facing. Um, if you decide not to um, support the empty homes tax, you will be missing out on somewhere in the range of $5 million annually. Um, and the I just also wanted to say that the uh, estimated budget is clearly uh, laden with administrative bloat that is uh, completely nonsensical as Cindy brought up in her comment earlier tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is I am watching you. Okay, thanks. The empty home tax is brought to you by the same mindset that gave us Measure M like the extremist democratic socialists, i.e. wannabe communists, who don't respect private property and in their wet dreams would like to abolish the entirety of private property ownership. Think globalist Klaus Schwab, in the future you'll own nothing and be happy. I take Darius at his word. He has investigated this and the few number of properties that might qualify for such an outrageous theft, oh, I say tax, huh? may never pay for a legal administration ratio. The analysis here is pure guesswork, uh, nor will this measure compensate for the loss of personal property rights that the empty home tax proposes. This lack of practicality and certainty isn't what makes it so objectionable. It's the deviant politics and ethics of central control trying to erode every private property owner's rights. It figures it's also brought to you by a council member who infamously said, Something like, just because the people voted down Measure M doesn't mean we can't implement parts of it, which I neither forgive nor forget as a total public betrayal, after which mass protests followed in which large parts stuck that idea along with certain other council members, which for that and other reasons were recalled in a historic recall first. Now, some of what I have to say next is partly hearsay, relying on what I have been told or read, but I always found it alarming, even if only half true. The story is this same council member supposedly had a close personal acquaintance, not only with an author of Measure M, who posted videos advocating the end of private property, but also a person I won't name, but his name most certainly appeared as the admin of a Facebook page that was associated with a Marxist organization known as the Public School. That person's page was a dedicated Marxist reading room site where members organized to meet supposedly to read the works of Karl Marx, uh, locally in Santa Cruz, but I suspect are or were actually activists, not unlike the democratic socialists who want to destroy American values, liberty, and private property, and replace them with tyrannical central planning state worship through parliamentary Thank you proceedings. for your comment. Okay. Our next uh, member of the public is Jasmine. Welcome. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, I urge you to adopt the empty home tax ordinance tonight. In fact, one of the steps of a city initiative states that you can adopt the ordinance without alteration as opposed to calling an election. And I want to make sure people realize that. The other thing is the empty home tax is so crucial because Santa Cruz is in an affordable housing crisis. I witnessed many coworkers and friends have to move away or survive in vehicles due to the outrageous price of housing here. This impacts our essential workers, including teachers, healthcare workers, childcare providers, and service workers, all of whom we need in our community. As a mental health care worker here, I see members of our community being financially strapped and pushed out of the city. It is unacceptable. And the empty home tax is more than reasonable. I often hear the argument, it's my property, I should be able to do whatever I want. However, given the housing crisis we are in, the good of all people needs to come first. If people can afford a second, third, or other numbered home such that they aren't even occupied a third of the year, certainly they can do their part and pay a tax to allow for more affordable housing. Otherwise, they're restricting housing supply. They're holding housing off the market, which also causes market rate prices to rise, both bad for our current housing crisis. 
Uh, I won't go into how staff's report seemed inaccurate and biased, uh, except to name that. And I would hope they would be consulting with the yes on empty home tax, just as down to our downtown, our future is getting consulted with. And, you know, even with the biased report, there was a net revenue. Thus, this should be a no brainer decision to support it. As long as we can get a funding stream for affordable housing, we should. It may be a smaller dent at first than what we want, but it is going to literally house people who need to be here. It makes all the difference to the individuals and families that will benefit from the extra money that can go toward affordable housing. Again, I implore you to adopt the empty home tax tonight without alteration. There is no reason not to do this and every reason to do it. If you won't adopt the ordinance, at least call for the election to let voters have their say. Thank you. Thank you for your input. The next name is, oh, it just switched. Joy S. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Joy Schendeldecker again. Um, I would just like to echo the comments that the cost estimates seem high and the revenue estimate seems very modest. Um, Donna Myers, Council Member Myers, <clears throat> made a comment earlier that about the Measure F failing and so we need revenue streams and it sounded a little like um, blaming some council members for not supporting that. In, in canvassing for the empty home tax, <clears throat> one of the things that I, one of the questions that I got a lot and I wasn't you know, counseling people on Measure F one way or another, I was just informing them, but when people heard that it was going into the general fund and that it was a sales tax, they were like, oh no, 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 no. It needs to be dedicated funding and and it also needs to be a progressive tax so i really think that people are either themselves hurting or aware that a lot of other people are hurting financially um and you know just regressive sales tax and regressive taxes just aren't going to be very popular with people so i think progressive taxes on wealth any way that we can re redistribute wealth throughout our community and this is a theme with SEIU labor negotiations and core funding wherever we can find ways to redistribute wealth to the people who are doing the the boots on the ground work to make our community run we should do that and I think that voters you know put it to the voters support the tax um, and you know see what people want we think that people will support it thank you Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Bodhi Shargle. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, uh, good evening to the council members, uh, city staff, everyone in attendance. Uh, my name is Bodhi Shargel. I'm a lifelong Santa Cruz County resident uh, speaking with YDSA and the Student Housing Coalition. Um, I'm bummed that the council can't adopt the empty homes tax tonight due to California law. Um, but I think that it's still a very good um, initiative to support. Um, we talk all the time about how extreme of a housing crisis our city's in right now. And here the community has brought the council uh, a fantastic step towards a solution on, on a silver platter essentially. So. While you can't vote to adopt it tonight, I ask that uh, council members support it and endorse it individually going into the November election. Um, additionally, I, I ask that the council um, correct and, or amend the um, fiscal report that grossly over exaggerates expenses and underestimates uh, revenue um, based on you know population. Uh, if, if our costs are proportional to Oakland, we will be, you know, under a hundred thousand dollars. Nowhere close to the amounts estimated. I don't know how a single meeting annually of the oversight committee can can cost one hundred twenty six thousand dollars unless you have, you know, butlers handing out champagne flutes and canapes at the meeting. Um, so I, I think that that deserves at least uh, an explanation for how those numbers were arrived at. Um, and I, I'll reiterate that I ask uh, council members to individually endorse the empty homes tax going into the November election if they believe in, in the American values that we're trying to, to um, improve upon here. You know, the right to 
housing, which is a human right. Uh, housing is an, an integral part of a human's ability to pursue, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is what the empty home tax is all about. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is McLean Watson. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, um, I am a rising sophomore at UCSC and um, I urge you to take action today to publicly support the community driven empty home tax ordinance. Our essential workers, including teachers, healthcare workers, Child care providers and service workers cannot afford to live in our town. We want our neighbors and essential workers to be home. We want community, we want Santa Cruz to be accessible. We deserve to have Santa Cruz be accessible. We want economic diversity, which drives racial and cultural diversity. These are the things that make Santa Cruz special. Please keep the Santa, please keep Santa Cruz vibrant and support the empty home tax today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is phone number ending in 6793. Hello. Hello. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. We heard you for a minute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. My name is Nikki Richard, and I'd like to um, the council to uh, really take a look at the staff estimate of the cost um, for um, the empty home tax measure. As you know, this is something that goes on the ballot. It's very important, and as some of the other people have pointed out, the stakes are very high here um, because we do have an affordable housing crisis in the uh, city of Santa Cruz, and I know that you want to address that and the empty home tax is one way. So some of these numbers, they don't seem to be um, supported. There's really no way even to, you know, dispute them since we don't know how they were arrived at. Like the, the work isn't being shown and that there are other, you know, examples of Oakland um, with a startup cost there. Like why is this estimate so wildly different than that? So those are questions that we depend on our elected officials to to ask city staff and I hope you will ask those questions and get a more realistic assessment of the fiscal impact of this measure and also I want to you know you to keep in mind that a lot of market rate housing is being approved right now and some of you are on record as being you know in favor of maximizing the amount of market rate housing in the city and I view this measure as a way to both, uh, you know, prevent all this new housing being used for pied a terre, or you know, not people using it as a second home, and I want I just want to make sure that if somebody is using their this new market rate housing as a second home in Santa Cruz vacation home, that they are at least paying into affordable housing for uh, our essential workers and other people who need that. So those are my main points. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to ask Vice Mayor Watkins to take over the next um, two hands. I have to step out for a minute. No problem there. All right, our next speaker is Rose Klein, and you are permitted to speak. Go right ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, fantastic. Um, hi, my name is Rose Klein. Again, I am a graduate student um, and resident of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I am a member of the graduate student uh, union and organizer. Um, as uh, I just want to point out that um, Council Member Myers um, very accurately said earlier today um, that unfortunately it is becoming so much more difficult for people to be in California to find safe housing and to find a living wage. Um, I apologize, Council Member Myers, for using your words a little bit, quoting you here. Um, but I think it, you made a very excellent point, right? And, and this is something that is a, a, a huge issue in the state of California, in the United States even. It's sort of the issue of the decade, um, which is why I think this is so important. 
there are a lot of different solutions that people have proposed to um, solving the housing crisis. You know, uh, getting rid of single family uh, housing zoning. Um, and that's a, a thing that I, I would also support. Um, you know, uh, 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 changing around uh, city funding and just generally uh, funding affordable housing. Um, uh, 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 the hotel tax was approved, right, recently by the voters of Santa Cruz. So clearly the voters of the city understand that this city should be built for the people who live here, right? And 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 that the people want better housing in the city. Um, and I think the reason why I'm here really and that I want the empty home tax to succeed is because it is a ready-made solution. It is, as Bodhi mentioned, on a silver platter for all of you. You know, the, the the group behind this has already done the research. If you haven't seen the report, please go to the website. You can just look up empty home tax. Um, we sent you emails. Um, it's a great thing to um, pass. Uh, please, please support it um, uh, and uh, help voters vote for this. Thanks, Morales. I think your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker, which is Aaron, and you're permitted to speak. You can either press star nine on your phone or the raise hand feature in the webinar setting. Good evening, council members. My name's Erin Toomey. Um, I've lived here in Santa Cruz for 23 years and am, I'm, I, I, I'm a homeowner. I'm also a clinical social worker who works for the VA supported housing program here in Santa Cruz. Over the years, I've observed, you know, my neighbors, people I work with who have lost their homes, have either left or ended up without a home here. Since I've been in Santa Cruz, the number one thing elected officials talk about is increasing low income housing. And yet mostly what has happened has been increasing market rate housing. Most often the reason for not building low income housing is that it doesn't pencil out. The money raised by the empty home tax could help to fill that gap. Even the lowest estimated annual review, 2.5 to 4 million by your own report, by the, by the staff's report, could go a long way to fill that gap in funding for low income housing. The empty home tax is a very reasonable ballot measure. The threshold is very low. A home has to be empty more than eight months to pay the tax. If someone can afford to leave their home empty for more than eight months a year, I believe they can afford to help support building more housing for our lowest income residents. You all have talked constantly about supporting the creation of low income housing, and we are handing you part of the solution. I hope you will do your part and publicly support the empty home tax today. Thank you for your time. Comments? Our next speaker is Joe Thompson. And Joe, you can go ahead and either press star nine or unmute yourself. Great. Thank you, council members. I know this has been a long meeting, um, especially for y'all. But thank you again for taking the time to talk about these important issues for the city. Uh, my name is Joe Thompson. I am a UCSC student heading into my sophomore year member of YDSA and the Student Housing Coalition. Um, and I'm here today to, to talk to you guys about the home tax and why I think you and most community members here are supporting it. Um, it's a great ballot measure that is community driven. Not only was students a large process and part of collecting signatures and supporting this measure, uh, but when I was talking to community members, uh, doing some door-to-door -door canvassing, we actually were knocking on someone's door um, while they were getting evicted and they immediately sign the petition because they know that the city is facing an affordable housing crisis. And when we were talking to them about the issues that we're facing in the city, it's very clear that the city is not doing enough to address the affordable housing crisis. And it's affecting renters, it's affecting homeowners, and it's affecting students. And it's an issue that we can all agree upon that we need to build more affordable housing. Just the question is, how do we do that? And that's why we have the empty home tax. This tax is a very small tax and large of it um, that is going to be placed on homeowners who aren't in their home for more than eight months out of a year. So it's a very, very modest tax on the people who have second homes, vacation homes, investment properties um, that actually help not only alleviate the affordable housing crisis in Santa Cruz, but throughout the region. And that's why we need to adopt the empty home tax is because it will actually help pointing out that, you know, these, these issues are affecting everyone. It's not only just going to be affecting renters, but it's going to be affecting longtime hunters across the entire city. And not only did we get people who were homeowners to sign the petition, but 
essentially everyone we talked to about it wanted to sign because they they believe that the city is not doing enough to actually address the concerns for low income affordable housing. Um, in my hometown in Lincoln, California, me and my mom live in a low income apartment housing complex that was built a few years ago. And as someone who has dealt with housing insecurity for most of their entire life, I think that most council members can agree that this is an issue that really impacts everyone. And Santa Cruz having the highest homeless rate per capita in the entire country is something that we really need to start addressing. This is a crisis. And when we say crisis, it has to be an emergency crisis. This empty home tax is just the first step in alleviating this crisis and actually going oh, to address I'm sorry to all these problems. I, I couldn't hear the buzzer in it, and I think your time is up. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Okay. And our next speaker has phone number ending in 6959. This is Lynn Renshaw with Santa Cruz Together, and I have, um, regarding this item, we understand that the council has the option to assign a person or committee to submit the argument against the empty homes tax, the HT initiative. As an experienced and organized campaign committee, we respectfully request the council designate Santa Cruz Together as the authorized group to file the arguments against the ballot measure. We submitted a letter making this request and that's all, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Our next caller is phone number ending in 1705. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I support affordable housing as all the callers uh, previously do. And if Santa Cruz had a uh, large vacancy rate, I think in some sort of empty home tax would be appropriate to consider. I think anyone who has any ounce of intellectual honesty knows that there's nowhere near nine or 10% vacant homes in Santa Cruz. <coughs> The EHG proponents are completely dishonest. You can start with Ms. Stockton's opening statement where she claims that 6,000 voters signed her petition. Well, in fact, over 2,000 of those were invalid signatures, but she repeats that lie. As far as her 9% vacancy figure, she now they used to claim the census. Now they're claiming the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance gets its numbers from the census. And the census number, that's a point in time count. That's very different from the empty home tax, which is a year round vacancy. It's completely apples to oranges. When, you, when you're talking about a point in time count, that's any given unit at that point in time. That has nothing to do with whether that unit is vacant for eight months or more. So you're using bad metrics. The city has an ordinance that prohibits condominium conversions if the vacancy rate is less than 5%. Staff estimates the current vacancy rate of multi-residential properties is one to 2%. And once again, that's a rolling vacancy rate. That's not a year round vacancy rate. So the empty home tax, it's not gonna raise significant amounts of money for affordable housing. What this is, is a play by the proponents to deflect attention from their own culpability in the housing crisis because they're the same folks who vote against every single affordable housing and not and market rate housing program and to point it at a tiny minority this is a scapegoat measure they're they're trying to blame this your non has, population your that doesn't live has, in santa cruz for housing problems they have nothing to do with there are very very your few, time is up the buzzer um, rang thank you our next speaker is Spencer Holmes. Welcome. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Spencer Holmes. Uh, I am a graduate student at UCSC uh, and I'm calling to support the empty home tax uh, as the majority of people have called in to support. Um, as other people have stated, um, this tax is 
only going to affect a very wealthy minority in the community. These aren't just homeowners in a notoriously very expensive uh, housing market, but these are people who own multiple homes who don't even live here. So I'm assuming that they can afford a tax to create housing that will be used for people who will live here. And I guess an additional point I want to pose is that if they're, and as other people have noted, this is a crisis. This is a uh, overwhelming crisis for the working class people who live here. And if it continues like this, something has to break eventually. There's going to be a moment where the working class people who run the stores or who uh, are teachers or childcare workers cannot afford to live here anymore. And then what is going to happen then if we just still have uh, these empty homes that aren't being used and not being taxed? Um, this is just one step in creating a more equitable Santa Cruz where people can live and actually thrive. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've just seen firsthand uh, what this struggle is like just for students that try to live here. It's a constant struggle of uh, every quarter or for some people, they have to find a new living situation. Uh, and this just isn't conducive for people to, yeah, thrive and live here in a comfortable sense. And instead it's catering towards a wealthy minority of people where it's instead we can put the funds to create something that will, uh, ultimately be more equitable and for Santa Cruz in the long run. Um, I don't really have anything more sophisticated to say about the, ta uh, about the tax other than that I support it, but I hope you I urge the council to uh, consider it and enact it uh, as soon as they can. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Pablo Velasquez. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi, my name is Pablo Velasquez. I've spoken here before. I used to be a UCSC student. Now I'm just a regular renter in the city of Santa Cruz. I'm here to speak on behalf of the MP Homes Tax in support of the measure and to ask the city council to at least endorse the measure itself, even if you can't adopt it today. I think it just makes logical sense to not defend the wealthy minority who don't spend the whole year in Santa Cruz. Like, myself included with many other students and many people who work here in Santa Cruz and provide to the economy of Santa Cruz. It just makes sense to actually not only have the wealthy minority to pay their fair share for houses that they don't even occupy throughout the year, but as well, it makes sense to help support the working class within Santa Cruz. As well, I asked the city council to re-examine the starting cost that seems to be grossly overestimated. It doesn't seem really like logical that that would be the starting cost for a city of our size. And I also am not understanding why there's some callers defending people who don't even live in Santa Cruz. It doesn't really make sense to me. And it wouldn't even with this tax, it wouldn't really affect them personally. So I I would just ask the city council to at least show support if you do care for the working class of Santa Cruz and to really, if you actually support ending this housing crisis, even though this may not be the permanent solution, it is a start in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Whitney Ramos. Hi, I'm Whitney Ramos, policy manager with the Santa Cruz County Business Council. I'm here to express our support for the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project. Specifically tonight, we support and respectfully request your I vote on item 41's motion part three to amend the May 24th council direction related to a report on the impacts of the DOF initiative. We believe extending the deadline benefits the community by giving the study appropriate time to evaluate the potential impacts of the measure, including and beyond stopping the downtown library and affordable housing project to immediately prevent at least 100 units of affordable housing from being built. Santa Cruz faces a housing shortage that affects workers at every level of the economy. Santa Cruz County Business Council member Fortress and Flourish is an HR strategist company they shared a story with me that highlights one of the economic impacts of our housing shortage. 
a Fortress and Flourish client went through their whole interview hiring process to find their best fit candidate. When they did, the company and the new employee were both so excited to move forward. But when the new hire tried to find a place to live for this new job opportunity, they were completely unable to find somewhere to live due to the high demand and low amount of housing here. The new hire had to rescind their acceptance of the offer, putting the company behind on filling the position and losing out on that talent. And it affects more than businesses when they're hiring. It affects companies able to retain the talent they already have, high school graduates deciding to stay local or move away, and our college graduates taking local positions or using their degrees somewhere else. More housing, both affordable, like the downtown library and affordable housing project and market rate, helps make Santa Cruz a better place to live and work with more vibrant communities and businesses. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Zenon Uliati Crow. Hi, Council. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Zenon Uliati Crow. I'm president of the Student Housing Coalition and a strong supporter of the empty homes tax. Um, a few calls back, uh, someone was talking about how you know the empty homes tax is being used as some sort of herring for the actual issues and i actually disagree with that i think that the empty homes tax is a serious part of a whole host of things that we need to be doing to combat the housing crisis because we only have a crisis when everything goes wrong and in order to solve a crisis everything needs to go right and i think that the empty homes tax is a huge part of that just as is building more affordable housing building more market rate housing Things like rent control these are all part of the bigger picture and i really implore the council to view the empty homes tax and personally as council members endorse this initiative as it is a bigger part of that puzzle and really represents an issue that we can work forward on together as something we can all collaborate around especially going into the november election so again i really want to reiterate my support for the empty homes tax and ask you all to personally endorse it thank you Thank you for your input. Our next uh, member of the public is Kyle Kelly. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Here we go. Okay, sorry, I had to pull up the side of the road. I'm on a bike. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I just wanted to state my own support for the empty homes tax. Uh, I do want to point out to folks, and I think it's important that uh, people recognize that really there, there's two outcomes uh, for somebody who's going to pay for um, effectively a, a vacancy tax or, you know, whether it's on their second home or whatever, or if they've been land banking, is that it'll cause either them to pay the tax or to put other homes back on the market. So it'll cause turnover for market rate homes. Um, Admittedly, I think that's that's great. It's going to provide some more options that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, uh, I think we, we've seen good amounts of success in Oakland, um, and I do applaud the the signature gatherers, the uh, those that have proposed this initiative, um, because it, it it actually went uh, after really where most of our uh, empty second homes really are, um, which is a lot of the single family homes closer to the beach. Um, I know for my community, for, for other people, that they feel like their communities have actually been hollowed out, right? That there's not, there's not families nearby, there's not people living nearby because they're, they're living with a bunch of really homes that get used as vacation homes. And I understand that for beach community, but I think it, it does really make things tough if, um, if there's not enough housing for everyone um, and, if, and if some are, are left this way. And I think especially when you look at the uh, you know, how we do property taxes within the state of California, um, the only way to get back some of that revenue is to have a, is to have um, a house get transferred to someone else. They purchase it or whatever else. Uh, and so doing this helps claw back some of that money that we're not getting otherwise, that somebody can hold in perpetuity. Um, so I, I just want to kind of point out some other things. I don't, I don't know if everybody's kind of looked at this for, for their own analysis, but um, I, do, I do want people to kind of have a reasonable policy debate about this uh, and think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. 
Hi. Uh, so, you know, of course, you probably know me at this point. I support the empty home tax. Uh, I just want to be very clear, though, about this whole city staff impact report issue. I feel like it's not minor and it shouldn't be glossed over. I called in several weeks ago when this impact report was first being requested, and I said I had concerns about city staff being uh, biased in how they did their impact report. And the reason for that is because in 2019, I worked with Council Member Cummings and others to develop a very detailed request for a rental increase and notice to quit tracking ordinance. And so this is something we kind of came up with after the failure of rent control to hopefully give us some more information about how to move forward. But then what staff came back with was a voluntary data collection program, which obviously ruins the policy by introducing significant selection bias into the data collected. And so here we are today, staff has given us an impact report for empty home tax that includes estimates like $100,000 for a single meeting and the notion that this would require its own dedicated web portal. And I mean, as someone as a, who's a professional software developer, I just think this is outrageous and honestly embarrassing. I mean, you know, this is an executive branch who's supposed to be unbiased, who are supposed to trust to like give us real data to like implement things in a like honest way. And this is just so shamelessly uh, just not accurate, biased, like bloated. I mean, this it's just sadly more evidence that we can't trust city staff to treat progressive public policy fairly. Um, and it's absolutely council's responsibility to correct this bias before this impact report goes into the record. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is phone number ending in 0249. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. This is Carol Polhama. How are you? Um, I oppose the empty home tax for a variety of reasons, and I won't repeat the ones that have already been stated, but I would like to make a few points. The data, first of all, I think the staff report did a did, was a pretty reasonable job considering all the moving parts. And I appreciate that they took a stab in what they thought was possible. I actually thought their vacancy estimates were very high. I've conducted my own research over the last six months and I've talked to the housing authority. I've gone through the HUD figures. I've looked at the census data. I've looked at the rental data that somebody posted a few weeks back. And I've looked at the short-term vacation rental data. My estimate is that there may be 1.7% vacancy rate, which boils down to about 100 homes. So that's my, uh, my own personal vacancy rate data. A lot of people mention empty homes on West Cliff, except that short-term vacation rentals, which is what most of those homes are, are specifically excluded from the empty home tax. I'm concerned about the bureaucracy. I feel like even uh, the staff report didn't highlight this enough. Only 15% of the cost of running this program can come from the proceeds. The rest will come from the general fund. And as we heard earlier when talking about the core situation, our general fund is in trouble. Our sales tax didn't pass and we're, we don't, aren't in a position to pay $600,000 for the first year of running this program which is what the staff estimate is. On top of it, personally, I have concerns about privacy. I'm not into a big brother situation where I have to report to the city every year how many days I was home. That's nobody's business. This will be hard to change. It'll require another election. And lastly, my cousin lives in Vancouver. Thank you, that's your time. Year... Okay, our, thank our you. Our next caller, thank you for your input, is phone number ending in zero or seven zero zero three. Good evening, uh, Darius Mosinin here again. Uh, look, I'm a landlord. A lot of folks know that I'm also a tenant as well. And I see both sides. Okay. So, and also I'm just an average citizen who knows how to want, knows his way around Excel. And uh, you've seen my work. I hope you read my last recent letter. Um, 
I took actual assessor database. I did pretty much what the city did, assessor data, the assessor database, looking for the absentee parcel. Cross correlated that with the city's own rental inspection database, eliminated those. Cross correlated it with the SDR, short term rental database, removed those 308 that were there. Cross correlated with the ADUs as reported by the assessor database. I think there's 80 or 100 of those. I ended up with 583 potential par par parcels that have absentee owners not in any previous category. Well, and I and I, one thing I and the, the city came up with their report came up with like what 487. So we're in the same ballpark for their methodology. One thing they did though is they took, made an estimate of those homes that are rented. Well, it turns out the majority of those 583 homes are actually rented because they don't have to self-report to the rental inspection database. I know of many homes that are have active renters that are never inspected because A, the rental inspection programs aren't vigilantes going and looking for them. Now, on another note, I sent a month ago this database to all of the supporters of the empty home tax saying, help us out. Let's all work on this together. Let's go. Here's a walking map organized by streets of these empty homes I have found, these parcels I have found. Let's work together. Let's go and take your 140 volunteers that, that gather signatures, send them out and have them look and inspect homes. I went through mail, I did it, went through mailboxes even looking for evidence of emptiness. Thank you for your input. Our next caller has phone number ending in 3485. Hello, my name is Caitlin Gaffney, and I'm a 23-year resident of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm also a homeowner and a parent of two teenage children, um, and I know that my children and their friends will never have the opportunity to live in Santa Cruz uh, or own a home in Santa Cruz, at least, um, as my husband and I have been fortunate to do. The crisis in housing affordability is facing California and Santa Cruz in particular can feel uh, very, very overwhelming and disempowering. Uh, but this is one specific practical step that we can take in the right direction. I urge you to support the empty home tax and put it on the ballot so the voters of Santa Cruz can decide. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Joe Thompson. Our next member of the public is Portia Lewis. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, um, thank you so much for taking my comment and for sitting through all of our comments. We appreciate your time. Um, I just wanna say I'm a supporter of the Student Housing Coalition, a community member and an employer whose job is actually funded through families in transition. So I just wanted to make a comment that you just uh, defunded my employer for the next year. So side note, but also I do support the empty home tax and I um, would strongly like to see that on the ballot in November. Um, it did not, you know, go past me that in the same conversation where we're looking for funding um, to fund programs, you know, to build affordable housing, we're, discussing whether or not we should be creating those funding sources. And I just want to highlight that and strongly support that we do create those funding sources to fund the programs that our city needs, but to also fund the affordable housing that our city um, desperately also needs for our community and for the people that live here, including myself. So thank you so much. And thank you for your time. Thank you for calling in our next member of the public is Lisa. Hi. Uh, this city has failed time and time again to make this a place where its workers who fuel this city's economy can actually afford to live. We as a community have declared that by taxing the people who are rich enough to have an empty million plus dollar home in this town, 
we can start to actually build the affordable housing that our working class needs. This is something that this, that cities across the state and even within our own county have also realized that we need. We just listened to you all during the previous agenda items, struggling to find out how to find the funds to support the community. This is doing that work for you. Even looking at the conservative numbers that the city's reports have measured, this will create uh, two and a half to four million dollars in revenue every year versus the four four hundred thousand estimated costs. This is going to fund building affordable housing. Even the staff said that if this comes out with a positive revenue, that this will be a good thing for this city. There are families, coworkers, children, our neighbors that are being forced out of this city. Clearly, this provides a positive revenue to affordable to affordable housing. And if folks don't want to pay the tax, they can just rent it out and help alleviate the housing crisis that way. But any way that you look at this, empty homes are hurting our city and we need this tax to help our community. I urge you all to come out publicly and support this tax to help our city. Though honestly, who are we kidding? Santa Cruz Together is bankrolling most of your campaigns, so we know exactly how you're going to come out on this no matter what. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Sabrina. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon. Um, I would just like to say that, of course, like much else of the public, I am in support of the empty homes tax. But really what I want to want to talk to y'all about is uh like your stance and your position right we've heard this city for years and years and years say that um houselessness is like the number one issue of santa cruz and yet every year it gets worse and worse and worse what are y'all doing about it you know you say the money's not there we just gave you money we just we just we just said hey here's a great possible solution um and it's interesting to me that the funds can't be found when things like the police budget get increased it's real interesting to me um so what i think like we should we should all you know implore think about is if this comes out and y'all do not support the empty homes tax, which is a very simple, easy way to essentially tax the rich uh, so that less and less people are getting shoved out of their homes, shoved onto the streets, shoved into houselessness, which is what's happening. I hate to break it to you. It is happening every single day. Um, if y'all still don't support it, can you just say it with your chest? Can you just be honest to the public that you do not care about the working class? You do not care about people in poverty? You know, like, can we just be honest in, in how we how we represent ourselves on the city council? Because it's really a no brainer. And the fact that this estimate came out that was like so grossly uh, inaccurate and and it just seems insidious like it seems insidious it seems biased it seems gross especially because like we're supposed to trust you you know people vote you in like you have constituency you are responsible thank you for your input thank you have a good one thank you our next member of the public it looks like hunter gizamon um hi can you guys hear me yes hello okay yeah um We lost you. Try again. Oh, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, it's always nice to see a lot of turnout from the community and just so many people passionate about this beautiful place you call Santa Cruz. So um, I don't have much to say. I'm going to keep it short and sweet, but I would like the city council to consider supporting um, the empty homes tax, at least putting it forward to voters, because this is an issue that a lot of people are really passionate about. And I'd love to see the community continue to have dialogue on this issue, um, especially with like the potential changes in the environmental impact report and everything. I just really want to see this 
go forward to voters and um, also some support from the city council. So thank you for your time and um, yeah. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Sabina Holber. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, good evening, City Council. My name is Sabina Holber. Um, I'm calling in support of the empty home tax. Um, I think that it's common sense. I think that if you're looking for funding, this is where you get funding. It's not a lot of money for people that own such expensive houses that they're leaving empty. Um, also, I want to address talking about the general fund. Um, you guys aren't great at spending money. Like, out of the $14 million that you got for homelessness issues, you're giving a half a million dollars to consultants instead of to people that really need it. For instance, 41 seniors were just evicted on Friday um, and were given backpacks and told to go to the bench ones. So you're not helping people. Like, literally, <laughs> sorry, I'm out of breath. I was watering my garden. I ran inside so I could talk to you guys. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I implore you not to give that space to Santa Cruz together. As other callers have mentioned, they're bankrolling a lot of campaigns here, specifically Shebra Kalantari Johnson, who voted for OVO, who voted for CSSO. The people that run Santa Cruz together have so much money. They, they, they back you guys. Um, they want to keep that money. And you know how they made that money? They profited off of the housing crisis. They are folks that are realtors. They are folks that are property managers. They have terrible reviews when you go look to see how they maintain their properties. No wonder they don't want to have to pay any taxes for empty homes. They want there to be a housing crisis so they can continue to jack up the rents. So giving a gift to Santa Cruz together to have this on the ballot, it's straight from your campaigns. It, it should be considered a campaign contribution. Uh, thanks for your time. Please vote for the empty home tax. Thank you for your input. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Okay, we have an in-person. Please step to the podium and make sure the mic is at your mouth. Hi there, I'm Cynthia Matthews and I'm speaking this evening representing a recently formed campaign committee known as Santa Cruz for Real Library and Housing Solutions. We've been formed specifically to support the onward progress of the proposed new library and affordable housing project for downtown Santa Cruz and to oppose the ODOF initiative. Contrary to what a previous speaker said, ODOF is far from straightforward. We believe that many of those signatures were gathered with uh, incomplete, misleading, or inaccurate sound bites. But the fact remains, they got their signatures, they qualified, and um, uh, your job tonight is to uh, set that for election. We understand that. We think their proposal is based largely on conjectures, ideas, without substance or stakeholder consultation. And if passed, ODOF will be truly damaging to the future of Santa Cruz. It will put back any progress on a downtown library for several years and result ultimately, if passed, on a library that's smaller and inferior. It will kill a project currently in, develop, in development with trusted community partners for 125 units a permanently affordable housing for low income residents. It will kill other investments in the project that benefit the surrounding downtown area that contribute to our community for current and future needs, including, I should say, other affordable housing projects in the immediate downtown area that depend on this project for support, including replacement parking for parking currently being lost to other development and street parklets and a child care center. For all these reasons, we think ODOF is damaging to the future of Santa Cruz and our campaign will be fighting it. Uh, relative your, to your proposal, we ask that you designate our committee to be the uh, official signer for arguments against the ODOF um, 
uh, measure, and we uh, we support your um, Thank you. extension your of the um, uh, deadline for your report. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just take a breath. <laughs> Thank you for everyone's public comment and input. It looks like that concludes our virtual and in-person public comment on uh, agenda item number 41. I will now bring it back to uh, our city council and I'm um, looking for a motion, action, discussion, questions. I have many questions. Great. And I have Great, Council Member Brown. And did you have your hand? Council Member Cummings. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, um, I w first I wanna appreciate, I'm, I'm gonna speak primarily about the empty home tax um, fiscal analysis. <coughs> um, and I wanna appreciate Marisol for uh, taking on this task. I know it's not easy to uh, try to come up with something that um, is, it projects uh, an unknown process um, and not a lot of uh, experience from other communities to draw from. I, I'm sorry to hear that you didn't get more information from some of the other jurisdictions that have adopted these about their costs because I think that it would have been really helpful um, in for you and for all of us to see um, an analysis that was based, um, I think, less on. Um, well, it's a, it's a real it's a Cadillac budget. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, so I, um, but I, I understand that there it was probably not easy to um, come up with the the various pieces of this, and so I, I appreciate the um, the effort and I appreciate the transparency. Um, I do have. Because this is now a public uh, document, and I um, am quite sure it will be used by um, opponents of the measure to, um, you know, to, to as a, you know, deterrent, uh, you know, as a message to voters that it's going to cost millions of dollars, and you know we can't afford it. Um, and, and so I just I don't feel comfortable even receiving uh, this report without. Um, better understanding some of these items and so it's going to be a little tedious I'm sorry but I'm gonna have to I have to ask these questions um, I think that this needs to go into the record as well um, so the and I, I have many <laughs> questions about some of the little items I'll try to not I don't want to be um, keep us here for forever but I do want to try to get an understanding here I mean I'm, I'm seeing um, for so in the startup costs I'm seeing some things that are, um, I guess I just, I'm just wondering how, you know, if, what the basis is for this. I mean, I, so for example, um, uh, revisions to the website at almost $40,000. Um, how, how, how did you get the number of hours for that? Um, that's a lot of money to, um, revise the city's website, which is quite extensive. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how, where that came from. Um, I can ask them all if there's somebody who can answer them or try to take a, <laughs> take a stab at answering them. Um, I can, is that, would that be, be, would you prefer that, Marisol, that I just go through and ask them all? Um, and then maybe one by one might be okay. better. Okay. Um, Mayor Bruner, do you have um, a preference? That's fine, thank you. So yeah, um, website forty. You know, we've got quite a quite a large budget for uh, revising our website for the empty home tax. So for, how, how, forty plus thousand dollars. Yes. So um, the hours um, were estimated based on talks with um, with. Uh, some consultants who have done uh, ordinance um, implementation before. Um, so I base those estimates on, on there and discussing. So it's not just 
the, the physical, okay, we're changing this. It's all the discussion that goes into what needs to be changed, what pages, what links. Um, but the hours were based on um, consultation with, um, with external parties. Okay, um, and so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna guess that that's what I'll hear when I ask about many of these other items. Yes. Um, so I won't go through them all, but um, I, I guess I'm, well, okay, so then I have a, I'll, I'll just go on to some of my other questions and try to and re reformulate um, on the others. But um, I, so in terms of the, the um, estimated cost for the ongoing committee, this $126,000 for one meeting per year, um, that you know is coupled with some narrative earlier on in the report uh, talking about how this could be a thousand hours, this could be you know many many meetings. Um, however, the 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 language in the ballot initiative says that the committee would meet once per year more than once per year would require council approval. So I guess I'm just wondering, um, are you, you're assuming that the council would just allow for whatever this committee wanted to do? Um, um, so there, there are some estimates made there um, um, on the committee. So I, I don't assume the council will approve anything the committee wants. I assume there will be a discussion, but also as part of the proposed measure, there are also um, community meetings that were discussed and it's not really clear whether that those community meetings are part of uh, that one meeting uh, that would need to be um, added to additional meetings per council. Um, so it, there was some assumption that we'd have more meetings than just the one. Okay. Um, uh, may I ask, did you happen to consult with the Regional Transportation Commission about their measure D taxpayer oversight committee? Uh, that is what this was modeled upon and it's a very different um, uh, structure than uh, standing ongoing commissions. And so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if we did provide that information to potentially to ask them what their costs are. I didn't do that because I thought that would probably happen through staff and it doesn't appear to have happened, but I, so I just want to clarify, did you talk with the RTC about their? No. Okay. Um, yeah, because it's, it's, I think that would give you a little more clarity on what, um, what the potential costs are, uh, you know, might be. Um, I'm going to go back to the litigation item. Um, I heard you say that ordinances generally have to go through legal review and that an esti a, a reasonable estimate is $100,000. And so I, I just want to try to understand that because I've never heard that. I've, I've been here and <laughs> voted yes and voted no on many an ordinance. We've never been told it costs $100,000 <laughs> for, to, um, you know, for legal, potential legal risk. Um, so I'd just like to hear more about that. Do you want me to comment on that? Sure, thank okay. you. I, I wasn't part of making that estimate, but um, I, I think I can step in here. So um, yeah, so the, the estimate was $100,000. I can tell you that if there actually was litigation, it would probably be, be more than that. $100,000 is a pretty low estimate for any litigation. So I, I think that estimate was taking, um, was estimating that there might not be litigation, there might, $100,000 might be a reasonable estimate. And I would also just um, point out the fact that this is a tax, and so we could also have um, taxpayers challenge, and that has happened before in our office, for example, challenging the TOT. And so that might not even be a full-blown attack to the ordinance, but it might be um, a legal challenge that's put in the way of, well, this is unlawful as applied to me, and those can also get to be expensive. Um, and so, and, you know, it's, you know, litigation's notoriously hard to estimate how much it's going to be. I think if there is litigation, it's going to be more than 100,000, um, but I think 100,000 is a reasonable number, you know, to estimate. So, um, okay, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll follow up on that question with another question related to legal. Um, on what basis 
were you determining the likelihood of a lawsuit? Uh, you know, it, I guess I'm, I'm just still having a hard time wrapping my mind around factoring that in. We never do that. We get sued on ordinances all the time. We've got, you know, I, well, you know, we know. Um, and we don't talk about that as a cost related to uh, that work. And um, so I'm, I'm still just trying to wrap my mind around that. And I, I just disagree, I guess. Um, but I, I would like to hear what work went into uh, um, evaluating the potential for a legal challenge, given that, um, like, like, did you find other jurisdictions who were saying, well, you know, we got sued, or, you know, we were being told we're going to get sued. You know, we, it, it, like, what evidence is there that there's a legal challenge in the making here? I mean, the, the, the attorneys who reviewed this were, are, are, are experts at <laughs> what they do and, um, and, and worked very hard to um, craft an ordinance that would pass legal muster. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just not, I guess I'm a little more sanguine about the potential for a legal challenge. Um, but mostly I just want to understand why it, we would build that in when it's, you know, what, where, ha, what's the likelihood and, and what was the methodology for determining that likelihood? Thank you. Um, so I did uh, consult with our legal team as well as outside counsel just to talk about um, a, a new measure in general. Um, and they mentioned some of uh, the potential litigation for that. But not only that, that this is a um, something that we are, um, you know, there's not a lot of cities doing this, a lot of California cities yet. And that was more of the basis is to um, and I think you're right, Sandy, that these types of things are not discussed. And um, with in the discussions with the budget and, and listening in on the budget team and just having, just knowing where we are, um, we thought it would be best to have that potential cost uh, listed here. Um, and whether or not council wants to accept the report or amend the report with, you know, for that item, I think definitely defer to you guys. Uh, but I did want to present um, what we felt would be a potential cost. Uh, thank you. I, uh, did, I have more questions, so I'm just going to keep going. But if you have. Uh, if I may uh, just chime in real quick, Councilmember Brown, and I appreciate um, uh, the questions. So as Marisol was mentioning, this is still a rel relatively novel program. There's only a couple other cities that have them in place, and even in those jurisdictions, are relatively new and not in full swing because of delays related to the pandemic uh, and challenges that we've all been facing. So um, I think these are numbers that reasonable people can debate on either side, and you know Marisol's efforts to to try to put some best guesses as to what the numbers may look like. We really, the truth is, won't have a full understanding until we get to a place where um, we have we have the program um, in full swing and we get a better handle on what properties really do qualify as, as empty. And then of that of those, the percentage that we're really successful in being able to collect um, the, the tax that's contemplated in the initiative. So what was brought forward is so our best attempt at that, uh, the committee uh, time that's devoted and reflected in that cost table is also a guess based on the number of responsibilities that are contemplated in the initiative beyond just having the annual meeting. That includes community outreach meetings, subcommittees, uh, reports, analyses that could be ordered uh, throughout that process, the annual report. So trying to take all of them into account and, and look at other examples. Um, you know, my, my time in Watsonville, we had an oversight committee that uh, for a time was meeting more than four times a year um, and that can ebb and flow. So without really knowing, we had to we had to assume that some of that additional work would take place beyond just an annual um, an annual meeting. That's in totality what's reflected in uh, what is still a, a relatively new idea and um, some best guesses based on those those assumptions. You'll notice that I'm not asking questions about uh, your analysis of the potential revenues. I'm, I'm not even going to go there because I get it that it, there's a lot of unknown and um, people can, people have done their own studies but um, and have diff different ideas about what that might look like. I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to keep asking about costs. Um, so, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to make a recommendation that the that, um, staff return to us to give us um, uh, updated information about the potential costs for an oversight committee after speaking with the 
Regional Transportation Commission about their Measure D Oversight Committee. I, I just think that um, we'll have a very different picture if we can actually get a picture of what the what the likely um, uh, level of activity will be for that that committee. Um, I see multiple line items related to um, vetting and um, developing a, a process or a set of principles, I can't remember the, the, what the term was, for um, how vetting the, 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 how the money will be spent. And, um, and so I guess I'm wondering how you see that in relation to, um, I mean, the, the funding will go to affordable housing. It'll go into the affordable housing trust fund. And so the cost seems very high to develop a system, monitor a system um, that is essentially going to be putting money into the affordable housing trust fund for the city council to determine how it will be used. Um, so I, um, if I could just hear a little bit more about that, there's like three, there's multiple line items. And because we don't have this in spreadsheet form, I can't tell you what rows they are, but I can try to find the titles. Um, but just the, in general, I see um, and I'm sorry because it's, I really need a magnifying glass for this, but um, uh, uh, develop process for vetting use of funds. And I see um, for that one, vetting the use of funds, I think that's like seven, 18,000. Um, uh, and then ongoing every year, there's one other place I can't find, but I'll, so the, another one was um, Council Member. I'm Brown. sorry. Um, pro, so yeah, I'm sorry. But I'm, this is really challenging, but I, I I'm, an, I'm very serious about this because this is on the record now, and if this council is going to uh, uh, accept this report, that is the number that's going to be used throughout this campaign. We will not be involved in that, but I'm serious about this. So, so. the motion, um, the recommended motion is to receive the report yeah. and, and to certify the signatures and put okay. them on the ballot tonight. I'm, so receiving I'll the, the, I'll move well, the recommendation. I can, um, I, I, I'm, I still have the floor. Um, and does I'd like that to, mean that I can stop asking the questions and I'll just make the motion and based upon my assertion that this is a wild overestimate. But I think I should be able to ask the questions about how these costs were, how it was decided by staff that this is a potential cost. I think I have, I have the right to ask that. Yes, you do. And I have a clarifying question. I Thank just you. want to clarify. Receiving the report, does that um, mean that codifies the report as accurate. I mean, I, I, I almost think that, um, you know, there's a lot based on public input and based on council member Brown's questions, some of the emails we received, some of the questions I asked earlier, there are a lot of questions on these estimates in the report. And so the feeling of receiving it does that mean it's accepting that those numbers are accurate? Because there's clearly still a lot of refinement and unknowns, and so I just want to clarify what that means to receive the report. <coughs> Count, um, uh, City for, for the elections code, I um, when I drafted the agenda report for the elections code, it is you guys provide a direction for staff to present to you the fiscal impact report, and that is what the code specifies that it they are presenting it to you it is not a matter of you accepting it you approving it you authorizing it none of that it just, okay that was the direction of them to present it to you so um does that help clarify does that no um, I, I mean it, it 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 clarifies the technical aspect of this but it, it. it doesn't change the fact that the staff report says things like it will co we this will cost six hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't say it might cost that much. This is an outside estimate. 
This is, is you know, it doesn't say that. It says it will cost. Right. Um, is that something we can work on to refine I'd, as we I'd move forward? And um, for I, I have a of, motion in that vein. Oh, great. Um, are there? I I'd love to have you make your motion then, and we can move forward with discussion. Okay. So my um, my motion is to um, for number one to replace receive the fiscal impact report ordered per elections code 9212 for the empty home tax initiative petition to replace that with direct staff to return to the council at the earliest possible meeting with a revised fiscal impact report based upon uh, gathering additional information about potential costs to administer the program in the following, and, and I have, I'd like that to be a general thing, but in particular in the following areas. Um, ongoing committee administration, costs for um, distributing tax funds, and startup costs, sorry, startup costs um, related to the um, online uh, the web portal system. Yeah, the, por the web portal, thank you. I couldn't remember the, the yes, the online web portal. Okay, our items two, three, and four there. Yeah. Great. So we have a motion uh, by Council Member Brown. I'll second that. Can I, sorry, I hate to interrupt. I think there was one thing we didn't do during our staff presentation because of the timing issues, which was um, talk about amended language um, around the uh, empty home tax issue, and I really want to make sure we sort of address that before we're moving deep into motions, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, Bonnie's bringing up the language. So uh, the empty home tax folks uh, gave me a call, and and uh, there were some, there was an inaccuracy in the uh, proposed measure language. So it's. Uh, super important that we correct all inaccuracies. And so I um, went back and forth with them and they suggested some changes and some of them were more stylistic, some of them were more factual, but this is um, what I what we came up with or what I came up with um, listening to their concerns. So let me see, I gotta move my little screen here. Okay. So to just go through some of the changes here uh, as compared to what was um, in your agenda materials. So most important thing to change was, well, first of all, I'll go through it in order. So we changed it to empty home tax because that's the exact language used in the ballot proposal. So singular, so no, not empty homes. Um, and then it's on residences that are in use less than 100 days per calendar year. And so there was a mistake um, uh, in the proposed ballot language. We had that they were vacant 120 days or more. That's not accurate per the language. So um, in the amount of $6,000 per single family residence, $6,000 per parcel with six or fewer units, and $3,000 per year on condominium, condominiums and Residential units, they didn't like the word apartment, so we changed it to residential units with seven or more units with revenue allocated toward affordable housing projects, 15% uh, for administration, and 5% for homeless sanitation services. 
and they wanted a clarification that is sanitation services, which we, which we can do that, um, overseen by a community oversight committee. So that's what we've got there. It can be a challenge to fit everything within the word limits and uh, have proper English, um, but that is what I would propose. Is the maker of the motion amenable to the, that proposed? Yes, and thank you for jumping in on that because I, um, in my zeal to ask the questions, kind of forgot about that piece, so thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay. Mayor, yeah. Mayor I'm not sure how to do this with the down, our downtown, our future, but um, I was hoping to offer some language change to that um, ballot. I'm just not quite sure how we're doing it, if we're taking those as individuals or not. But I was contacted about um, the the description is, there is a uh, incorrect description in what the project is apparently now um, being called. Under which item? One, what, it's two, uh, in the ordinance with the ballot language. Uh, three. Um, it's, it's the other ballot thing on this on this item. It's within the resolution, so it'd be under number four. Um, and so- Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, I'll wait till then. Thank you. Uh, well, are we so, taking it all well, at once or are we-, yeah, I, we can, can you do a, is it maybe a friendly amendment to, because the motion is all, includes all four? That's, That's what I thought. No? We can also separate it if the maker of the motion would, okay. So the maker of the motion would like to separate out number four in agenda item 41. And so your motion that's currently on the floor is items one through three with the direction of staff to return to council with the um, re, 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 re fiscal, uh, a revised fiscal report based on additional gathering of info in particular in the following areas admin costs for distribution of admin costs district costs for distribution of tax funds and startup costs related to online web portal and then also the revised language from the city attorney's office so those are items one through three council member cummings I have um, a friendly amendment to that language. So, um, as it relates to bring, as it relates to bringing back the revised report, um, have it say including but not limited to before the ongoing communication cost or ongoing committee admin cost, et cetera. Just because if there's anything else that needs to be incorporated, it's just it's not limited to those four items. If that makes sense. Yes, you're um, suggesting um, to add in, um, in particular, the following areas. So instead of in particular, including but not including, limited. but not limited to, but not limited to. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. And <clears throat> another friendly amendment would also be to include um, methodology, because that was something that members of the pro uh, the public brought up that they were curious about. You know how was this done, like where did this come from, and so having some kind of methodology about you know, who was consulted, how this was brought forward, I think really helps. Yes, thank you. Great. So what is that friendly amendment on metho methodology or where does that fit in for city clerk to be um, accurate on that? You got it? Great. And that can go like at the end of that whole sentence around including but not limited to. Can we pull up that motion and then go to a roll call vote unless there's further discussion on items one through three before we move on to four. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, are you, are you speaking? You're muted. Sorry, I am speaking. I'd like to hear what the staff has to say about this because I heard from them that it was very general and these were estimates and I'm not quite sure the level of accuracy they anticipate having um, given sort of the content and information they have. So before I take the vote, I'd like to hear their perspective personally. And then I'd like ideally a break because we've been going for like a long, long time. <laughs> Wait. 
After this item, um, yes. Sure, so I appreciate the, the question. Um, I guess, I would, again, I would just say that these are best estimates based on the data we have on hand. So Marisol and our finance team, in consultation with all of our departments, as well as some outside consultants, did their best to estimate, as well as based on our own local experience of supporting committees, commissions, uh, oversight committees, of what time would be involved. I certainly understand Councilmember Brown's concerns and the spirit behind uh, those questions raised. I would describe it as going back to sharpen our pencils on the costs associ associated with those. I don't know whether or not that'll yield reductions in what's currently contemplated in, uh, in the report. I think both on the revenue side and the administrative um, ad administration side, this being basically a brand new program in the state, there's going to be a lot of unknowns and we'll continue to be uh, regardless of additional work uh, that we do to refine those numbers. Um, but, you know, we defer to the will of the council if there's interest in, in wanting us to um, continue to fine tune those numbers, we could certainly do so. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Vice Mayor Watkins? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, yes, I think, you know, I understand that we have before us is sort of just to receive the report. So I'm not sure what that's going to move substantially, but um, yeah. Okay. I think the motion language includes based on gathering of additional information that was suggested. Um, there might be some updates or refinements. Can I just ask for a point of clarification? Are we, uh, is the motion to move items one with your uh, proposed revisions, two and three, and to wait on number four? Okay. Yes. Okay. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Can we have the motion language again? Sorry. Yes, uh, City Clerk will pull that up. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I was actually going to also ask for the motion language because uh, what I'm hearing City Manager Matt Huffaker um, relay is that these are assumptions in general, um, general analysis. We don't have a whole lot of information. It, it doesn't seem like there's going to be much more new information. So we're, we're asking to put this back on a future agenda. Um, but what we were tasked with tonight is to vote to put it on the ballot or not and let the voters decide. So I'm just, um, I'm unclear about what additional information we are looking for. Are we just asking staff to do another analysis because we didn't like what we're seeing? Or uh, it, what I'm hearing from city staff is that there's not much more information out there. So we're just gonna bring it back to city council for us to contemplate when it's, if we vote on it tonight, it goes on the ballot and the city voters will vote on it. So I think, I, and, and, I, and I wonder if, yeah, if Matt Huffaker or somebody, what, what else will we, I guess it's the same question as, as Vice Mayor Watkins. What, what else will we, will, be highlighted how else will we be enlightened and how will it change us putting this on the ballot or not because that's what we are tasked with tonight is to put this and the and the our downtown or futures on the ballot and, and also just to remind my colleagues that we have all been asked and requested to set to to send our very detailed questions ahead of time i understand that we want to ask some of those um for um the public to hear, but you know, pages and pages of questions, which I also have, I send to staff ahead of time. So I'd like to encourage us all to do that. Thank you. I think um, my understanding based on the motion language um, was the information and based on city manager's comment that the an impact report is based on information today and that there was a direction to um, upon additional gathering of information um, for example the RTC measure D oversight committee was one 
um, example of information, additional information that could be looked at to help inform some of the um, fiscal impacts. So um, I think my understanding is um, rather than just receiving it as is, knowing yes, that these are estimates and um, that just a little more refinement um, would be appreciated. I, I just don't understand why we need to be debating this again when this is gonna go before the voters. <laughs> All right, uh, Council Member Brown. So, uh, well, uh, you, thank you, Mayor. Um, you kind of shared um, one example of additional information that could be gathered. Um, the reason that I am asking for this now um, is because it is information that is going to be used in a public electoral campaign to the voters. And if the city says, this is the cost, and people out in the in the public, um, I'm, I can. We know there's going to be a group that is going to oppose this, and they will use that number as the city's numbers, and it is based on incomplete, and I would say um, overestimated projections. Um, I understand that it's necessarily incomplete because there's not a lot of experience here, but there is more information we can get. We can find out how much it costs to the taxpayers for oversight of Measure D, one. We can ask the Economic Development Director if these line items in here that are all, um, the multiple line items that are dedicated to um, multiple departments being involved in making decisions about how this money will be spent, how that interfaces with decision-making around the use of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and why it would be that it's gonna cost this much more for this particular chunk of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Just two examples. I have more um, and I can go on, but um, the, the point is that I would like to get, if we're gonna have a report that lays out the potential costs that it should be as accurate as possible. And it should be based upon the, the I, best information we can get. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brown. And I, I, I think at this point, you know, we'll never have a perfect fiscal impact report. Um, however, it sounds like there are some um, examples of um, more information that could help inform the fiscal impact report before it's um, received. Um, I did have a follow-up comment on that too, which is that um, you know our job is to do the public's work in public. And through public comment today, we heard a number of issues and concerns that were brought up by members of the public. And it's our job to acknowledge those concerns and raise those concerns in a meeting in public. So I understand that we should have as many of our questions answered before the meeting, but there were some questions that came up that I didn't have that came up by members of the public this evening and I'm trying to help get their concerns addressed since that's who we're here to represent. Um, in addition to that, I thought I heard some folks say that there are cities in the Bay that have uh, empty home taxes already. And so it would, would be interested to understand, um, you know, based on their impact reports, because they brought up Oakland, I know that, and I think they brought up a couple other cities. So, you know, there are other examples out there. We're not gonna be the first city in California to do this. Um, and so, you know, being able to have references, if we talk about data and scientific method, just references for where does this information come from, what is it based off of, that helps people understand, so they can go back and look up that information well and see how they can, you know, make their comparisons. Um, and I, I didn't want to belabor this, but at some point I do have a question that is related to this, but not necessarily to this exact topic. Uh, but also um, the motion was, my understanding is within one, two, and three. Yes. It's also to include the, the amended language. Is that correct? Yes, it okay. is. And, the, and, and I think I just want it to be clear for members of the public, we're not delaying this. Like we are deciding on this right now to put this on the ballot. Uh, we can't delay it. So those are all the comments I have on one through three. And Uh, okay, we have uh, a motion that is on the floor, and I think we've had our discussion. May we have a roll call vote? Uh, 
Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. <clears throat> Boulder? Absent. Um, Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Uh, aye. Vice Mayor Watkin? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes six ayes and one absent. Council Member Golder absent. Uh, moving on to um, item number four, and that was Council Member Myers. You had a motion? I, I, I'd be happy to do the motion. Um, I'd like to um, look at the um, one change in the uh, our downtown, our future. Um, which is on page 41.5. Um, the, let's see, it looks like the ballot language is, so the ballot language for the art downtown, our future references prohibit construction of the proposed downtown mixed use library project. And um, as far as I understand, based on the current designs and also um, the beginning of um, receiving public funds that that project is now called the downtown library and affordable housing project. So I would respectfully request that the ballot um, language reflect the actual project name. And so um, I'd be happy to move that uh, the uh, the motion to adopt uh, a resolution or any, an election to be held on November 8, 2022, and consolidating the election for the purpose of atti attaching two measures to the ballot, the empty home tax and our downtown, our future, with the proposed um, change to the ballot language for the empty, for the our downtown, our future. Um, I'd also like to add to this motion. I'm not sure if this is the place to do it. So please correct me, Cassie. I believe um, I see in the staff report, there is mention in the last paragraph that the council may provide guidance on and appoint signers for and against the measures if desired. Um, I did hear a request this evening from the group um, who is a campaign team I think the our, our downtown, our future folks obviously are for their measure and I believe they will be doing their written arguments um, unless the city council member is going to represent that or do that work. Um, but I would like to make a motion that the group, I believe uh, the name is uh, uh, Santa Cruz for real um, library, for real housing and library solutions uh, be uh, able to prepare the argument against the our town, our downtown, our future. And similarly, I believe we received a request from Santa Cruz together, whether folks um, uh, regarding um, being able to file um, and the argument statements for the empty homes tax. So I would add that to the that, to the motion as well. Uh, can, can I have the city attorney's office comment on those? Sure. Um, those all those all sound fine to me. Um, I think that changing the measure language is fine to make it consistent with what it's being referred to currently. And I think it's within the council's jurisdiction to appoint uh, this group to to um, provide the opposition arguments. Um, I would just one thing, and I think this is why I asked the question earlier. So number four talks about adopting a resolution and there's, so there's one resolution in your materials mm -hmm. that's for both the empty home tax right. and the, our downtown, our future. So I know the intent was to include the revised empty home tax language on numbers one through three, but I would ask that you include the revised empty home tax language on number four because okay. it's yep. within the resolution. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Right. So I will do that, yeah. So within the motion, Bonnie, it would be to um, to basically adopt the resolution ordering, ordering an election, solving the election, and then the next part would be um, and um, uh, except, uh, uh, with the addition of um, uh, 
uh, new language for the two for both the uh, empty home tax um, uh, full uh, measure text and the out our downtown our future measure text. Does that work? Okay, Cassie. Can I? I have a clarifying question because the motion before was to change the ballot question for empty homes tax, which is on the resolution. So my understanding was we were adopting the resolution with the last motion in order to make that edit. Sorry, but the resolution is number four on the agenda. It, um, and but the last motion that they uh -huh. just made with the edit to the empty homes tax, I took it as being for the resolution. Oh, yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regardless, I mean, of, regardless of the number on the agenda item. Okay, but the resolution isn't addressed in items one through three, so if you're, I, I would like to have it on both if possible, just because number four is is the resolution, so I wanna make it clear that we're changing the resolution, which is where the ballot question is. Is that okay? Does that make sense, Bonnie? Okay. My Thank question you. is the fact that the motion before was changing the ballot question on the resolution, right? For the empty homes tax, it was you edited it. That's the thing I showed. So, if I make in my motion that it would reflect that the language in the um, the previous motion um, for the empty home tax would be um, reflected in the resolution. Does that work? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Ten hours in, I can. My brain is somewhat working. <laughs> And um, I would just like to make sure that um, the group it, that uh, um, you mentioned, I believe their name is Santa Cruz for Real Library and Housing Solutions as the organization name. Yes, and I believe we received a letter from them. Yeah, I was yes. just looking at that letter. Yes, and then um, I believe we received both a written and a verbal rec. Uh, actually, I think both groups came today and um, Great. have both shown up and talked um, and requested this of the council. And I have not heard from other folks that wish to do this. And so I'd like to um, honor those two groups um, so that they um, can present those arguments. Uh, I'll second the motion. Great. I was just going to ask for a second. Uh, so, uh, Council Member Myers has the motion with a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, and Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask a question related to process, just because I'm. I, this is something I'm unaware of, but when um, when groups submit. Or collect signatures to put items on ballot. Is that generally the process that they can a group can come to city council and ask to be designated as the people who will sign either supporting or opposing arguments? Or how does that usually work? Um, typically, groups would submit arguments. They would submit arg. They don't. Nobody needs to have a designation. If that's what you're asking, are you yeah. talking about the request? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Groups can submit an argument for, or a, typically the argument for are the proponents. They could do an argument against. What we did at the last election was we did like a first come first serve. If there were multiple arguments submitted. Gotcha. For one measure. Okay. I just wanted to be clear because I think with the um, direct elect mayor item, there was multiple groups in the community kind of, you know, talking about who was supposed to that's the one we did the first come first serve. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just wanted to make, I just wanted to make sure that I understand the process correctly and also the members of the public. So I guess for this item, just for clarification and um, maybe I don't know if there's a need for any kind of amend, friendly amendment, but um, my understanding would be that Santa Cruz together and the empty home tax would be the proponent. Well, empty home tax for um, Santa Cruz together against for for the empty home tax measure, and then. The Our Downtown, Our Future, and the, I can't remember the name of the other group, but the Our Downtown, Our Future will be for. for real, um, Santa Cruz for Real. Santa Cruz for Real Library and Housing Solutions. Right, they will be designated as the opposition. And so, 
Is the, if, is that captured in the motion? I guess then I only um, I only designated the two um, groups that spoke for us tonight. Um, Bonnie, I don't know if I need to designate. I did. There was no communication from the other groups. Um, and the way that I read this last uh, sentence here in the staff report was that under the elections code, the proponents of an initiative measure may file a written argument for, so I just assume they would. Um, and the city council or a person or person designated by the city council may submit an argument against. So I, uh, if the council chooses not to file an argument, then any interested person may do so. so um, I am I am acting on the two requests that we did get received where there was um, two groups who approached us and both asked for that involvement in submitting an argument against. So Thank I'm you. happy to, I don't, I don't know if the other groups are going to do the argument for, so I, I don't want to speak for them because, um, but it does say that, um, so I don't know. I'm happy to. I mean, I, 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 I'd be happy to add them if if that's what needs to happen. But I uh, think you're going off of the requests received, and so just adding right. someone I think is the first yeah, clarification. I, I, yeah. I, I would stick with. I'm going to stick with that motion. So then yeah. I just I, I guess the question the last question I have then is. For those two groups, is there like there's a timeline? And I guess for all the groups, there's a clock for them to mm -hmm. submit those arguments, whether they're for or against. Mm -hmm. And what's that timeline? Um, the calendar is on our website. The deadline for the arguments for or against is August 19th. And the argument, then the, if you get if you get an argument for or against for and against, you can also file a rebuttal. And that's another deadline, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, it is on our my website. But the 19th is the deadline. Great. And then I guess before we end this item, I just have um, one last question that's related but tangentially. Uh, I know that there has been talk about us putting a TOT on the November ballot, and I'm just curious about when the deadline is for us to have that language come to council so we can vote on it and move it forward. Because it seemed to me that we were moving forward rapidly with this because we have to do it before the, the agenda. I don't know. Yeah, thanks for the question, Council Member Cummins. It is our intent to bring that to the council first meeting in August to meet the deadline uh, that's required. Okay, thank you. All right, we have uh, a motion by Council Member Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. May I have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Boulder? Absent. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes six ayes, one absent. Council Member Golder. Thank you, everyone, for that item and discussion and information and input. Um, at this point, we have one more item on the agenda, but I would like to call a break. We've been going for almost 12 hours now. So um, we will return at eight, uh, nine o'clock. Can I ask a question? Is there any, I mean, is there any way we can, well, uh, never mind. I was gonna ask if we could postpone this, but we're not gonna meet again until August. So, um, but yeah, I was gonna ask that question because yeah, we have been going really long. That is an option for the council it, to entertain. Does it affect? Um, is there a time sensitive matter yeah. with this item? I'd like to ask Tony Elliott. You waiting so patiently, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, no time sensitivity to it necessarily. I was talking with uh, Matt earlier uh, today. I know that um, August will be a, a busy agenda. We do have our consultants waiting in the wings tonight, as well as staff from Homeless Garden Project. So we're ready and, and willing to go tonight, um, but defer to the council on, on direction. All right. Um 
If okay, I see some hands raised. Council Member Myers. Oh, sorry, mine was mine was. I forgot to put mine down. Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, I appreciate the break, and but I think we should um, hear this agenda item, given that we have folks who have been waiting and wanting to present. I agree. So skip the break and move right into no, the item. I'm sorry, no, have the break, have a 20 minute break and come back and hear the agenda item. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, um, so let's say 9.05. We will return. Thank you so much for hanging in with us, everybody, and to so, thank you. We are near the finish line here with today's meeting. Thank you so much to our city staff and guests who have been waiting. We also have Peter Bashir, our Spanish translator, who is also here and available. Um, I believe there may have been a request for Spanish translation. Peter, are you with us? I am, Mayor. Great, thank you. How did you uh, want to proceed with this? I assume the Spanish speaker can uh, uh, ask his question in Spanish and I will translate the question for the council and answer and translate his answer afterwards. Thank you. Or her question. Their question, yes. <laughs> okay. Let me pull up my agenda. And we are now at agenda item number 42 on our Santa Cruz City Council agenda. This is Poganip Open Space, Poganip Master Plan Amendment Process for Homeless Garden Projects, Farm and Garden an upper main meadow and contamination and cleanup feasibility update in lower, lower main meadow. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item. There was one email sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com on this agenda item. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome Director Tony Elliott and Noah Downing. Right. Thank you very much, Mayor Bruner and city council members. Uh, thanks for this opportunity uh, here late on a Tuesday to present this update regarding Poganep um, and Homeless Garden Project. Uh, so just as far as the project team here this evening from Parks and Recreation, we have Park Superintendent Travis Beck. Uh, we've got our Parks Planner, Noah Downing, that will run us through the presentation here momentarily. From RMD Consulting, our consultant on this project, we have Doug Wichard, uh, Ivy Inoue, and John Alexander. And then from the Homeless Garden Project, uh, Executive Director Derry Gantorn and Board Member Danette Shoemaker. So tonight we'll give a uh, relatively uh, short and efficient, uh, but also detailed presentation just on an update on the contamination in the Lower Meadow in Poganip and the process with the Homeless Garden Project um, in the Poganip Farm. So uh, we'll provide a background and summary of a lot of the work over the past six months uh, and more. Uh, we'll hear some detail from RMD. Uh, we'll hear an update from the Homeless Garden Project and then we'll discuss propo the proposed plan uh, to continue our steps and process forward. Uh, so with that, again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate Peter on the call as well. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Noah Downing uh, to run us through our presentation. Thank you. And can I just confirm that the presentation is showing? No. No, it's not. There yep. it is. Now it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor Bruner and City Council members. 
On September 28th, 2021, the City Council directed staff to undertake a planning process to amend the Poconet Master Plan to allow for the Homeless Garden Project to re relocate their farm to the Upper Main Meadow. The Council also directed staff to evaluate the feasibility, cleaning up the Lower Main Meadow to allow for farming to occur. This meeting is an opportunity for staff to report back to you on the progress made and receive direction on the, on the next steps forward. The planning process for the farm's relocation of the Upper Meadow has been placed on hold. In February 2022, the Homeless Garden Project requested that the city refocus planning efforts back to the lower meadow for the farm site. In turn, staff did not move forward with the schedule of consulting services and notified the public about the change. Staff intends to discontinue the master plan amendment process unless further direction is received tonight. Leading up to the September 28th meeting, a public concern arose that the proposed farm and garden use was inconsistent with the 1988 CalPAW initiative. The initiative provided the city funding to purchase Poganip and contained specific provision that the land be preserved for parks and open space. Parks and Rec worked with city attorney's office staff to research the concern. Staff sent a letter to the Department of Parks and Recreation to review the proposed land use. The state confirmed that the farm is an appropriate use under the agreement. Before I turn it over to RMD uh, to present the cleanup feasibility study, I do want to emphasize that a lot of work has gone into studying the contamination of Poganip. One major undertaking was the preliminary endangerment assessment, which was provided through a grant award by the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. They provided in-kind services to evaluate the lower main meadow to determine if, if any areas are safe to farm. Through that process, they hired RMD as a primary consultant. DTSC's toxicologists helped in the work plan's development. The process evaluated the screening levels for recreation and farming uses. The methodologies and screening levels have also been reviewed by the County of Santa Cruz Environmental Health Division, including their consulting toxicologists. Staff was excited that RMD was able to continue work on the project with the city after the grant was complete. From their initial efforts, which were focused on the, the main meadow areas, areas, we have expanded the sampling to outline areas, and we now know the location and extent of contamination. So I'd like to now turn it over to Doug from RMD. We'll present more on the cleanup feasibility study. All right, thanks Noah, and uh, thank you uh, council members for letting us present this evening. Um, I think Noah, you'll be controlling the slides for me. Yes. So uh, you can uh, move on to the next one. Um, just a, a quick background here. Um, the Homeless Garden Project conducted an initial uh, agriculture soil testing back in 2018 and 2019 once um, it became known that a historic shooting range um, was operated in the lower meadow of the Poganip site. Um, from there, uh, between 2019 and 2021, additional soil sampling was conducted throughout the lower main meadow uh, with the primary goals to further evaluate the um, extent, both lateral and vertical, of um, the, the primary concerns um, being lead and what's called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs um, in the shallow soil as a result of the historical shooting range operation. Um, so from there, um, earlier this year, um, based on the information that had been collected to date, um, RMD working with the city and the Homeless Garden Project prepared a feasibility study to evaluate um, um, both a recreational and a unrestricted uh, or farming use in the, the lower main meadow and to look at what remediation steps or efforts would be needed to um, clean up the site. Move on to the next slide, please. Um, so a, a brief overview of what we're talking about here. Um, this is a, a, an aerial view um, with some overlays on it of the lower main meadow of the, the Poganip site. Uh, as you can see, north on this figure is up and to the left. Um, the Poganip Clubhouse uh, still sits up there on the, the top of the hill there. And then the um, current access into the site by the road is down on the bottom right of this uh, image, which is the Golf Club Drive entrance, and there's a trail access there. Um, so historical background to kind of orient where we're talking about on the site here, there are two um, shooting uh, pad uh, arcs that um, Noah is showing there. There are concrete pads that still exist. So based on locating those um, shooting pads, we're able to orient where a, an approximate 
um, our hypothetical range of the lead shot and the clay targets would be, would have been. So that's the yellow and, and red kind of fan shaped um, shading that's overlaid on this diagram where we have the east meadow and ravine um, indicated. Um, so based on knowing kind of the orientation of where the shooting range was, it allowed us to expand that the sampling and investigation that we did in the last few years. Um, and also knowing, as you can see in the, the pink outlines that are indicated that um, are labeled East Meadow, West Meadow, and North Orchard, um, those are the proposed planting and farming areas that the Homeless Garden Project um, had indicated. It gave us an idea of where we needed to really focus our investigation um, and to move forward with this. Um, and along the way, um, we also realized that the ravine, we're, we're referring to the tree covered area in the center there, the ravine, it's a heavily sloped, there's an intermittent stream that runs through there. Um, we're able to also collect some soil samples in that area um, to further our investigation. And it's also of note, there's a seasonal wetland um, that is uh, in the West Meadow there is indicated by that kind of blue um, blob with um, a buffer around it where either no planting would occur or only native plants would be um, planted. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, so lead exposure. Um, again, one of the primary concerns out on this site is, is lead in the shallow soil. Um, so lead exposure is greater is a greater concern for children than it is adults, um, like you know many um, compounds. Um, and the pathway into the body for lead is generally through ingestion for children. Um, so you can think about kids out playing in the dirt. Um, they're often putting their their hands in their mouth and they're not washing their hands. Um, so that, that's the common pathway uh, for children is to ingest soil that's contaminated with lead. Um, and for adults, it's going to be more inhalation, um, breathing in dust. Um, and it's also important to note that lead does not pass directly into the body through the skin. Um, it's going to be, you know, either ingestion, inhalation, or another pathway. Um, and lead exposure affects nearly all organs and internal systems in our body. Um, and uh, as a kind of background um, you know, comparison to, to think about, um, Many of the urban soils um, in you know ac across the country now um, have lead concentrations that are greater than what would be considered the naturally occurring background levels due to the widespread historical use of leaded paints, um, you know, on the side of houses or industrial buildings or leaded gasoline use um, and exhaust pipes. Um, so. You know, as a, a point of comparison or, or something to think about here, in, the, in urban soil, it's not uncommon to see lead concentrations between approximately 150 and 10,000 micrograms per kilogram. Um, kind of to give you a, um, uh, something to think about as we, as we move forward. So go on to the next slide there, Noah. Um, and as we evaluate um, the data set that we have, there are um, things called risk based screen, uh, soil screening levels. Um, these are thresholds that have been established um, to be protective of, of either current or future um, what are called receptors. So um, you can think about it as either, uh, in our case here, what's referred to as either residential or unrestricted use. So for a, a potential farming use, there are certain screening levels that we would be comparing our, our data set to. Uh, there's also a site-specific recreational trail user screening level that was developed, as Noah mentioned earlier, during that preliminary endangerment assessment. And that screening level was approved by the DTSC um, for both lead and the, the PAHs that we see on the site. Um, so we can go on to the next slide and actually take a look at some of uh, what these numbers are. Um, so for lead, um, the background level that's been established um, and is an accepted number is 43 milligrams per kilogram. Um, for that unrestricted screening level for lead, um, which would be the, the farming scenario, concentrations of lead would need to be below that number. That's 80 milligrams per kilogram. And then for the um, what we're calling our recreational trail user, the hiking and biking screening levels, 
Um, that site-specific number for lead is 540 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and for the PAHs, uh, since they're not naturally occurring uh, substances, there is no background level that's been established for those. And for the both the unrestricted and the recreational screening levels, um, those numbers are going to vary because when we're looking at PAHs, those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are going to be deposited through the clay targets on the site, um, you're looking at you know, 15 to 20 individual compounds. So the 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 screening levels in that situation are going to vary, um, and we can look at some of the. Um, uh, a, a summary of the the lead samples that were the, the soil samples that were collected and analyzed for lead. Um, again, these were samples collected based on ex expected shot fall range and other field observations. Uh, samples were collected throughout the site. Um, as you can see there, a total of uh, 206 samples were collected um, after the homeless garden project's initial testing. And of those samples, 85 had res, uh, concentrations above that background level for lead. 62 samples had um, concentrations above that unrestricted screening level for lead. And 17 samples had concentrations above the recreational screening level for lead. Um, we can move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so for the PAHs, um, it's a slightly smaller data set, again, based on the expected um, clay target range and field observations. Um, samples were collected throughout that West Meadow area and then portions of the East Meadow and the North Orchard. So of the 58 total samples that were collected and analyzed for PAHs, only 11 had concentrations above the unrestricted screening levels for at least one of those PAH compounds. And four samples came back with concentrations above the, the recreational screening levels. So what does this look like when we put it onto a map and overlay it? Um, onto the site. So you can see here, uh, again, if you really just try to focus on the yellow dash lines and the orange lines, those are, those are indicating where we have those concentrations of soil above our recreational screening level. So you can see it's, it's pretty much isolated for lead um, in that area between the ravine and the east meadow and then also in the northern portion of the ravine near the north orchard. So that, that generally follows that hypothetical range that we thought um, for lead that we showed earlier. And then for the PAHs, you see there are a couple different areas in the west meadow kind of on either side of the wetland. And um, if we go to the next slide, you can really see um, the, the increase in, in just area where the unrestricted screening levels have been exceeded. So. This is a, a map showing, again, the yellow dash line being the, the lead concentrations above our unrestricted screening level and the orange lines being uh, the PAH area above our unrestricted screening level, um, where farming would not be allowed to occur within um, you know, that yellow or orange area um, based on the, the concentrations that, have, um, that we have seen. So, um, I know this is where we get into that feasibility study evaluation. Um, we know if we want to be farming out on this site, um, we have a, a significant area that is going to need to be remediated, um, whether that's either just reducing the exposure risk or, um, you know, actually actively remediating and cleaning up um, those concentrations. So if we we go on to the, the next uh, slide there, we can start getting into um, looking at the various remedial technologies um, that we could potentially use for a site like this. Um, this is a condensed version of what we included in our full uh, feasibility study report, um, looking at a handful of different possible remedial technologies and you know, their approximate effectiveness and cost. Um, so running through them quickly, um, the options that we looked at and evaluated were phytoremediation. So that's essentially planting specific species of trees um, that will extract contaminants up through their root structure and remove the contaminants from the soil. Um, another option we looked at were institutional and engineering controls. Um, this is, you can think of a deed restriction or a land use covenant as an institutional control mixed with uh, fencing or notification signs as an engineering control. 
Uh, we also looked at capping. So constructing a low permeability cap or cover on top of the site to prevent um, exposure essentially. So that would be um, asphalt, concrete, or you can even do a thicker layer of soil. Um, we, we looked at soil flipping. So removing the top layer of contaminated soil, setting it aside, removing a clean layer of soil beneath that, setting it aside, and then backfilling them in reverse. So you put the contaminated soil, you essentially bury it underneath a clean layer of soil. And the last option we looked at was um, excavation and offsite disposal. So that's where, um, similar to flipping, but we, we remove that top layer of contaminated soil, we truck it off site to a disposal facility, and we bring in entirely new clean soil to put back on top. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the red boxes on the two options that we, we highlighted there, institutional and engineering controls and excavation and offsite disposal, um, based on the short-term and long-term effectiveness, um, the implementability, um, overall protection of human health and the environment, and the ability to reach our remedial action cleanup goals, um, and the relative cost, um, we, we weighed all of these things and came up with those two as institutional and engineering controls and the excavation and offsite disposal as the two best approaches um, for this site. Again, looking at um, in the short term, let's get this site back to recreational use in as much of an area as we can, and the long-term goal of um, allowing farming to occur throughout as much of the site as possible. Um, and another aspect of this is um, regulatory acceptance. So we don't wanna propose something that we don't think the regulatory agency, so currently in this case, the County of Santa Cruz Environmental Health, um, we don't wanna propose something that we don't think that they're gonna approve and accept. Um, and we can go on to the, the next slide there, please, Noah. Um, so what does this look like in action? So our, our proposed um, plan for a, a recreational use, this would probably be more of a short-term use um, would be insti uh, the institutional and engineering controls. So the purplish color lines that you see here uh, outlining the, um, what we're calling the exceedance areas, those yellow and orange lines where we have the contamination above our recreational screening levels. Um, that purple line would be um, a fence that we would fence off um, access to, to those areas to essentially reduce the risk exposure to um, community members that are out there hiking and biking and, and using the trail system. Um, that's not gonna clean up the site necessarily, but it's gonna reduce your exposure and, and allow for those uses to continue. Um, in addition to doing or installing the fencing, we would prepare a site management plan, which would essentially provide a guide to the city park and rec staff on, on how to safely go about um, conducting their routine vegetation control, site maintenance activities, um, you know, and, and being protective of themselves. Um, so the project timeline for um, this scenario would be approximately a year, maybe a little bit over a year. And the factors that go into that are um, securing funding for the project, preparing a work plan and getting that approved by uh, the regulatory agency, there will likely be some permitting included, um, whether it's for the fence installation or working near the wetland. Um, we, obviously, we would need to install the fencing and uh, we would prepare and record either a land use covenant or a deed restriction, something that says, you know, this site land use cannot be changed um, unless um, additional measures are conducted. So that land use covenant would not allow for you know, um, the farming um, used to happen and, until um, additional work was done. And um, a project of this scale, our estimate is somewhere in the, the ballpark, the neighborhood of two to $300,000. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can look at, um, if we wanna go to full unrestricted land use to get to the I, that ideal farming throughout the lower meadow uh, in areas that the Homeless Garden Project has proposed, um, we would need to add the excavation and offsite disposal component. So as you see here, the, the green hatched areas that kind of encircle the ravine area, um, and Noah's showing there, those are all areas that are 
um, accessible. They're within the proposed um, farm and garden area and their soil concentrations in those areas are above those unrestricted screening levels. Um, so that comes out to approximately 10,000 cubic yards covering approximately six acres of land that would need to um, have a soil removal action and, and backfilling with clean soil. Um, so there's that piece um, that would be done. The fencing would, would stay, it would be modified um, based on, you know, bringing it in in certain areas to allow for farming where soil removal was conducted. Um, and the project timeline for something like this is going to be pushed out to probably three plus years, three or four years likely uh, in a best case scenario. And factors that go into that timeline include, again, securing the funding. Um, this would include a more lengthy and involved CEQA and EIR process. Um, again, based on the wetland, um, fish and wildlife would probably be involved um, and you know other, other stakeholders there. We would prepare the work plan and get approval for that from the regulatory agency. Um, there would be um, significant permitting that would be involved. Um, and then that would allow us to do the actual soil remediation, removing the contaminated soil, bringing in clean soil, um, that fencing modification, and then we would, um, you know, prepare a revised land use covenant um, and site management plan for the new use. Um, so for the full unrestricted farming land use, we're looking at an estimated cost of somewhere in the ballpark of five to $6 million based on today's um, dollars. And a large portion of that is gonna go into that soil excavation, hauling the soil offsite, um, and we can go to the next slide and start looking at, um, you know, what all is going to go into that excavation and disposal component. Uh, so what we're, what is included um, in those proposed soil removal activities um, would be constructing a temporary access road onto the site because as the, the current infrastructure just would not allow for the heavy equipment and trucks and the volume of equipment that would need to be brought into the site to conduct that soil removal. Um, we would remove um, approximately the top foot of soil based on the, the data set we have. Um, the contamination in most areas goes down to between six inches and one foot. Um, so we would scrape that soil away. We would temporarily stockpile it on a portion of the site that's not gonna be touched um, while we collect confirmation samples to make sure that the contaminated soil has been removed to the extent the extent that is necessary, both laterally and vertically. Um, we would collect waste characterization samples, um, which is required anytime that you, um, you know, remove soil from a site and bring it to a disposal facility to make sure um, that that soil is characterized properly. And then that last piece of the soil removal is actually loading the soil into dump trucks. So 20 cubic yards at a time, we're talking 10,000 cubic yards of soil 500 dump trucks approximately would need to be driven onto that site, loaded with soil, and then brought back off the site to a disposal facility. Um, once the soil removal is completed, we would then kind of do the reverse. We would start backfilling with clean soil. Um, so again, it would be approximately 20 cubic yards at a time. Um, we would backfill into the areas that were, um, you know, where the soil removal occurred compact the soil to the project specifications and repair the topography, the slopes to, you know, approximately what they were pre-remediation. Um, we go on to the next slide and look at what is not included in our proposed soil remedi remediation activities, um, restoring areas that are beyond the farm and garden. Um, that's, you know, the, the coastal shrub or the, the oak woodland um, areas, we would need to further evaluate, you know, what's going to be done in those areas. Um, an erosion control plan and a stormwater pollution prevention plan would likely need to be um, prepared. Um, and utility line installation over to that East Meadow area, we're talking water lines, probably an electrical line. Um, those types of things would need to be planned out by uh, an engineer that focuses on, on that type of work. And then what's also not included, um, the, the perimeter fencing that would go around the proposed farm and garden areas um, would be something that the Homeless Garden Project, um, my understanding, they would, they would take care of that portion. 
Um, and what is to be determined? Um, the county uh, environmental health department has requested additional soil investigation based or in addition to what we have already collected um, and, and a few, um, in a couple of areas just to make sure that the investigation has fully delineated um, uh, areas to the extent necessary. So that um, additional investigation will likely occur later this year or early next year. Um, we're hopeful that the numbers that we provided today will not change drastically, but there are uh, potential cost implications um, based on that additional investigation. Um, that temporary access road that I mentioned, um, we really don't have a lot of detail on that other than it's something that's been um, brought up and, and realized that we would need to, um, you know, again, bring in an engineer that, that does that type of work to look at um, how we would go about um, preparing that access road and getting the site ready for um, staging heavy equipment. Um, sourcing the, the clean backfill material can be a big challenge on this project. Um, it's, it's not easy to find 10,000 cubic yards of um, clean soil that can be used for a farming situation. Ideally, that is organic virgin soil. So whatever those specifications end up being, um, you know, that will be a, a significant challenge. And then the, the last piece there is, um, you know, we need to get regulatory agency approval. We have had initial discussions with the County of Santa Cruz about the overall plan. They uh, have initially provided positive feedback, but there will need to be more conversation and, and approvals through the, the regulatory agency. Um, so with all that said, um, I have one last quick summary slide. Again, we looked at both of what it would take to, to um, get the site back to recreational use and the unrestricted or farming use. Um, we talked about the institutional engineering controls in addition to the excavation and offsite disposal for the unrestricted use. Um, for recreational, we're looking at one plus years for the unrestricted, the farming use best case scenario is probably at least three years. Um, estimated costs can range from two to 300,000 for um, installing the fencing for the recreational use or upwards of five to $6 million for um, the full site remediation back to, um, or to allow for a farming scenario and then potential delays that could come up. Um, you can see there um, funding and regulatory oversight and review are gonna, are gonna be potential delays for either option. And then for the, um, the full site remediation, that CEQA and EIR process um, could cause delays. And then also sourcing of that backfill material, like I mentioned, that could pose a challenge later on in the project. Um, so um, sorry, I, I tried to go through this rather quickly because I know it's, it's been a long day for a lot of you and um, we're getting late in the evening. So hopefully uh, I made some sort of sense and I will hand it back over to Noah to um, take it from there and we'll stick around for questions. Thank you, Thank you Doug. And then uh, in terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll just reiterate now, the planning for Parks and Rec staff, we're not intending to um, perform any more work on the master plan amendment process for the upper meadow. Uh, any unused funds will be returned to the general fund. Um, we're still working with Weber Hayes. There was um, one sampling point um, when we sampled the upper meadow did have some little bit of contamination. So we're gonna work with the county to assess that. Um, this month we received a uh, notice that we did receive uh, in a, another grant award from the Department of Toxic Substances Control. And so this would be more than uh, 300,000 to complete a site characterization, uh, the remaining steps of the site characterization, develop a remediation plan, site management plan and construction drawings. We'll need to perform CEQA review on the, the project. And then we'll, with all that information, apply for and receive permits um, from various state agencies uh, by June, 2024. And this is kind of exciting that we received the, the grant because it, it kind of shows a progression working with DTSC. There was an initial assessment. Now they're funding another investigation, which will get us to a shovel ready state. And then um, they, this grant, 
uh, round of funding through their program, um, you could apply for as, as much as $6 million uh, for cleanup funding. Um, so it's really great that they're working with us and hopefully that continues. And once we have a shovel ready state, yeah, we'll apply for grant funding and to perform future cleanups. And moving along, so, you know, staff's I guess, recommendation for the night is to motion to acknowledge staff's update and direct staff to continue the next steps towards remediating the lower meadow. And with that, I would like to just pass it over to the homeless garden project um, for a couple of words. And um, so Derry, if you're available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noah. Uh, my name is Danette Shoemaker. I am the vice president of the Homeless Garden Board, and I'm here with Derry uh, Ganshorn um, tonight, our executive director. Just very briefly, I wanted to thank Parks and Recreation staff, <clears throat> excuse me, for their work and the informative staff report and this presentation. Um, the information is there. Some of it's staggering but it, it shows the amount of work that has gone into the project to this date and also paints a picture where we could be going in the future. We're also very grateful to the city council members for supporting our permanent site at Poganet. Remediation of the lower meadow will benefit the entire community. And that's what we're hoping for. So since uh, January 2019, when we stopped construction on the Lower Meadow, the Homeless Garden Project has been presented with two additional permanent site possibilities. And our board of directors is carefully evaluating potential sites, all of which contain a level of uncertainty. And our, you know, the work of the Homeless Garden Project is inextricably linked to land. So we don't have the luxury of abandoning any possibilities until we have more information. We hope the council will support moving forward with the feasibility analysis for cleaning up the contamination to allow for farming to occur in the lower main meadow. And uh, Danette and I are available to answer any questions from council members. Thanks. Thank you. And that concludes uh, the presentation for tonight and staff and the Homeless Garden Project and Consultant are available for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to uh, our Parks and Rec staff and to RMD. Doug, thank you for laying out all of that information. It was actually quite interesting to learn about all the soil and remediation methods. Um, I had no idea. And uh, the recommendations were very clear in, um, and laid out and the costs associated. So um, thank you for that information. Danette and Derry, thank you for your input. And um, I'd like to bring it out to council members for any questions before we move to um, public comment and then deliberation and action. I see Council Member Myers, you have your hand. I just have uh, two quick questions. One is it sounds like the grant that you're just awarded gets you basically all the way through permitting. Um, is that correct? Yes. Including we, the CEQA analysis as well. We applied for CEQA. Um, we're still in discussions about that. I, I do not think they will fund the CEQA component. Um, they mentioned that typically they'll fund up to a mitigated negative declaration, um, but it still is a substantial amount of funding and will you know, yeah. help address the progress uh, project. And then um, I know that the Department of Toxic Substances is, it's, I mean, they have a, they, they're a department for a reason. Um, and typically they do have fairly good resources because of the public health benefit, obviously that's tied to their work. Um, do you guys, um, I know when I've cleaned up a few sites um, in the last 20 years, um, you know, there's usually pretty good support there. Are you 
fairly confident that once you get through permitting that you would be competitive. So I guess my question is, do you feel like the public funding is, is pretty secure, um, short of a massive uh, 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 financial issue with the state, but do you feel like you'd be in good shape to continue to receive those grants? I guess that's my question. Not committing anything, but just curious. Yeah, yeah Council Member Myers, I think we'll be really competitive for that funding. I think it feels like we're on that track already with DTSC. Uh, which is good. So I think we'll be very competitive um, uh, for that moving moving forward. And our hope, um, again, as Noah talked about, uh, with an opportunity to get up to around six million uh, through that program, our hope would be, um, you know, recognizing that the city has limited resources, that Homeless Garden Project has limited resources for this this monumental project. Our goal would be to leverage a hundred percent or as close to a hundred percent. Uh, grant funding uh, to remediate the project. Um, so that, that's our hope moving forward. That was my other question was, so I'm hoping that the homeless garden project wouldn't have to continue to raise funds to, to, to get back on the land, um, but that hopefully we could, we could be competitive enough to kind of get, you know, finally get everything ready and done. Um, okay. And then, um, you know, I just want to acknowledge um, Jerry and, and Danette, good to see you guys here tonight. And um, thank you so much for hanging in. I think the Homeless Garden Project is a really important thing to have happen at Poganip. I think you're a part of the um, community that is helping us with a lot of the um, difficult issues that we're facing in Santa Cruz and a lot of the folks who are struggling here, you know, many of them have found, um, found their way back in life and to success through your programs. So I think, um, I know I, I would be proud to have you guys as, as a neighbor there and, um, as people wander around and hike and do the things they love to do there. Um, and it sounds like um, you are sort of tracking on all opportunities still just because that's what you need to do as an organization in terms of making sure you get a home soon. So that, that sounds uh, kind of what I got out of your statement. So I just want to um, thank you for being here tonight and I'm hoping we'll get a home run soon and I'm hoping three more years maybe goes by in a flash, we'll see. Um, but thank you for hanging in there. Thank you. It's my comments, Mayor. Council Member Cummings. Well, thanks for that presentation, and it'll be interesting to watch how things go from here. I had a question um, related to the Homeless Garden Project and um, kind of ongoing operations. I know that um, when this came to us back in 2021, there was a sense of urgency that was expressed by the Homeless Garden Project because it sounded like the current site was going to um, be um, developed on within the within a short time period, and I'm just wondering, um, given that this can take you know multiple years, um, do you all have a space to operate between now and and potentially when this could be finished, or kind of what does the future currently of Homeless Garden Project look like? We are in conversation with our landlord, and we believe that we can stay there. Um, or we can we believe that we our stay is secure there for the time being at least. Great. That's I was just um, kind of wanted to understand that so that you know if there was a need for help on our end to find a temporary spot for you all to continue your operations that you know happy to try to partner with you all as well. I know the community really appreciates your services. Um, and yeah, with that, I don't really have more questions. It sounds like. <clears throat> You know, staff is going to be working on trying to find funding and, you know, given what we know now about that site, you know, the potential to be eligible for some of these EPA and other kind of environmental remediation grants, it seems like we, you know, it's pretty high. And uh, just given the, the new knowledge that we have on um, the past use of that site. So just hoping that um, we're able to secure that funding so we can clean that site, regardless of its future use. It seems like, you know, cleaning that site is a priority. And if the homeless garden, garden project can have their permanent home there, then that would be a great addition as well. So thank you. Thank you. Council member Myers, did you have another question? Oh, no, I, I forgot to take my hand down, but there we go. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I will other, no, no more clarifying questions. I will bring it out to public comment then. 
Okay, so if you are a member of the, what was that? It sounded like someone said something. Uh, if you are a member of the public and interested in commenting on item number 42, Poganip Open Space, Poganip Master Plan Amendment Process, raise your hand either by dialing star 9 on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Any members of the public who are joining us here in chambers and want to comment, please line up to the right of the dais. You will have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it's not required. All right, let's go out to our virtual attendees. I'm not seeing anyone in person. And our first hand raised is phone number ending in 3485. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Caitlin Gaffney and I'm a 23 year resident of Santa Cruz and a regular user of the Pobinip open space. I've testified before you in the past about my strong opposition to the proposed relocation of the homeless garden project to the main meadow of Pobinip which would be in conflict with multiple city plans and policies. Tonight, I wanted to express my appreciation for the city's efforts related to uh, remediation of the lead contamination at the Lower Meadow site. And I also was happy to hear the Homeless Garden Project staff and, uh, mention that their board is exploring alternative locations for the project. Um, I continue to believe that an off Pogonip location would be the best option. Um, but I just want to appreciate the efforts that the Comus Garden Project and the staff have put into really uh, extensively exploring alternatives to the main meadow. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next uh, member of the public is the name I Am Watching You. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I always had basic problems with the city giving away land to benefit a small number of so-called residents. I see no calculation of cost benefit analysis as in how much land value and improvement costs relates to the actual number of residents that might improve their status in life by how much. It's a big per person unknown number at the moment, but a casual look at land prices, not even in the pricey city proper, suitable for farming would it value nine acres at about $7 million easily. That would be a pretty nice minimum giveaway, huh? It's a, a lie, it benefits the entire community. It's a feel good project, but anyone reading even the summary of this knows it has become a bad, but mucho red tape, very expensive idea a while ago. It's time to cut losses and forget about it. There are other ways to help homeless people as if that is really the city purpose anyway. The very idea of the giveaway runs counter to protected open space, something the Pogonip was supposed to be. I doubt the public will be enjoying any of these nine acres unless HPG, HGP uh, has a volunteer work day where the virtue seeking public among us gets to do the work HGP is supposed to be doing farming. I would note that there are multiple land lots that look suitable for farming for sale in Santa Cruz County that currently sell for $750,000 an acre. Maybe HGP should buy four acres and expand their way with their $3 million they claimed they had last time they revealed their balance. For the money thrown at this, I suggest there are other options. You're a hoping and a hoping someone else picks up the tab for restoration but you're not getting paid for the land and is still a huge giveaway of public land. It's time for this entire idea to go bye-bye, feel good or not. We have other public uses for money and that land belongs to the public trust. At least get Thank paid you. for Your it time if you intend to violate its purpose. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to comment 
on this agenda item number 42. Okay, I'm bringing it back to council for action and deliberation. Council member Myers. Yeah, um, I was gonna move um, basically, uh, it sounded like the staff recommendation, which was to um, direct uh, continued work on the um, cleaning up of the contamination for to allow for farming to occur in the lower meadow um, and uh, including pursuing um, the next set of work with the grant and then um, additional funding to finalize and, and remove all the contamination. Um, and I believe, I don't know if there's a motion that needs to be made to you. It sounds like, um, I don't know if you need direction, um, Noah, on uh, that reprogramming of the um, upper meadow of funding that was going to be used for that planning work to 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 those to back to the general fund and then for use here in this in this project. Is do you need a motion on that? You know, if, if you would like to make a motion, but it's my understanding that it could be returned back to the general fund. Back to the general fund. Okay. So um, I'm pretty sure I covered what was in your one line. I put into a rambling like three and a half lines. <laughs> uh, Council Member Myers. I'm happy to second that motion. Uh, I just want to clarify the motion that was pulled on the screen was a little different than yours. So if we can get clarification on what exactly the motion is. So the motion was to um, uh, accept the report uh, and staff's update and then to direct staff to continue next step remediating the lower main meadow um and to utilizing existing the existing funding and to continue to um pursue additional funding to complete the uh, full remediation okay uh city clerk did you receive that information and council member brown i just wanted to make a quick comment um uh, and say express my sincere appreciation for our Parks and Rec staff and our consultants and uh, to everybody at the Homeless Garden Project for all of the work that you have been doing to try to make um, a permanent home a reality for you in, in the Pogo Nip, which I absolutely support and hope we can keep moving in this direction. Um, I, I want to comment on the, the staff report for this item was particularly um, excellent. It was so clearly articulated. I, I felt like I could <clears throat> really understand what the steps you went through. So Noah, kudos to you. Um, I, it was it was really a, a, a joy to read, it, except for the part about potentially $6 million <laughs> for the cleanup. Um, but it, it really was clear how much work has gone into this. And, um, and, and you just laid it out really clearly for us um, and gave us a really good sense of what we're looking at um and and so i just so much appreciate that i don't have questions because it was really clear and once i realized i, I don't need to understand the particulars of borehole seepage i <laughs> was fine with um the rest of it so thank you just really really thank you thank you all right we have a motion by council member myers seconded by brunner and um, looks like there's no further discussion, so I'd like to ask for a roll call vote. Council member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Absent. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. <coughs> Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brunner. Aye. That motion passes with six ayes and one absent. Council Member Golder. Thank you very much to our Noah Downing, Park Planner, Director Tony Elliott for all the time into this, and RMD, Ivy, John, and Doug. Thank you so much. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor.